Leftism. From the Saad and Marx to Hitler and Marcuse. Eric von Kunolt Ladin. 1974. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Part 4. The Left and U.S. Foreign Policy. Chapter 15. The American Left. And World War I. Dealing not only with American foreign policy but also with British foreign policy in our century, I am obviously addressing readers from English-speaking countries as an alien, as an Austrian who, during all his lifetime, has been at the receiving end of political decisions which were largely identified with the national interest of the United States and Britain. Certainly not every American, not every Britisher subscribed to every movement his government made during the crucial World War I years and if the party he voted for was in opposition he had good reason to disassociate himself from his government's official policy. And yet he could not possibly avoid identifying himself, at least up to a point, with the actions of his country. Writing as an Austrian, nevertheless I have to tell my readers in all candor that I am also writing as a man who still has a home, a Heimat, but since my childhood, since November 1918, no longer a fatherland. The Alpine Republic of Austria has made every imaginable effort to deny its historic roots going back to the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. It shed all the symbols recalling the Habsburg monarchy either in the form of the Danubian monarchy or its real matrix, the Holy Roman Empire. Thus politically I am representing a void. This, however, gives me the courage to criticize the policies of the English-speaking nations vigorously though endeavoring to remain objective. I think that as a citizen of Christendom, as a product of the Western world it is my duty to point to a chain of errors committed by Britain and America in the past, because these countries still have an armed might, a freedom of decision, a responsibility which Austria no longer possesses. This is the reason I am not dwelling on the faults and mistakes of my own people, now a small pawn on a big chessboard. I am not even putting much stress on the sins of omission and commission of the German people or of its masters prior to 1933, a people to whom as an Austrian I feel attached in many ways. Great nations have fallen very low, the Jews when they rejected their Messiah, France, the oldest daughter of the Church, when it engaged in the Revolution, Pandora's box of centuries to come. Holy Mother Russia, when she fell for the abstruse ideas of German intellectuals, the Germanies, part of the Holy Roman Empire, when they submitted to Hitler and his evil creed. Of course these peoples have no common guilt. There is no such thing as collective guilt. However, as Theodore Heuss has pointed out, there is collective shame. Nor, obviously, are the Americans, or the British, collectively guilty of the fateful errors and misdeeds committed by some of them. The words of Count Benkendorf, last Imperial Russian ambassador in London, about the Germans, il n'y a pas les almo, il n'y a que des almo are equally valid for the English-speaking nations. The vast majority of my friends in Britain and America never belong to the left, they rarely subscribe to its errors, they have little, sometimes no responsibility for the tragic situation the modern world is in at present. If I am accusing, I am hardly accusing them and the accusations themselves are made in order to show errors of the past. The only thing we can do now is to learn from them. Certainly in no domain has the influence of American, and the British, left been more nefarious than in matters of foreign policy. The effects of their interventions were tragic not only in the United States and in Britain but for the world at large. Yet let us also admit that, while the left has actively participated in political and military activities that powerfully contributed to the decline of the West, the more conservative forces in the English-speaking world cannot be entirely absolved from the guilt of omission rather than commission, of an action rather than intervention. Here, however, we must bear in mind that, viewed from the angle of American native mythology, this has little to do with factual history. The United States were born on the flight from Europe. A certain tradition likes to speak about the American experiment, what is it? Can it be called off if found inconvenient? And tends to see in America an island of the blessed totally removed from the rest of the world. There can be no doubt that the nascent American Republic needed a rest, needed a period of internal reconstruction and crystallization and that, thanks to two oceans, a policy of isolation was feasible and desirable. In spite of the fact that the foundations of the American Republic are Whiggish and aristocratic, we nevertheless soon witness the build-up of another myth on both sides of the Atlantic, the United States as the big democracy, as the haven of all persecuted and the downtrodden, as the supranational, global fatherland of equality, and so forth. 19th century America had many outstanding conservative thinkers and writers, Melville, Brownson, Sumner but a countercurrent also existed. Walt Whitman, to quote just one instance, is a typical democratist, invoked quay homosexual as a representative of democratic camaraderie by Thomas Mann in his Confession of Faith in the Weimar Republic. In Leaves of Grass Whitman chanted. One self I sing, a simple separate person. 
yet after the word democratic, the word en masse. This looks like a solidly identitarian program, yet there are passages with a more pompous and less liberal wording. Thus when Whitman says in his democratic business, I demand races of orbic bards, with unconditional and uncompromising sway. Come forth, sweet democratic despots of the West. The despots came rather from the East and they were not sweet either. The very foundation of this democratic order was largely in the hands of literary men, as in today's leftism, and indeed, the priests depart, the divine literature comes. Should this be a prophecy related to Mr. James Baldwin? Literature, according to Whitman, should be as revolutionary, as traditionless as all other cultural manifestations. I say that democracy can never prove itself beyond cavil, until it founds and luxuriantly grows its own forms of art, poems, schools, theology, displacing all that exists, or that has been produced anywhere in the past, under opposite influences, says another passage in the same book. Here we have a totalitarian, anti-traditionalist program like that of the spokesman of prolet cult in the Soviet Union. A new race should grow up in America, the ideal race of the future, divine average. Almost a Nazi vision. Reinhold Niebuhr has rightly pointed out in one of his best books that the United States were God's American Israel called upon to save the world. It is important to recall, however, that American national messianism had a decidedly leftist tinge which, for instance, the earliest Russian messianism did not have. The grandfather of American messianism is Jefferson and its character was and still is republican, i.e., anti-monarchical, and democratic, i.e., anti-aristocratic. American nationalist feelings seem very strong to a foreigner and, as all nationalist sentiments, they have a certain intellectual character. Unlike patriotism, nationalism is argumentative, the nationalist tries to prove the superiority of his nation by pointing out its unique characteristics, achievements, virtues, qualities, institutions, traditions. The patriot sees in his attachment merely a manifestation of loyalty, just as an intelligent man would never try to argue that his parents were the best in the world, he would consider it an accident to have been born as a citizen of a specific country, which he did not choose. He did not choose his parents either, but he will naturally love them, and if he does not love them he will be loyal to them in obedience to the commandment, even if they are very ordinary, even if they are manifestly inferior people. American nationalism, however, has been conditioned to a large extent by the indoctrination of the children of immigrants. Naturally a German, an Italian, an American gentleman will defend his country against patently unjust accusations, Loyalty demands this, but he will not try to convince us that his nation has the highest qualities in the world, has the most gifted inventors, the best writers, the finest painters, the profoundest philosophers, the fastest trains, the most beautiful women. These boasts are reserved for the drummer after a third highball in a commercial hotel, to the Nazi, the Russian communist, etc. Yet in America moderate leftism and national nativist nationalism have gone well together. Witness Whitman, Witness a certain aspect of Carl Sandburg's writings, witness the poem of Emma Lazarus on the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. This gigantic symbol of freedom greets the immigrants thus. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp. Cries she with silent lips, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse from your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me, lift my lamp beside the golden door. It is interesting to investigate the ideological background of the Spanish-American War of 1898, a war in which purely nationalistic motives most certainly were mixed with leftist prejudices. The enemy was one of the rotten, ramshackle, backward, priest-ridden monarchies of the old world. Obviously there existed at that time in the United States a highly cultivated upper crust which neither participated in folkloric notions about European governments nor was affected by leftist ideas. Yet in the intellectually less ambitious minds a number of dangerous simplifications had already taken root. The United States with its institutions, habits, traditions, and customs was assumed by the masses to be at the top of a ladder of evolution. The more a foreign country was similar to the United States, the more it was considered progressive and friendly. The more dissimilar it was, the more it was seen as backward and worthy of contempt. Simple or, sometimes quite consciously, rather odd classifications were used, such items as forms of government, freedom of the press, formality of class differences, emancipation of women, literacy percentages, the number of bathtubs and telephones, religion, church-state relationship, the legal status of denominational minorities, cleanliness of hotels, punctuality of trains, and others functioned as measuring rods. Historical elements also came into play, Britain was remembered for 1776 and Nathan Hale, France's role in the War of Independence improved its score, Germany's excellent record in almost all points was offset by its monarchical form of government. 
and so forth. In the case of Spain in 1898 the balance sheet looked perfectly hopeless. The Leyenda Negra, the black legend of English fabrication made it even worse. The yellow press of the United States represented the Spanish people as bigoted, fanatical, cruel, treacherous, and the Cubans as their high-minded, heroic, innocent victims. Anti-monarchism became the driving element in America's European policy during World War I and its aftermath which helped to crystallize American leftism to an even greater degree. At the so-called extreme left in the United States were the anarchists, but there was also a socialist party, with a splinter and a fair amount of radicalism without definite political ties. World War I had actually started in Europe as a war between nations but rapidly lost the character of an old-fashioned cabinet war. All participants, with the exception of Great Britain, had conscription and the press was instrumental in engendering broad waves of collective national hatreds. In St. Petersburg a patriotic mob even stormed the German embassy. The lights, in the words of Sir Edward Grey, were really going out all over Europe. Especially in the West collective loathing had reached dangerous levels that marked the decay of the old world. Dachshunds were killed in Britain, Germans greeted each other with got strafe England, enemy aliens were brought behind barbed wire in Germany, England, France, and Italy, but not in Austria-Hungary or Russia. The Germans tried to starve out Britain, and the Western Allies tried to starve out the Central Powers. Allied propaganda represented the German armies as composed of assassins and sadists, atrocity stories were faked in droves and were widely believed. A fanaticism was roused that had not been known in past ages. Still, by the end of 1916, when the senseless butchering almost reached its zenith, there was only one European Republic in the Allied camp, France, and with Russia, and Japan, fighting in the Great Coalition, it was difficult to give to that war an ideological character. A small group of Czech nationalists wanting to break away from Austria spoke in their manifesto about a Romanov prince on a bohemian throne. Who bore the main guilt for this senseless holocaust? Each nation was honestly convinced that the responsibility lay with the other side, but it can be said without danger of refutation that the guilt was divided, not evenly, to be sure, but in a different degree among men and groups and cliques in the various countries. By the end of 1916 and early 1917 a compromise peace was still possible and great efforts were made in that direction. In a diminished form hope still existed until early 1918, when the last Austro-Hungarian peace offensive took place. Of course, Emperor Charles I was not the only person trying desperately to end the frightful butchery. The Vatican, certain German parties, the socialists, conservatives, English groups, and Spain were also engaged in major efforts to put an end to the almost universal suffering. By the summer of 1917 the Russian emperor had abdicated, the Kerensky government was tottering, the Italians awaited a major blow, Romania had been defeated, a stalemate existed on the Western Front, and a partial mutiny had weakened the French army. Lord Lansdowne's famous letter, rejected by the London Times, had been published by the Daily Telegraph. But the non-Marxist left in Britain and France, represented by Lloyd George, Clemenceau, and Ribot, was relentless. It counted on American aid. And the decision over peace or war really lay with America. As a matter of fact, never was there a greater chance for a genuine Pax Americana. If the United States had then been blessed with an outstanding president, with a great leader endowed with real vision, he could have called a peace conference and treated all those refusing to attend as prima facie partisans of the war. Now, one might argue that the great errors committed by the German government, Franz von Papen's stupidities, the Zimmermann telegram, the sinkings of the Lusitania and the Sussex, and many other provocative acts so severely castigated by Count Bernstorff, last imperial ambassador to Washington had created a most difficult situation. This is quite true but one need not believe in the inevitability of America's entry into the war. It is not too rash to assume that the election of the Republican candidate, Charles Evans Hughes, so narrowly defeated by Wilson in 1916 would probably have changed the course of events and with it the fate of the globe. Obviously, one could also argue that Teddy Roosevelt's stubbornness in 1912, when he split the Republican vote and made Wilson's first election possible, was the beginning of the end. A re-elected Taft in 1917 would have made America's entry into World War I highly unlikely. Certainly 1917 is the fateful year of our century. Woodrow Wilson decided to throw the American sword on the scales without realizing that he lacked the knowledge to win the peace and the power to make it lasting. This started a catastrophic development which is by no means terminated. Actually World War I with its seemingly permanent aftermath is still with us. And the aftermath is due to the fact that the monumental ignorance of the left, their absolute non-understanding, rather than misunderstanding, of human nature, of the simplest facts of history, geography, psychology, economics, strategy, and politics, 
have led to one wrong decision after the other. Let us remember only two things, twice it was a democratic administration, comprising the greater part of the leftist forces, which engaged the United States in a global war, and twice it happened that two hierarchical organizations, the industry and the military, won the wars. But democratically elected or appointed politicians lost the fruits of these costly victories, costly in blood and money, at the conference tables. In the long run genuine achievements do not come from mere intuitions, but only through knowledge. The engineers and the captains of industry, the generals and the admirals, have learned their trade. The politicians had their jobs solely because they were popular. The collapse of the monarchical government in Russia, the switch to the republic and the presidency of the relatively temperate social revolutionary Alexander Kerensky sharply changed the ideological picture of Europe. France still continued the revolutionary tradition, though in a moderate and bourgeois form. Britain not only had strong sentimental and cultural ties with America but also ranked as a parliamentary democracy in which the monarch was a mere figurehead. Japan was considered to be the torchbearer of progress in Asia. Italy was a monarchy more or less in name only. Though the Germans were considered industrious, clean, and musical, there existed in America the myth that after 1848 all decent Germans went to America, leaving the country open to arrogant, hill-clicking, monocle junkers and that sinister autocrat, William II. The Austro-Hungarian monarchy hardly figured in the popular American mind, but all the more so among leftist intellectuals. They had heard the name of Metternich and agreed with Gladstone that there is not an instance, there is not a spot upon the whole map, where you can lay your finger and say, their Austria did good. They remembered the tirades of Margaret Fuller against Vienna. No wonder, then, that the upshot of it all, the most tangible result of World War I, was the dismemberment of Austria-Hungary. This really changed the map of Europe and incidentally provided Germany with a geopolitical position of mastery which gave Hitler an ideal start for his non-military and military conquests. For Germany was bordered in the east by a power vacuum. The fall of the monarchy in Russia made Wilson extremely happy. Here is a fit partner for a League of Honor, was his reaction to the abdication of Nicholas II. Wilson was a genuine ideologue in the narrow sense of the term. His plan, unfortunately, was not to make democracy safe for the world, but rather to make the world safe for democracy. He was working towards a jihad, a holy war to extend what he considered the American form of government. This was already evident in his dealings with Mexico before America's entry into World War I. About America's neighbor south of the Rio Grande he said, Our friendship is a disinterested friendship, so far as our aggrandizement goes. Leaving them to work out their own destiny, but watching them narrowly and insisting that they shall take help when help is needed. What sort of help he thought about we can gather from a conversation between Walter Hines Page, his ambassador, and Sir Edward Gray, Britain's foreign secretary. Page recorded it himself. Gray, suppose you have to intervene, what then? Page, make them vote and live by their decisions. Gray, but suppose they will not so live? Page, we'll go in again and make them vote again. Gray, and keep this up for 200 years? Page, yes. The United States will be here for 200 years and it can continue to shoot men for that little space till they learn to vote and rule themselves. This is, in a way, what happened also between the United States and Central Europe. Wilson's prejudice against monarchy, however, was not only intellectual, it was also folkloric and based on the conviction that monarchs loved wars whereas nations were always peaceful. Now, revanchism was the great popular passion of the Third French Republic until 1914, but evidence is easily ignored. One need only remember Hegel who, upon being told that the facts contradicted his theories, severely replied, I'm so schlimmer for die totsach and all the worse for the facts. The identification of democracy with peace was mirrored in a letter of Wilson's Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, who wrote to Colonel House, No people can desire a war, particularly an aggressive war. If the people can exercise their will, they will remain at peace. If a nation possesses democratic institutions, the popular will will be exercised. Consequently, if the principle of democracy prevails in a nation, it can be counted upon to preserve peace and oppose wars. If this view is correct, then the effort should be made to make democracy universal. Wilson's famous message to Benedict XV, conveyed to the Pope by Lansing, at a time when America was not yet a belligerent, breathed more or less the same spirit. The German people might be fined, the letter said, but its government had to go. As a result Germany and Austria were saddled after the war with regimes whose character had been dictated by the Allies, the alternative being the hunger blockade. Any historian could have told the victors that political forms imposed by the triumphant enemy never last. 
The mistake committed by the Holy Alliance in 1814-1815 was repeated by the Allies in 1918-1919 and by the Unholy Alliance in 1945. Needless to say, Wilson suffered from the great American malady, the belief that people all over the world are more alike than unlike, in other words, that they are just inhibited, underdeveloped could be Americans saddled with the misfortune that they spoke another language. Once in the past Wilson had been tortured by the suspicion that in other parts of the world a very alien mentality could be found. In an article written for the Atlantic Monthly in 1889 he mentioned the restless forces of European democratic thought and anarchic turbulence which were brought to the United States by alarming masses of immigrants who were apt to tell disastrously upon our Saxon habit of government. When it came to the showdown at the conference table in Paris, Lloyd George, himself a Methodist Machiavelli, said that he was wedged in between a man who thought he was Napoleon, Clemenceau, and another one who thought that he was Jesus Christ, Wilson. By that time the Southern racist had developed into a savior of mankind. The ignorance of the former president of Princeton in matters of history and geography was simply prodigious. The Italians showed him a spurious map on which a mountain in the very heart of Austria appeared fittingly named Veta d'Italia, it served as a proof that historic Italy, there never was such a country, extended right to that spot. As a result the Italians received the South and the Central Tyrol with the Brenner Pass for the first time, and for the second time in 1946, with the result that the shooting and dynamiting in this restless, tortured area is still going on to this very day. Harold Nicholson, who was at the peace conference, wrote about the current feeling that if Wilson would swallow the Brenner, he would swallow everything. Terrified by his own mistake, Wilson then wanted to prevent the annexation of Fiume, predominantly inhabited by Italians, by Italy, and tried somewhat and diplomatically to appeal to the Italians over the head of their government. As in the arrangements and treaties after 1945, almost everybody was deprived of something that was legitimately his and got something else to which he really had no right. Nations were thus prevented from living again peacefully with neighbors whom they had wronged or who had wronged them. The era of pan-democracy and peace, in fact, started an endless series of wars, cold, lukewarm and hot. Wilson, however, was in a way as lost at the peace conference as he had been lost before in the thick fog of factual ignorance and mythological concepts. John Maynard Keynes, who as a young man had been present at the Paris conference, gave a shattering picture of his qualities, he not only had no proposals in detail, but he was in many respects, perhaps inevitably, ill-informed as to European conditions. And not only was he ill-informed, that was true of Mr. Lloyd George also, but his mind was slow and unadaptable. There can seldom have been a statesman of the first rank more incompetent than the president in the agilities of the council chamber. Of course, Thanks to the democratization of the Western world ever since the Congress of Vienna, 1814-1815, and the Congress of Berlin, 1878, a tragic lowering of general standards had taken place. The representatives of the nations no longer spoke a common vernacular and the era of interpreters had started. In Paris Clemenceau alone among the four could speak and understand both languages, Orlando knowing only French and the Prime Minister and President only English, and it is of historic importance that Orlando and the President had no direct means of communication. Woodrow Wilson's greater guilt, nevertheless, lay in his attitude during the war, in his flat refusal to cooperate in any peace efforts and in his determination to carry the war to the bitter end, thus laying the foundations for the next one. Human lives. The number of mercenaries is limited by cash and their natural willingness to join, but draft boards can squeeze out an almost endless number of unwilling death candidates. World War I, surely, is a far more crucial historic event than most Americans think. Modern man is overoccupied with stems and leaves, he willfully disregards the roots. George F. Kennan is perfectly right when he says, all the lines of inquiry lead back to World War I. Had World War I been terminated earlier, the old Germany with certain modifications would have survived. About this by now impossibility Kennan wrote in 1951, yet, today, if one were offered the chance of having back again the Germany of 1913, a Germany run by conservative but relatively moderate people, no Nazis and no communists, a vigorous Germany, united and unoccupied, full of energy and confidence, able to play a part again in the balancing off of Russian power in Europe, well, there would be objections to it from many quarters, and it wouldn't make everybody happy, but in many ways it wouldn't be so bad, in comparison with our problem of today. Now, think what this means. When you tally up the total score of the two wars, in terms of their ostensible objectives, you find if there has been any gain at all, it is pretty hard to discern. This sort of reflection is not necessarily the outcome of two major disappointments. One ought to have been sufficient for an unprejudiced mind. Lord Newton, indeed, could write in 1929 in connection with the failure of Lansdowne's letter in the Daily Telegraph, 
If peace had been made at the end of 1917, it is clear that the Germans would have escaped their legitimate punishment. On the other hand, the failure of their criminal aggression would have been inconceivable, the Kaiser and the military caste would have been discredited and disposition to embark upon another similar enterprise would have vanished. A negotiated peace, although it might have disappointed many aspirations, would certainly have affected a more permanent European settlement than exists at the present day. Millions of lives would have been saved and the load of human misery substantially reduced. We ourselves at a moderate computation would have been spared hundreds of thousands of casualties, and more than 1,500 millions of expenditure. Objections from many quarters, disappointed aspirations these would have been exclusively on the left eager to slaughter in order to achieve its aims, the nationalistic left, the radically democratic left, the socialist communist left looking for an opportunity to enact a major revolution. President Wilson's thinking, however, was somewhat determined by his religious tradition, he was the son of a Presbyterian minister in Virginia, which earned him Calvinist sympathies in Europe, and predominantly, by his anti-monarchical bias. Nevertheless, it is questionable whether his religious position was one of affirmation or merely of negation. His Calvinism, if it genuinely existed in a theological sense, hardly shows in his speeches or in his writings, whereas his anti-Catholic attitude was quite obvious. In this one respect he fully concurred with Lloyd George and Clemenceau. His hatred for Rome was strong enough to make him sacrifice his other shibboleths, such as self-determination. He said that German Austria should go to Germany, as all were of one language and one race, but this would mean the establishment of a great central Roman Catholic nation which would be under the control of the papacy. In his anti-monarchism, in other words, in his endeavors to foster in Europe a form of government bound to fail, as a semi-hierocratic, semi-aristocratic Catholic monarchy would in Alabama, he was perhaps not really a scholarly professor of government, but just a plain American. He was convinced that the key to his success in the United States lay in the repetition of American popular notions, relating them to the rest of the world. He once said that the best leaders are those with ordinary opinions and extraordinary abilities, those who hold the opinion of the generation in which they live, outhold it with such vitality, perceive it with such excessive insight, that they can walk at the front and show the paths by which the things generally purposed can be accomplished. This is nothing but the despicable principle of that great demagogue, Ledru Roland, I am their leader, so I have to follow them. All this is not surprising since so few Americans were indifferent to the accusation of lacking patriotism, and unfortunately the blind belief in democracy, which in an altruistic nation fosters the urge for its exportation, is only too often identified, even if falsely, with patriotism. Hugo Munsterberg could rightly say about America two generations ago, I believe sincerely that no European country knows a patriotism of such fervor and explosiveness. Actually we are in this respect faced with nationalism rather than with patriotism. Patriotism is never aggressive in relation to other nations, but nationalism, which was reborn in the French Revolution, curiously enough knows no borders. It incites nations to force other nations to adopt their pattern of political happiness. Munsterberg also pointed out the deep-seated anti-monarchism of Americans. It is extremely difficult to make them see a monarchy's advantages and virtues in specific situations since they consider it a rotten institution. In the youth-worshipping American mind there is a far-reaching identification between old and rotten, another German, Ernst Brunken, remarked that in America every teacher of comparative government will discover what an enormous effort is required to impart a clear notion of European monarchical institutions to even quite mature students. A Napoleonic tyranny, a dictatorship, that is easily within the realm of their comprehension. But a legitimate monarchy seems to the Americans a simple absurdity, and he cannot understand how otherwise quite intelligent people can have faith in such a thing. For too many Americans there is a mysterious mystical connection between the monarchical and the religious concept, bolstered by the misunderstood slogan of the divine right of kings. Still, there are exceptions to the rule. Reinhold Niebuhr, who does not belong to the conservative camps, has written with great awareness of the intrinsic merits of constitutional monarchy, the traditional form of European monarchical government, the institution of monarchy, shorn of its absolute power, was found to possess virtues which neither the proponents nor the opponents of the original form anticipated. It became the symbol of the continuing will and unity of a nation as distinguished from the momentary will, embodied in specific governments. During World War I American leftism in action was probably embodied not so much by Wilson himself as by his left hand, in every sense left hand, in foreign relations, by George Davis Heron. His right hand was, naturally, Colonel House, though this friendship finally foundered and failed, Heron is hardly mentioned in the Encyclopedia Britannica, but he is featured in one-third of a column in the Encyclopedia Americana. To assess correctly Heron's actual importance is extremely difficult. 
it is quite probable that he took himself more seriously than he was taken by Wilson. And yet Heron's part in preventing an early peace in 1917, and much more so in February to March 1918, should not be underestimated. Our interest in Heron is almost equally divided between his historic role and his significance as a person, as a typical representative of progressive and leftist thinking which caused such enormous harm in our century. His ideological affinity with Wilson was complete. Both belonged to the post-Protestant age and it was easy for Heron to persuade Wilson to establish the proposed League of Nations in Geneva, the city near which Heron finally made his headquarters. Wilson was delighted and enthusiastic about this proposition. Geneva was, after all, the city of Calvin and Rousseau, whom Heron in his confusion adored simultaneously. Though Calvin can hardly be imagined without Luther, Heron completely rejected the German reformer. Heron was a national messianist, of which he was fully aware, and therefore these two Genevans with their great, even if mutually contradictory influence on America attracted his mind. After the war he wrote from Geneva to William Allen White, I labored unceasingly to make America a really messianic nation in this world crisis and to help the president in his divinely appointed stature. Both Wilson and Heron were naturally more susceptible to a dislike, if not a real hatred for Austria-Hungary rather than for Germany. William James in the 1860s also sided with Prussia against Austria, and in his case too there were religious motives, his was the typical attitude of the son of a Swedenborgian minister. Now, with America engaged in a war which Sir Dennis Brogan rightly called the Second War of Austrian Succession, a third was to follow in 1939, Heron no less than Wilson was exceedingly prone to anti-Austrian feelings and to anti-Austrian propaganda. Hence we should not be surprised about Masaryk's swift victory in his encounters with Wilson. He quickly won over the president to the idea of a radical breakup of the evil, backward Danubian monarchy and convinced him that Austria, by declaring the war against Serbia, had acted on her own and not under German pressure. The enthusiasm of the Czechs for their self-appointed leaders in exile was by no means great. Yet there can be no doubt that the American left leapt into action. American democracy, as Masaryk wrote, buried the Habsburg monarchy and the Habsburgs with it. But thus also helped bury hundreds of thousands of young Americans in World War II, Masaryk worked hand in glove with Heron, they shared common quasi-religious ideological prejudices and thus we had a truly triangular situation. We also owe it to Heron's pressure and persuasion that Woodrow Wilson brought Congress to declare war against Austria-Hungary, an action not at all in the interests of the United States. To the American leftists, we must strongly bear in mind, Austria was far more wicked than Germany, it existed in contradiction to the Mazinian principle of the national state, it had inherited many traditions as well as symbols from the Holy Roman Empire, double-headed eagle, black gold colors, etc., its dynasty had once ruled over Spain, another Bete Noir, had been leading in the Counter-Reformation, had headed the Holy Alliance, had fought against the Risorgimento, had suppressed the Magyar Rebellion under Kossuth, who has a monument in New York, had morally supported the monarchical experiment in Mexico. Habsburg, this evoked memories of Roman Catholicism, of the Armada, the Inquisition, of Metternich, of Lafayette jailed in Almutz, and Silvio Pellico in Bryn Spielberg Fortress. Such a state had to be broken up, such a dynasty had to disappear. So finally the House of Austria went into exile and was replaced by a simple common man from Austria, allegedly a house painter, who drowned the world in a flood of blood and tears. Now, who was George Davis Heron, one of the gravediggers of old Europe? Who was this curious bearded, bespectacled poet, mentioned in some documents as reverend, and others as professor or more rarely as plain Mr. Heron. Roman Rolland, the great pacifist, once referred to him. The reason? Heron had written an article against Rolland in Geneva's La Revue Mensuelle, April 1917, entitled Pacifist Immorality. At that time Heron was tortured by the fear of a compromise peace and spoke out in ringing words, darkness is rising rapidly over the skies of the nations. It is as if the soul of the human race were gripped by the crushing fear of a prehistoric night. Yes, it is Thor and Wotan who are now about to establish a reign of spiritual death. Roman Rolland replied by calling him a virtuous hypocrite and a gigantic idiot. Heron was the latter rather than the former, an eternally confused youthful enthusiast, rather than a scoundrel, steeped in deepest ignorance and drunk with words. Part of the key to his behavior and his thinking was his idealistic romantic leftism. He was born on January 21, 1862 in Montezuma, Indiana, the son of a humble couple of Scottish descent, William Heron and Isabella Davis. In 1879-1882 he went to Ripon College, Ripon, Wisconsin, a rather progressive, co-educational, non-denominational school. In 1883, only 21 years old, he married Mary Everhart. 
Heron already had decided to become a minister, it was practical humanitarianism rather than a mystical or a spiritual urge that determined his choice. Heron became a minister when he was still a student of theology. He was made Doctor of Theology by Tabor College, then was ordained minister of the First Congregational Church in Lake City, Minnesota, and finally was appointed minister in Burlington, Iowa. Apparently he found no fulfillment in his pastoral work and turned to an academic career. He also embraced socialism as a secular creed. He received a professorship at Iowa, later Grinnell, College, where the very wealthy Mrs. Rand founded a chair for applied Christianity, which Heron kept until 1899. Theoretically he belonged to the ministry but was unfrocked when his wife, who bore him five children, sued for divorce which was granted to her on the grounds of cruelty, culminating in desertion. The reasons for this separation, however, seem to have been more romantic, because very soon afterward he married Carrie Rand, a girl of rather delicate health, the daughter of his kind patron. The first Mrs. Heron received $60,000 from her former husband's new mother-in-law, a considerable sum in those days and an interesting financial transaction. Heron was not happy about the attitude of his church and he tried to counter the decision of the disciplinary committee with an open letter, dated May 24, 1901, but his protest was to no avail. The day after his suspension a secular celebration of his new marriage took place in New York's Gotham Hotel, America's leading socialists, Norman Thomas among them, were invited. Poems were recited and dramatic speeches delivered. In order to get an idea of the atmosphere of this wedding a sentence from one of the addresses might suffice, our comrade George D. Heron arose, careworn and sorrowful as one who had passed through the valley of the shadows of death, yet strong-hearted and gladsome withal, and beside him stood Carrie Rand, clad in pure vestal white and bearing lilies of the valley in her hand. This marriage lasted until 1914 in which year the second Mrs. Heron died, whereupon he left the more orthodox forms of socialism and pacifism, and he also married Miss Frieda B. Schoberl. Until World War I Heron was active in the ranks of America's Socialist Party to which many men of German descent belonged. Heron, financially independent, was a public orator and pamphleteer. One of his speeches, From Revolution to Revolution, Lessons Drawn from the Paris Commune, delivered at the Boston Socialist Club on March 21, 1903, was republished in St. Petersburg. His pacifism was coupled with socialism, and in those years Heron also developed the exceedingly florid style which stamped him as ex-preacher, a seer, a demagogue, and a hysteric. His writings abounded in hyperbolic enunciations. For example, capitalism is but the survival of animal and man. World War I surprised Heron in Italy. In the beginning Washington tried vainly to ascertain the character of this struggle and even Wilson was still hesitant to commit himself, but Heron's mind was made up quickly. The Italian socialists were just as blind as the American socialists. This was a holy war of all the forces of progress, enlightenment, and tolerance against the most unholy alliance of the Vatican, mother of harlots, the Prussian junkers, the wicked Habsburgs and the Lutheran gun manufacturers of the Ruhr Valley. The precise nature of Heron's status in American and British service, he also informed the Foreign Office, especially before 1916, seems rather ambiguous. In the voluminous Heron papers we find only two meager documents concerning his financial dealings with London and Washington and his official position. One contains an admission that he was recognized by Washington as representative of the American Socialist Mission which certainly had no ties with the American Socialist Party, whose leader Eugene V. Debs, a great idealist, was sent to penitentiary in September 1918 for his pacifist views. The Heron Papers, kept in the Hoover Institute in Stanford, California, are a unique collection. They were given as a present to the Hoover Library by Heron during his lifetime in 1924, Yet these papers cover only the years from 1917 to 1924, not the previous period. A few letters, papers, and pamphlets are in possession of the U.S. Department of State and of the Public Library in New York City. I have read not only the Heron papers but nearly 40 books and pamphlets either written by Heron or dealing with him. Wading through this mass of material one is simply terrified by the mixture of misinformation, naivete, hubris, and goodwill which characterize the activity of this fantastic person. Wilson seems to have taken serious notice of him only as late as 1917 and their contacts remained epistolary until the Paris Peace Conference, when they finally met. There is little doubt that Wilson was deeply impressed by the information imparted to him by Heron, and perhaps also by the fulsome praise which Heron bestowed upon him. The books which pleased Wilson so much were Germanism and the American Crusade, Woodrow Wilson and the World's Peace, and the menace of the peace in which Heron cried out his desperate fear that the senseless slaughter might be shortened. Some of his words, memorable for their style and content, merit recording. As one who hopes passionately for the victory of the Allies, 
I would say that a complete Prussian triumph would be preferable to a compromise between the contending peoples and principles. For even under the baleful bondage of a German dominion mankind might still through high rebellion, through hard suffering awaken to its mission in the universe, to cosmic intimacy and infinite choice. But if the war end in universal evasion, if the race refuse its great hour of decision, then downward into long and impenetrable darkness we shall surely go. One can imagine such an issue as the very despair of the heart of God, vainly broken for a dastard and derelict humanity. The Menace of the Peace, pages 9-10. The President wrote to Mr. Kennerly, publisher of Woodrow Wilson and the World's Peace, a highly congratulatory letter in which he said that he read the book with the deepest appreciation of Mr. Heron's singular insight into all the elements of the complicated situation, and into my own motives and purposes. By late 1917 Heron sat like a spider in the center of an information network with admittedly ill-defined powers of negotiating. It is certain, however, that he met a very large number of people, emissaries from Central Europe as well as from other nations. In a way this poor, ambitious man was lost in a maze, he had the greatest trouble in sizing up the character or the importance of his visitors, yet he continued to write his reports in the usual high-flown prose, issuing relentlessly one oracle and one judgment after the other. His great moment, however, came when he was empowered to receive Professor Heinrich Lamisch on a confidential peace mission from Vienna. Lamisch was a personal friend of the Emperor Charles, a first-rate scholar and three times president of the International Court of Arbitration in The Hague. It is easy to imagine what exaggerated prestige Heron enjoyed in Germany and Austria-Hungary where professors are demigods, and what importance one attached to getting the ear of a man whose opinion weighed so heavily in the White House. Heron, according to his mood, claimed or disclaimed this importance. The meeting between Heron and Lamisch took place on February 3-4, 1918, on an estate near Bern, belonging to Dr. Mulon, a self-exiled and embittered German industrialist. During a whole afternoon and evening Lamisch explained to Heron the plans of Emperor Charles, plans which were identical with those of his uncle, the murdered Archduke Francis Ferdinand. Lamisch described the envisaged transformation of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy into a federated political body in which, entirely in keeping with one of Wilson's 14 points, the individual nations, ethnic groups, should be accorded the freest opportunity of autonomous development. Actually, the picture painted by Lamisch was such that Heron at first saw no reason to reject the proposal and, without giving an answer, reflected over it during the night. Then he began to wrestle with this temptation as Jacob wrestled with God near Yabbok. In the morning he knew that he had gained a complete victory over himself, Lamish had been only an evil tempter. No, the Habsburg monarchy had to go because the Habsburgs as such were an obstacle to progress, democracy, and liberty. Lamish returned to Austria a broken man. Heron wrote a negative report for the president which he immediately transmitted to Hugh Wilson, American charged affairs in Bern, and on February 11 the president made a speech which implicitly rejected the Austrian peace overtures. Had Austria-Hungary been taken out of the war, Germany could not possibly have fought on, as in 1943, after Italy's defection, and hundreds of thousands of lives could have been saved. But Heron was a leftist bellicist, human lives meant nothing to him. His reaction to Lansdowne's one-man peace offensive had also been strong in the extreme. To Mr. Bland of the Foreign Office he wrote, it had an almost shattering effect upon me. I have been sick at heart for a week, sick unto death almost. I have never been as fearful of an ultimate peace and a lost world as I am now. And behind my fears are portentous forces, not merely echoes like Lansdowne, but the occultism of the international financiers in alliance with the Vatican. Curiously enough, Heron liked Lamish personally and gave him, to Lamish's immense surprise, two of his own books against peace. Heron's schizophrenia knew no limits. Later, at the peace conference at St. German en Lay, when Lamish was treated as a criminal, Heron's indignation was overpowering. After all, he was the man who had really believed that we would come out of this war into something like an approach to the kingdom of heaven. Nothing came of it, as after World War II, when similar hopes were voiced, and Heron's ire now turned mainly against the French in wild invectives paralleling Wilson's outcry, I should like to see Germany clean up France, and I should like to see Jusseron, the French ambassador, and tell him so to his face. Heron's remark about the occultism of the international financiers had, as the sensitive reader might perhaps surmise, an anti-Jewish bias. Socialism and the Jewish mind in its more sophisticated form do not easily get together. The Jewish outlook is rather individualistic and only in specific sociological situations and under great exogenous pressures will Jews join wholeheartedly the socialist, or communist, camp. It was therefore quite natural for Heron with his socialist background to have anti-Semitic leanings and in his papers the anti-Jewish references, usually in an anti-capitalist spirit, abound. 
frequently these assume the character of the vague and wild accusations we heard from national socialists. Typical for his mind are baseless remarks such as these, Bela Kuhn, sick, was the most flagrant agent of French Jew financiers and was put there by them. Heron's revulsion and disgust for the actual peace treaties, however, were certainly sincere and not a result of his split personality. The disappointment may not have come immediately but evolved within a year or so. Mr. Wilson's failure to rally the country in favor of the League of Nations undoubtedly had much to do with it. Heron's Umsters und Aufbau was published in German in 1920, since such a violent diatribe against the Paris treaties could not have been brought out in the United States or in England. His book, The Greater War, New York, 1919, still shows him worried about the danger of a Prussian Germanization of Europe from Calais to the gates of India, but his German pamphlet, dedicated to the youth of Europe, proves that at times he was not devoid of prophetic gifts. He foretold an age of murder and slaughter, if not a century of Tartar tortures, of the worst wars the world has ever seen. Hitler could not have been more extreme in the denunciation of the Versailles Treaty whose paragraphs abounding in ferocity, lust of conquest, contempt for the law, and lack of honor are as cruel, as shameless, as senseless, as vulgar. And sorrowfully he admitted that it was Wilson's word, the 14 points, which had undermined the German Reich and prepared the victory which Foch, finally, reaped with the sword. In this analysis he pronounced the same judgment as a certain Captain Charles de Gaulle who spent several years as a prisoner of war in Germany and described in his first book, La Discord chez l'ennemi, in ringing words Germany's demoralization through enemy propaganda. There can be no doubt that the Germans and Austrians firmly believed in the sincerity and official character of the 14 points. If the Germans had not accepted the 14 points at their face value, they probably would have fought on, Max Weber had faith in Wilson but advised continuation of the war in the fall of 1918 because he thought that otherwise the wild chauvinists among the Allies would sidetrack the president. And this is precisely what happened. Heron returned to Italy after the war but visited Germany a few times. He died in Munich on October 7, 1925, on the way back to Florence. He had become disgusted with the European socialists, not only because they had tried to make an early peace, but also because they, men such as Ramsay MacDonald and Henderson, were spending up to $25 a day in exclusive hotels. About events in Russia Heron was less sure. He wrote to Norman Thomas in 1920 that the Bolsheviks were bad, but that the future civilization of Europe is coming out of Russia, and it will be at least an approach to the kingdom of heaven when it comes. The old leftist utopia of the kingdom of heaven just around the corner. To another socialist he wrote late in 1919, I am inclined to think that the Soviet system will ultimately prevail but you are making a very great confusion between Bolshevism and the Soviet system. The Soviet system does not differ economically from the old England town meeting, or politically from the early Christian communities. We have here a foretaste to the translation of Mao's murderous minions into peaceful agrarian reformers. Slowly Heron began to see that the Italian communists were ruining Italy economically and politically. His hopes now turned to the use of force against force. His socialist friend, Roberto Michels, had embraced fascism which, after all, had started as a deviation in the socialist camp. In a book about Italy, published in 1922, Heron already expressed highest praise for the fascists, and, after Mussolini had taken over, his enthusiasm, as his correspondence shows, became almost limitless. After all, there was nothing extraordinary about his evolution. It had been duplicated in many other cases, from socialism and communism to fascism and national socialism, and back again. Chapter 16 Leftism goes from war to war. By the end of 1925 Wilson and Heron no longer were among the living, but the seed they had sown, or helped to sow, was slowly maturing. The day was not too far, as Heron had foreseen, when the Germans and the Japanese at least thought they could join hands on the Volga River. The Nazi monster was already born at that time. Instrumental in its rise was Germany's humiliation. This humiliation, however, did not derive from military defeat. The theory, so popular in the West before 1939, that the brown evil was due only to the fact that the Allies held no victory parade in Berlin in 1918 is blatant nonsense. Such a parade, if anything, might have accelerated the rise of the Nazis, the root of the trouble lay in the moralizing attitude of the West, especially of America, culminating in Article 231 of the Versailles Treaty which put all the guilt squarely on the shoulders of Germany. The treaty was signed on June 28, 1919, exactly five years after the double murder of Sarajevo, proving that crime does pay, there is no better way to generate greater hatred than by forcing a person to sign a confession of guilt when he is sacredly convinced that the confession is untrue. This one in humiliation, unprecedented up to that time in the annals of Christendom, 
created the thirst for revenge which the Nazis so cleverly exploited. It has been argued that such an article had to be inserted in order to provide a moral basis for Germany's reparation payments. It would have been not only simpler, but more honest and manly, to insist on reparations based upon the argument that in a complex war, whose origins historians were going to dispute during several decades, the loser obviously had to foot the bill, not the winner. If one compares the Congress of Vienna, which terminated 20 years of aggression, with the Paris treaties, one sees all the difference. France, as a matter of fact, emerged slightly enlarged in 1815 and thanks to Talleyrand's diplomatic genius immediately joined the Holy Alliance, true, the moral indignation game was played not only by official America but also by Britain, witness the Hang the Kaiser campaign of Mr. Lloyd George. After the defeat of a nation the situation is the same as after the physical defeat of a person. The victor has only one logical alternative, to cut his enemy's throat or help him to his feet by offering him a peaceful hand. Democracies during a war, however, cultivate collective hatreds, work up a feeling of moral indignation against entire nations, not just against their governments, which sometimes might be perfectly warranted, and thus an equitable settlement becomes extremely difficult, if not impossible. In the case of the outcome of World War I the most amazing decisions were made. Germany, not Austria-Hungary, was presented to the masses in the West as the real evildoer. This was not always the conviction of responsible statesmen and we know of Clemenceau that his hatred was greater for Austria than for Germany, Lloyd George is said to have declared a few times that for denominational reasons Austria-Hungary, not Germany, had to be carved up. Whatever the case may be, the fact remains that after 1919 Germany bordered only on one great power, France, whereas before 1914 her expansion had been hemmed in by three great powers, France, Russia, and Austria-Hungary, powers with a grand total of 230 million inhabitants against Germany's 62 million. Geopolitically Germany's situation had now vastly improved and bright Germans were quite aware of this. Professor Ernst Kornemann, rector of Breslau University, declared in his inaugural address on October 15, 1926, that in spite of all her losses, Germany must be glad that she survived the war as by far the strongest and ethnically most homogeneous political unit of Central Europe, let us take fully advantage of this situation, which our opponents have created by balkanizing and atomizing Europe, he exhorted his audience. Poland, the only stronger state with a historic background bordering on Germany, had been handicapped from the beginning by the enmity of Lloyd George, and, later, of Winston Churchill. In the rest of the area to the south and east of Germany a political order which made an eventual catastrophe absolutely inevitable was established jointly by American leftist idealism, inane British cynicism, blind French chauvinism, and Italian neo-imperialism, all intensively collaborating with the local forces of an anti-historic nationalism. The elements of criminality and insanity had achieved a perfect synthesis so that it was only a question of time until this area would fall under the sway of Berlin or Moscow or both. H. A. McCartney, one of the very few first-rate experts on Central Europe, said rightly, for a very considerable proportion of the peoples of the Danubian monarchy, then the monarchy, with all its faults, represented a degree of protection and of national security which was not lightly to be hazarded. Yet as in the case of the decolonialization of our days, the leftists of the West combined with the nationalists of other countries in order to break up larger units, thus giving adjoining truly oppressive imperialist powers an unexpected chance to enslave these unviable fragments thoroughly and completely. And when McCartney says, of all the Danubian peoples only the Czechs have succeeded in creating anything like democracy the rest either stuck to their old hierarchies or relapsed into despotism, he is still somewhat charitable. The Czechs only numbered 47% of the population of Czechoslovakia, but by annexing the Slovaks, very much against their expressed will, into a hyphenated nation which never had existed in the historic past, they suddenly formed a majority. As a matter of fact, there were more Germans, 24.5%, in Czechoslovakia than Slovaks. By clever gerrymandering devices the Czechs could maintain a parliamentary majority and exercised an oppressive rule which drove the German minority, and exactly called Zudaten Germans, into the arms of a rebellious and disloyal nationalism evolving into national socialism. Czechoslovakia foundered on the fact that while it actually represented a multinational state, it offered no place under the sun, it gave no chance for a national fulfillment to its ethnic minorities which together actually formed a majority. Like Yugoslavia it was a caricature of the defunct Austro-Hungarian monarchy. And with the dithyrambic praise bestowed by the Czech government upon Czechs behaving treasonably against the old monarchy, a real cult of disloyalty was created. The Czechs who had fought against Austria in the Czech Legion on the side of Russia from 1914 to 1917 were praised as national heroes. 
Why then should the Zudaten Germans not side treasonably with the neighboring Germans? The trick of combining several nationalities into one was repeated by the Serbs who, copying the Czechs, promulgated the existence not of a Serbo-Croatoslovene, but of a Yugoslav nation, a historical, psychological, religious, and ethnic nonsense. Whether we peruse the official Czechoslovak or South Slav atlases, we encounter in either case a flat refusal to distinguish between the different ruling nationalities, of which one ruled while the others had to obey, and the same was true of the official statistics. The Serbs also annexed the Bulgars of Macedonia and forbade the term Macedonia which had to be supplanted by southern Serbia, the West accepted all this without protest, but the reaction probably would have been different if the Germans had claimed the Dutch as Germans just because they spoke a language based on Low German. Up to the 16th century at least, the Dutch considered themselves to be Germans, inhabiting the lowlands, the Netherlands of Germany, but subsequently they developed a national conscience entirely of their own which only certain Dutch Nazis dared to question. Yet the Slovaks never had been Czechs, the Croats and the Macedonians never were Serbs, the Slovenes had never been ruled by Belgrade. Before taking paper and pencil to make an inventory of what had become politically of the former Danubian monarchy, let us recall Disraeli's words, the maintenance of the Austrian Empire is necessary to the independence and, if necessary to the independence, necessary to the civilization and even to the liberties of Europe. He feared the deep-seated antagonism of Britain's moderate left toward Austria, of the liberals already then influenced by radicalism, of men who measured foreign countries by their affinity to British institutions. You looked on the English constitution as a model form, he said to the liberals in the House of Commons. You forced this constitution in every country. You laid it down as the great principle that you were not to consider the interests of England, or the interests of the country you were in connection with, but that you were to consider the great system of liberalism, which has nothing to do with the interests of England, and was generally antagonistic with the interests of the country with which you were in connection. How easily one could substitute democracy for liberalism and address these sentences to America no less than to British leftists who had served neither the real interest of their country nor of the countries whom they saddled with representative governments of a democratic character. Winston Churchill, who during his life repeatedly crossed party lines and was by no means a true conservative, but, rather, a pragmatic deist, held views similar to those of Disraeli. He had seen what not only the republican form of government in Germany, but also the destruction of Austria had brought to the world. For centuries this surviving embodiment of the Holy Roman Empire had afforded a common life, with advantages in trade and security, to a large number of peoples, he wrote, none of whom in our time had the strength or vitality to stand by themselves in the face of pressure from a revivified Germany or Russia. All these races wished to break away from the federal or imperial structure, and to encourage their desires was deemed a liberal policy. The Balkanization of southeastern Europe proceeded apace with the consequent relative aggrandizement of Prussia and the German Reich, which, though tired and war scarred, was intact and locally overwhelming. There is not one of the peoples or provinces that constituted the empire of the Habsburgs to whom gaining their independence had not brought the tortures which ancient poets and theologians had reserved for the damned. Churchill repeated these views in a note to the Foreign Office on April 8, 1945, this war should never have come unless, under American and modernizing pressure, we had driven the Habsburgs out of Austria and Hungary and the Hohenzollerns out of Germany. By making these vacuums we gave the opening for the Hitlerite monster to crawl out of its sewer onto the vacant thrones. No doubt these views are very unfashionable. No doubt they were in April 1945, because world leftism was already busy laying the foundations of World War III so that more young people, nay, people of all ages could again be plowed under for the sacred cause of progress, democracy, enlightenment, social justice, security, and so forth. Taking the inventory of what has happened to Central Europe half a generation after the treaties of Versailles, saint germain en laye Neuilly, and Trianon, we will find that Germany in 1934 was ruled by a totalitarian dictatorship of the Nazis, that the Czechs of Czechoslovakia uneasily bossed the non-Czechs who were waiting for a day of revenge, that Poland and Austria were authoritarian states under Pilsudski and Dolphus, that Hungary was ruled oligarchically with a very limited democracy, that the Iron Guard in Romania was preparing for the conquest of the country, that in Yugoslavia ever since the murder of Radic the terror regime of Belgrade ruled through assassination and execution, that parliamentarism prevailed neither in Bulgaria nor in Albania or Portugal. Lithuania and Estonia had become dictatorships. Latvia and Greece had two more years to wait for this transition. In Spain we saw the build-up for the civil war. In Japan parliamentary life had become as farcical as in Turkey, in Russia the Duma had disappeared a long time ago. In other words, the Holy Crusade to make Europe safe for democracy, with its billions spent and its millions killed, 
had ended in a total defeat of democracy and also, which was far worse, of the liberal principle of personal freedom. Where did personal freedom still exist? Where was it constitutionally protected? Certainly not in Czechoslovakia where Professor Tuka was jailed because on the 10th anniversary of the very spurious Pittsburgh Agreement he published an article entitled Vacuum Juris in which he merely showed that the terms of the agreement had come to an end. Freedom outside of Switzerland and France existed only in the historic monarchies of Europe, of Northern Europe to be more precise. In this connection the text of the decision of the Conference of Ambassadors, of the Allies, issued in April 1921 when a similar resolution on a Habsburg restoration had been passed in February 1920, makes interesting reading, the principal Allied powers consider that the restoration of a dynasty which represented in the eyes of its subjects a system of oppression and domination over other races, in alliance with Germany, would be incompatible with the achievements of the war in liberating peoples hitherto enslaved, as well as with the principle for which the war was waged. In view of the fact that now 22 million people in the area formerly ruled by the Habsburgs were under the control of nations of other tongues, whereas before 1918 just about the same number were controlled by German Austrians, Magyars, and Croats, one is truly amazed. Now the Habsburgs figured as the villains in the eyes of the great worldwide left from Washington to Moscow, and, later, in the eyes of Brown Berlin, while the Karagiorgeviks of Serbia, who had come to rule by murder, governed through murder and had erected a monument in Sarajevo for the murdered Grave Rila Princip, were probably viewed as representatives of progressive, tolerant liberalism. To a Central European blessed with a modicum of education and common sense this declaration by the Conference of Ambassadors of the Principal Allied Powers must have appeared as the height of suicidal folly and hypocrisy. Came deus vult perditi, prius dementat. An equal amount of stark madness also characterized French strategy in Central Europe. The American idea to destroy utterly the Western break against Russian aggression and the Far Eastern obstacle to Chinese expansion, practiced in 1945, had its precedent in the French policies on the Danube. Austria-Hungary had been supported by Germany, therefore Austria-Hungary had to go. The successor states, however, now had to assume the role of effective dams against Germany and Russia. Austria had to be reduced to an area she roughly held in the 13th century, Hungary was deprived of 70% of her area and of two-thirds of her population. Austria was allowed to keep an army of 30,000, Hungary one of 35,000 men. The Austrian army was not even permitted to use gas masks, Austria could not feed herself, one out of three Austrians was a Viennese, and she lost all major coal deposits. As a result the vast majority of Austrians thought of reunion with Germany and Nazidom flourished in Austria because the Nazis offered a speedy Angelus. The Hungarians were automatically driven into the arms of those powers which promised a radical revision of the peace treaties, Italy and, later, Germany. The same was true of Bulgaria, one-third of the Bulgarians were living under a foreign flag. Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Yugoslavia, countries whose names before 1850 could never have been found on a map, a dictionary or an encyclopedia formed the Little Entente and received an enormous amount of French military and financial aid. Billions of francs, extorted from unwilling French taxpayers, were poured into these countries designed to stem Germany's Drang Nakusten. Two of them, Romania and Yugoslavia, together with Greece and Turkey, also belonged to the Balkan League. The avowed purpose of this league was to oppose all territorial demands of Bulgaria and Albania. The Little Entente and the Balkan League thus formed a huge Z stretching from the gates of Dresden to the borders of Iran. Yet, as any child could foresee, the French investments were hopelessly squandered. Greece and Turkey were not so much anti-German as merely anti-Bulgar, and the other three states were primarily interested in, a, preventing a Habsburg restoration, and, b, thwarting Hungarian, or Austrian, revisionism. Their common interest was their common loot, their common fear, and their common bad conscience. When the Nazis appeared on the scene as staunch enemies of the Habsburg restoration, Prague, Belgrade, and Bucharest immediately collaborated with them and, in a way, betrayed their French protector. On top of all this it must have been evident to any intelligent person, and it was evident to any intelligent Frenchman not belonging to the leftist establishment, that the members of the Little Entente never would nor really could fight the Germans even if they wanted to. Their armies were the most heterogeneous units, their nucleus had been formed by small groups of traders who had deserted from the old Imperial Royal Army and now were serving the new masters of Central Europe, many coming from the Balkans. We shall see later how these armies stood up to the grim realities of the years 1938-1941. Let us remember that Yugoslavia between 1918 and 1919 was officially called Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, Proljevina Serba, Hrvata i Slovenica, 
abbreviated SHS which was interpreted by those speaking German to mean sie hassen sich, they hate each other. It is significant that to this day US foreign language newspapers with a central European background almost never call themselves Czechoslovak or Yugoslav, but Slovene, Croat, Serb, Czech, Slovak, Ukrainian, Macedonian, etc. Not even under the tremendous pressure exercised by communist dictatorships have these nationalities gelled into synthetic nations. However important that seismic area, however tragic American intervention in that region, the fact remains that the American public at large was not really interested in that part of the globe, at least until the Zudaten crisis in September 1938. This is less true of the American left, and here we come to the great sin of a mission of the American right, or perhaps of the right of conservative circles almost anywhere in the West. When Hitler actively intervened on behalf of the Zudaten Germans in Czechoslovakia in 1938 and effectively blackmailed England, Neville Chamberlain referred to Czechoslovakia as a country of which we know so little. This, at least, was an honest and candid confession. But let us not lose the thread of our investigation. To begin with, it is true that the study of foreign history and geography is a weak spot not only in American, but also in British schools. It has rightly been said that European history is often taught in American schools as French history with frills. The usual frills are Philip II, the Reformation, Peter the Great, Bismarck, and Cavour. Geography is the very stepchild of higher American education. To this calamity must be added another. Leftism in the United States was always international-minded whereas American conservatives tended to be nationalistic, introspective, and isolationist. There is, as we all know, a strong and durable connection between leftism, radical democracy, socialism, communism, and nationalism, a genuine ethnic nationalism or merely its clever exploitation. Yet, while leftism is trying to keep one eye on national realities and national susceptibilities, the other eye tries to encompass the globe. There can be little doubt that nationalism as well as anti-intellectualism in America grew at first on leftist soil. Jefferson in his remarks on foreign countries showed himself a fanatical nationalist and, as Professor Hofstadter has shown us so convincingly, anti-intellectualism in the United States went hand-in-hand -hand with democracy. Intellectuality in America originally was considered to be an aristocratic vice. What could be more obvious than the anti-egalitarian character of higher knowledge, training, or education? The American upper crust, the American aristocracy used to be great travelers, they enjoyed the value of foreign countries, whereas the early democratic element of the United States, the frontiersmen, had neither the disposition nor the time to scan foreign horizons. The China Clippers, the rise of big banks with worldwide connections, the international relations of the leading universities interest of the top layers of New England and the Middle Atlantic states. Thus the anti-intellectual and localist, isolationist, lower classes with subtly leftist views faced an international-minded and brainy upper class. F. J. Grun's picture of the United States in the 1830s confirms this. It would be interesting to make a thorough study about the reasons why a change of attitudes actually has taken place. This evolution in America, however, has certain analogies and relations with shifts of emphasis in Europe. There, we should never forget, conservative thought, as opposed to mere traditionalist sentiments, developed more in those countries where the Reformation had triumphed than in the Catholic or even in the Greek Orient ones. Maras is not a conservative, Demestra is more of a reactionary. What we get in Southern and Eastern Europe are rather emancipated thinkers who in the sovereignty of their outlook overcome the leftist myths this, however, is not necessarily conservatism. The reformers, Luther above all, as it cannot be stressed sufficiently often, were anti-intellectual and anti-rational. And since conservatism in Northern Europe leaned heavily on religion, this anti-rational and anti-rationalist attitude crept into conservative thinking. Professor Hofstadter is most emphatic about the influence of Protestantism on anti-intellectualism in America, especially so of the purely emotional sex with ecstatic undertones. Another factor was the international character of America's socialism and the protectionist character of the American manufacturer. To make matters worse, it soon became evident that new ideologies were constantly imported into America by continental immigrants and these new Welton showing in of a strongly political character, of an extremist and radical bias, were opposed to many facets of Americanism and a large part of the American folklore. Similar feelings prevailed in England. As a child I remember a comic strip in the London Daily Mirror which featured a black-haired, bearded anarchist who added the ending ski to every word he said, thus indicating his Slavic origin. And indeed it cannot be doubted that the Mediterranean and East European element played a very large role in the anarchist and socialist movements in America until the 1930s. To be true, they also had an Irish admixture. It is obvious that Anglo-Saxons do not like to throw bombs or mount the barricades. 
Their civil wars, nowadays at least, if any, are waged in an orderly military fashion, and not in the Viet Cong way. By the early 20th century the internationally minded forces in America were the Marxist left, the anarchist left, the moderate, unorganized left composed of radical Democrats, suffragettes, single taxers, the Catholic Church, with all sorts of mental reservations, and a great part of American jury. And the more these international-minded groups cast interested glances to Europe, Latin America, and Asia, the more the average solid conservative American stiffened in his retrospective parochialism. Obviously, there is a sane and even God-ordained patriotism, remember our Lord crying over the fate of Jerusalem, as there is also a patriotism which in the words of the conservative Dr. Johnson is a refuge of scoundrels. Equally there exists a reasonable, rational, and honorable Christian internationalism as well as a perverted and irrational form. Yet, whatever the case, the fact remains that internationalism no less than the crucially important field of international relations was left to the left. And so were intellectual and cultural affairs which, by default, became the monopoly of long-haired professors and short-haired ladies, a truly perverse situation, considering that intellectual and artistic creativeness is the only undisputed realm of male supremacy. There always have been Amazons, Petroleuses, and women of Herculean strength in the better circuses. Thus we should not be surprised to see American foreign policy following an ever-increasing leftist pattern. Originally the leftist pressures were exogen, came through the mass media, emanated from well-organized groups, from radio commentators and columnists. By 1938 the State Department was not yet the happy hunting ground of the leftists, but the leftist critique of it was increasing by leaps and bounds. As a result a leftist administration started its successive purges until the State Department assumed an increasingly leftist character. This was equally true of the diplomatic service which is largely under the control of the U.S. Department of State. Ambassadors, however, need confirmation by the Senate, and fortunately, for one reason or the other, the right man might get into the right place, as in the case of Robert Murphy, under the crucial Democratic administrations from 1933 to 1953 many appointees were leftist professors a la William E. Dodd and leftist millionaires of the Joseph E. Davis type. Driven by their missionary zeal and their fatal vanity they often luckily left us their impressions, actions, and reactions in print, which gives us a marvelous opportunity to study the simple monumental leftist ignorance in its historic international relation. This leftist monopoly on foreign affairs, however, is not only due to a conservative default, to a sour suspicious retreat in disappointment and offense. At the back of it lies something even more tragic, the imminent fear in the American non-committed right that the left, so nicely rooted in American folklore, after all, is riding the wave of the future. How, otherwise, could one understand that temperamentally very conservative boards of trustees of colleges and universities have repeatedly hired professors notorious for their leftist ideas? How could one understand that arch-conservative American businessmen have sent their sons and especially their daughters to institutions of learning equally well known for their exorbitant rates and their extreme leftism, a leftism pertaining to politics, history, philosophy, economics, and morals? How often do well-paid Marxists in such places indirectly and even directly tell intellectually innocent maidens, at their hard-toiling father's expense, that their procreators are real scoundrels and bloodsuckers? Yet the hard-toiling fathers know all this and both parents accept this state of affairs with a sigh, it is, after all, the proper thing to do to provide the dear little thing with a highbrow education in a college with high social rating and to acquaint her with all advanced ideas. They might hope that, once safely married to an equally hard-working stockbroker, the good girl would wake up from sweet leftist dreams and end up as secretary of the local women's Republican club. One apparently has to leave brains, ideas, and new vistas to those budding leftist eggheads, even if they stand badly in need of a haircut. How, otherwise, can one explain the fact that newspaper owners, editors-in-chief, or radio station proprietors, who have safely overcome their adolescent flirtations with leftism, again and again employ wildly leftist reporters, columnists, and commentators? I have especially in mind a leading Midwestern daily and its correspondent covering the Spanish Civil War. The paper was well known for its strictly conservative attitude and the correspondent for his boundless sympathies for the mixtum compositum known as Republican Loyalist Spain. Of course the communists also were Republicans and they were exceedingly loyal but not exactly to Spain, that correspondent also was blessed with absolute and total ignorance of Spanish history, but leftists are always forward and not backward looking persons, they do not heed the maxim that those who ignore history are condemned to repeat it. Still, the attitude of that paper can be understood only in view of the repressed and well-hidden inferiority complex of the frequent American adherence to conservative principles without being intellectually able to defend them. 
Just because he also had a notion of progress practically in the leftist sense, he feels strongly that he is only fighting a rearguard delaying action. All he can usually look forward to is a certain schadenfreude, a spiteful pleasure at the inevitable setbacks and failures of leftism. This attitude gives to a certain type of American conservative, far more so than to the continental one, a petty, morose, and melancholy character. He stands in need of a rather light-hearted, humorous, and magnanimous aggressiveness, a will to win, coupled with the liberality of those who believe in diversity. The American left in the 1920s was nevertheless building up its positions. They were strengthening their various camps intellectually, achieved an increasing control of education and the arts, and slowly gained a monopoly in fashioning public opinion on foreign issues. The rise of fascism in Italy was not overly noticed, however, and certain representatives even of the Democratic Party were friendly toward Mussolini. Yet the Soviet Union was far more successful than Italy in winning the sympathies of the writers known to be open-minded though only in one direction. And just as France had its Dreyfus case, a Jewish captain of the French army was unjustly accused and convicted of having betrayed military secrets to the German military attaché the United States had its Sacco and Vonsetti case which drove a great many people into the leftist camp, some of them even right into the arms of communism or pro-communism. Among them was Eugene Lyons, a great idealist, who went as foreign correspondent to Moscow where he was cured of his leftism. But how many Americans had the advantages and the opportunity of such a splendid re-education? There were many aspects to the Sacco and Vonsetti case, but to the outside world the least important of all was the question of the two men's guilt or innocence. Whatever the answer might be, they themselves never admitted any guilt except their belief in political anarchism. Non-totalitarian Europe, however, was in modern times very lenient to political criminals and thus almost nobody cared whether these two men, and a third, a Portuguese, Celestino Medeiros, were assassins or not. By 1927 very few continental countries had the death penalty. Sacco and Vonsetti had waited for death no less than seven years and this idea seemed intolerable to Europeans. Americans argue that justice in the United States is so meticulous that every appeal of a condemned man will be so carefully investigated that between the original trial and the actual execution years might elapse. Europeans would maintain that an agony lasting for several years is worse than a quick death. Therefore practically all of Europe protested. Rightists and leftists alike, monarchists and republicans, fascists and communists, Catholics and atheists. The Pope tried to intercede. Mussolini demanded pardon, the president of Portugal, then already a fascist dictatorship under Salazar, also asked for grace. I mention all this in detail not only because the Sacco and Vonsetti case is of importance to American ideological history, but because it shows how little the continental outlook is understood by Americans. The reaction among pious European Christians of the right is very simple, either these men are innocent, then their execution is a crime, or they are guilty, then they will hardly commit another murder. And as to a punishment, they will surely get it in afterlife. In fascist Italy the execution of these two anarchists was taken as a national insult. In 1928 Luigi Rusticuxi published a book in Naples, Trahedia e Supply Zip di Sacco e Vonsetti, whose preface was written by Arnaldo Mussolini, brother of the Duce. Vonsetti's earthly remains were brought back to Italy and buried. Around his grave, with the connivance of fascist authorities, a local cult developed. The fact that these men were anarchists, and not communists, was an aggravating circumstance in European feelings. That's what we all are, was a not infrequent reaction, but unfortunately, it is an realistic attitude and conviction. This is also one of the reasons why the Rosenberg trial and the execution of the ill-fated couple did not create the same stir in Europe as the Sacco Vonsetti case had. Against the background of millions dying in red concentration camps and hundreds executed for speculation, the protest movement in Europe did not materially transcend the communist camp. The next stage in the unfolding drama of American-European relations came in 1929 through the Black Friday on the New York Stock Exchange and the powerful crescendo of the world economic crisis. This mighty blow, striking free enterprise without preparation, almost immediately engendered in America a wave of anti-capitalist feelings, an increased interest and enthusiasm for socialist ideas and notions, a new, benevolent attitude toward Russian communism. When I visited the Soviet Union for the first time in the summer of 1930 I was struck by the fact that 80 or 90 percent of the tourists came from the United States, and also that a very large sector of the Anospiazzi, the foreign specialists were Americans. America's Red Decade, to use the title of one of Eugene Lyon's books, was then already in full swing. Certain Americans were lapping up the books of Maurice Hindus and a great many salient features of the USSR recommended themselves to the American mind, the fostering of community feelings, the methodical warfare against outworn traditions, 
the emphasis on progress, industrialization, the demophile atmosphere of Russia, which had always existed, the welfare institutions, from kindergartens to hospitals, the experiments in the penal system, the efforts to create something new. Among the American tourists, the majority of them female, one frequently could discover an almost hysterical enthusiasm. For most of them communism filled a void caused by the loss of religious faith or faith in Wall Street. However, these tourists, visitors, and students had no means of measuring the achievements or failures of communism. They had not known Imperial Russia, they did not speak Russian, they were completely in the hands of their guides, they had no contacts with the -the run-of-the-mill Russian population, contacts at that time were very difficult to establish, they knew nothing about Russian history, they were frequently so helpless that without outside aid they could not distinguish the door of a men's room from that of a powder room. Comment, I find this sort of alphabet rather confusing, had they ever been to an abshithiti, a common apartment, seen a kitchen, or eaten in a stolovaya, a communal restaurant, they might have started thinking. But they had nothing to go on except their subconscious determination to be enthusiastic, and enthusiastic they usually became. He who knows human nature realizes to what extent a previous disposition can warp the human mind and destroy objectivity thoroughly and completely. The economic crisis profoundly affected the patriotism of all these Americans who saw in their country not the mother who loves even when she is old, ugly, fragile, and difficult, but merely the provider, the land of plenty quite in keeping with the immortal poetry of Edgar Guest. Mr. Hoover's presidency was drawing to a close and Mr. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, one of the most dynamic gravediggers of the Western world, succeeded on a platform not dissimilar to that of his predecessor. Though Mr. Roosevelt belonged to the Democratic Party, his social background made him not originally disposed to leftist policies at home and abroad. His wife, from another branch of the Roosevelt family, was more deeply inured with leftist ideas, the natural result of higher feminine education in the United States, be it public or private. Whereas Mr. Roosevelt in his politics was playing by ear, his wife, wielding a considerable influence, was, as we shall show, ideologically far more consistent. Mr. Roosevelt, moreover, had the scantiest of education for his task, he hardly knew Europe, his knowledge of foreign languages was as modest as his acquaintance with the mentality of other nations. Being largely ignorant himself, he really had no way of judging and evaluating expert opinion, or of coordinating conflicting expert views. He was profoundly anti-intellectual and his sense of objective truth was gravely impaired his handicap was by no means predominantly of a physical nature. He certainly would have needed treatment from a competent psychiatrist. Hitler's takeover in Germany and Mr. Roosevelt's first inauguration speech were only a few weeks apart, and in the beginning there was a certain amount of Nazi admiration for President Roosevelt, his administration, and the New Deal which slowly crystallized, trying to solve the economic crisis with statist and planning measures. The end of the economic crisis in the United States came, however, as it did in Germany, with rearmament, The German traveler, writer, and lecturer, Colin Ross, who had decidedly Nazi views, was also an admirer of the new United States. Most Nazi authors writing about American history showed themselves favorably to the Jeffersonian-Jacksonian, populist and anti-federalist, tradition and Herr Jost, president of the Reichsschriftenkammer, the Nazi Chamber of Literature, wrote a play about Tom Paine. The Roosevelt administration was hostile to big business and this was entirely in keeping with Nazi notions. While the Nazis tolerated the manufacturers, they were especially hard on finance which they called grasping but not creative capital, Raffendes Abernicht Schaffendes Kapital, the Nazis, moreover, were convinced that capital in the United States was largely in Jewish hands. They respected Henry Ford, the history is bunk man who had once written a book against the Jews, but they were dead certain that names like Mellon or Morgan were Jewish. Mr. Roosevelt's high-handed dealings with the business world, with Congress, and the Supreme Court were greatly admired by the Nazis. Nor was Mr. Roosevelt in the beginning too hostile toward Hitler or his henchmen. As a matter of fact, even the Angelus was right away recognized by the United States, and the American legation in Vienna swiftly transformed into a consulate general. The Reichsmordwosch, Reich Murder Week, starting on June 30, 1934, during which the Nazis assassinated hundreds of opponents, traitors, and rivals within a few days, did not trouble American-German relations. American public opinion had neither been particularly upset by Japan's grabbing Manchuria, aggression should have been stopped right there, nor by Mussolini's conquest of Ethiopia, which even Mr. Herbert L. Matthews of the New York Times underwrote. Only a black pilot in Harlem volunteered for the Abyssinian Air Force, a mulatto in sympathy with Semiticum Harris under the flag of Negro Solidarity, Americans, however, were duly aroused by the Spanish Civil War which broke out in July 1936. 
To the American left this was the crusade of crusades, a far more sacred cause than either World War I or World War II. What were the reasons for this enthusiasm which, in a certain way, still has not abated? It is obvious, as we have hinted before, that the, British manufactured, Leyenda Negra, the black legend about Spain, was still very much alive. Spain had been the pillar of the Counter-Reformation and it was the last country to have been at war with the United States before World War I. Other reasons were Spain's Catholic and allegedly aristocratic character. And Spain, on top of it all, received aid from Germany and Italy. Therefore, the reasoning went, the Nazis and the fascists, envious of the wonderful democratic progress of Republican Spain, were scheming to destroy it. Franco was a stooge of Hitler and Mussolini, Franco conspired with Nazis and fascists. Conspirationism as a key to the understanding of history is by no means a privilege of unimaginative reactionaries, but also of the left, it was Franco's task to make Spain into a bastion of racist fascism and thus help to encircle democratic progressive France, which was run by a popular front government. It was therefore America's duty to come to the aid of loyalist Spain. The truth is different and, as always, complex. The Second Spanish Republic was just as much a failure as the first. Born in April 1931 as a result of communal elections which showed the left in strong ascendancy in certain key places, it went through a never-ending series of crises. As a constitutional monarchy 19th century style, Spain clearly had not been viable. The dictatorship of General Miguel Primo de Rivera in the 1920s brought stability as long as it lasted, it drew support from the army and the trade unions, but the latter finally went into opposition, whereupon Primo resigned, shortly to be replaced by General Berenger. It would certainly have been the duty of King Alfonso XIII to establish a provisional royal dictatorship and to use force if necessary. Given the fanatically opposed, ideologically so thoroughly divided parties, from anarchists to Trotskyists to Carlist traditionalists, a parliamentary regime along classic lines was and always will be bound to fail in Spain. Such a failure is all the more certain if the parties in question are grimly determined not to abide by the rules of the game and to revolt if circumstances permit. Modifying Clausewitz's aphorism, War is the continuation of diplomacy by other means, one could say that in ideologically divided countries civil war is but the continuation of parliamentarism with other means. Miguel de Unamuno, a very independent-minded and original liberal who lived in exile during Primo's dictatorship, had advocated civil war for years as a necessary means to purify the air and to rejuvenate the country. The politically inflammable material was getting larger and larger every year. At the last free elections in February 1936, no less than 28 political parties competed and got a sufficient number of votes to send representatives to the Cortes. When I mentioned this to a Spanish friend he pounded the table and shouted, this is a dirty lie. We have not 28 but 28 million different parties. He clearly referred to the number of inhabitants of Spain. The birth of the Republic was marred by endless acts of mob violence, by the burning of churches and monasteries, CP. 269 by endless strikes, by outbreaks of brigandage and a rapid decline of general security. To every unbiased observer it was evident that a democratic Spanish republic is a grotesque proposition. The democratic republic might work in the United States and in Switzerland, but since Spaniards are radically different from Genevans or Philadelphians, it was obvious that the experiment would fail, and fail only slightly less than it did in Russia. The inner division of Spain was shattering. The elections of 1934 produced a right-of-center government. The result was a rising of the miners in the Austrias, most of them anarcho-syndicalists of the Federación de Anarquistas Ibericos, FAI. Delirious atrocities were committed already then, horrors worse than those depicted by Goya in his Desastres de la Guerra. This savage outbreak could only be quelled with the aid of the Tercio, the Spanish Foreign Legion, a body of professional soldiers known for their courage and their brutality. Part of them stood under the command of a young general who had distinguished himself in the Rif War and who came from a notoriously Republican family. His younger brother Ramon, the first man to cross the South Atlantic by plane, had thrown leaflets from the air in 1931 asking the king to abdicate. The Prime Minister of the Spanish Republic in 1934, however, was Don José María Gil Robles, son of a well-known professor of political science and himself an outstanding Catholic lay leader. He tried to persuade the general in question to establish a military dictatorship because Spain had proved ungovernable by constitutional means. The general energetically rejected the proposal. His name is worth remembering, Don Francisco Franco y Bahamond. He certainly was not the most likely man in the Spanish army to do what had been repeatedly done in Spanish America, establish military rule. General Sinjurjo was the man to do this. Sinjurjo failed, unfortunately, in a premature uprising and went to Portugal. After the elections in 1936, 
when matters went from bad to worse, Sun Jorge planned another uprising. Franco at that time had been sent to the Canary Islands by the leftist government, he had become suspect. At the same time the left also planned a takeover which was scheduled for late July. Things came to a head when, in the Cortes, Rosa Abari, La Pagenera, told the monarchist deputy José María Calvo Sotelo that he would speedily meet his end. On the same night he was arrested and murdered by the assault guards, a new police force created by the regime which did not trust the old Guardia Civil. It was now evident to everyone that Republican Spain had totally ceased to be an estado de derecho, a land of constitutionality, of law and order. Sunjurjo therefore proclaimed a military dictatorship and took a private plane to Spain to organize the takeover. Unfortunately the plane crashed. Sunjurjo was killed while the pilot barely survived the accident. Franco's flight from the Canaries to Morocco, where he joined the Tercio, was better managed by Luis Bolin, and the transfer of the Tercio and of the Moorish regiments was partly financed by the Jewish Quarter, the Mel of Tetuan. The army rebellions in Barcelona, Valencia, and Madrid quickly collapsed, but the commander of Seville, the Quixotic Capo de Lano, who was not in the conspiracy, rose to everybody's surprise. The initial stage of the revolution went so badly that General Mola was about to give up, when the requestees, the military formations of Carlists, reorganized literally overnight and virtually forced him to fight. The fathers and grandfathers of these men had been defeated in the war against the liberal monarchy in 1872. Now they were again, miraculously, in on the plan. No doubt theirs was the lion's share in the victory. Franco was just one of the generals in the junta that took over. The chairman of this committee was General Cabanellas, also a well-known Republican. General Franco emerged as the undisputed leader only by the end of 1936. The situation at that time was this, the larger part of the army and a minor part of the navy had joined the military rising. The air force was almost wholly loyalist. The richest parts of Spain were under the control of the Republicans, the poorest and most backward on the Franco side. Almost all the industrial areas were loyalist, but the most historical provinces, Old Castile, Leon, Galicia, part of Aragon, and Navarre, were nationalist. The term nationalist is not entirely wrong in view of the fact that the Franco side stressed national values, and that the cry Viva España was used among the nationalists, but was strictly taboo on the loyalist side. There can be no doubt that all the great lights, the great thinkers, the genius of Spain were traditionally rightist, leftist Spain's intellectual or artistic contribution was almost zero. True, there is Picasso, an artist of real genius and a communist, but he leads an exceedingly bourgeois life and is repudiated by the communists as an artist. Men such as Unamuno, José Ortega Agasset, Federico García Lorca, Machado, Américo Castro, Salvador de Madariaga, Gregorio Marañón, and Menéndez Pidal were or are individualistic old liberals, but not leftists. On the loyalist side none of the great Spanish traditions was represented, except the anarchist bent embodied in the FAI but in 1937 open warfare broke out between the anarchists and the communists, and the former were defeated in street battles, jailed, massacred en masse and murdered individually. The GPU also brutally persecuted the POUM, Partido Obrero de Unificación Marxista, the Trotskyite group. Their leader, Andrés Nin, perished in one of the purges. As for population, the loyalist area had about three times as many inhabitants as the nationalist side, and, as we said before, its wealth was far more substantial. Republican Spain had almost all the industries, by far the best agricultural lands, and on top of it all the treasury, a big gold hoard which went largely to the Soviet Union and a smaller part to Mexico. The outlook was dim for the nationalists, but they had the greater faith and by far the better leaders. Besides the Carlists, the toughest of the tough, they had the Senorito on their side and most of the officers' corps. This also prevented the fiendish massacres so prevalent in the loyalist camp. It is true that in the confusion of the first weeks many people were shot, many innocents died. Georges Bernanos in Le Grand Cimetière sous la Lune has given a terrible account of the frivolous executions in Majorca, but I know of no case of slow tortures preceding death and of sheer bestiality which abounded in the leftist sector. Here the balance is entirely in favor of the nationalists. The loyalists have shown themselves faithful disciples of de Sade and the Bluecoats and the Vendée. The horrors of the Congo were anticipated in this war, and the great leftist delight, i.e., the defiling of cemeteries, was practiced as an exquisite art. I had the chance to see the cemetery of Huesca, a city under siege, between September 1936 and April 1938. Only one road connected the city with nationalist Spain and trucks could enter it only very early in the morning or late at night with the lights switched off and traveling at great speed. Life within the city went on normally, but the cemetery, to the east, 
was in red hands all the time. And since the forces of progress, democracy, and enlightenment could not take Weska, they vented their hatred on the dead. The vulgarities, the obscenities, the corpses torn out of their graves and assembled in obscene positions gave one a never-to-be-forgotten impression of the fine spirit which receives such enthusiastic support from the American and British left. I saw these horrors just a few days after the liberation of that cemetery and on the way back to Weska, riding on an army jeep, we passed a stalled ambulance which bore the inscription, Gift of the Friends of Spanish Democracy, Tampa, Florida Chapter. My Spanish companion could not eschew the remark that we now had seen a splendid example of Western democracy. I protested, still, the revolution of the 18th of July as the Red Counter-Rising was officially called, had indeed been an orgy of rape, sadism, torture, and unspeakable obscenities perpetrated by our dear friend, the common man, and which has its analogies wherever leftism lifted its ugly head. A detailed account of some of the horrors would hardly be fit to print. That they showed the need for a spiritual re-education of vast sectors of the Spanish people is also not to be denied. As usual in ideological conflicts there was foreign intervention in the Spanish Civil War. The parties in question took help from whoever offered it. The Americans fighting against British rule accepted French aid and it is virtually certain that without the efforts of France, Spain, and the Netherlands, but, above all, those of France, independence would not have been achieved or only after a long time and at a terrible price. Yet the mere fact that the founding fathers were allies of Louis XVI and Charles III does not prove for a moment that they were imbued with Bourbon traditions or that the United States showed everlasting gratitude to the Bourbons of France and Spain. However, one radical difference exists between the two interventions. There was a Communist Party in Spain which worked hand in glove with the Soviet interventionists, whereas there was no big Bourbonist organization in the nascent United States. To call the Falangists fascists is far more erroneous than to call the Nazis fascists, as the Soviets do, for very obvious reasons. The old phalangist doctrine, which is admittedly rather left than right, has certain totalitarian aspects and so had the JONS, Juntas Ofensivas Nacional Syndicalistas, but the political theories of José Antonio Primo de Rivera and of Alfonso García Valdecasas, co-founder of the Falange, put the person first, not the state or society, a theory absolutely in keeping with the Spanish tradition. Whereas the Spanish communists, the heroes of the Revolution of July 18th, collaborated with Moscow from the very beginning, the military men worked independently from the Nazis and the Germans, and German as well as Italian help was only forthcoming after the heavy aerial attacks by the Red Air Force. There were comparatively many civilian victims. Only German and Italian aid assured to the nationalists' superiority in the air which was probably not achieved before the summer of 1937. In the spring of 1938 I still witnessed Red Air attacks. German aid outside of aviation, was merely technical, pioneers, materiel, signal corps, and after the conquest of the North Spanish industrial area, vast provinces, Asturias, nationalist Spain was financially quite independent. Italian military aid, for some time, had been substantial and the conquest of Malaga was carried out largely by Italian troops. But after the defeat of the fascist units at Guadalajara the number of fascist volunteers decreased and they were hardly visible during the spring offensive in 1938. As to mere manpower, the loyalists had the edge over the nationalists all the time and they were well provided with materiel, especially with tanks, by the Russians. The number of volunteers in the international brigades, more genuinely convinced and certainly more fanatical than the Italian fascist units, were considerable. Guesses vary from 40,000 to 60,000. A few volunteers, other than Germans or Italians, also fought on the nationalist side. There were 600 to 700 Irish who withdrew relatively soon because they could not stand the Spanish food. There were some individual Portuguese and French volunteers, active Catholic monarchists. Actually, the only way to join was to enter the Spanish Foreign Legion, and to sign up for five years was a rather unattractive proposition. There was not too much unity among the nationalists, except that they were determined to have Spain's fate settled by Spaniards and that Spanish traditions and a Spanish way of life should be maintained. Unlike the Republicans, they not only wanted bullfights to continue, but they insisted that a man should be able to go to church without being clubbed to death or a woman join a religious order without being undressed publicly, raped, slaughtered, and exhibited on a butcher's hook. Franco, however, had the greatest difficulties in bringing the various supporters of his side under one hat, he forced the Falange, the JONS and the Carlists to join in a common organization, which, by American standards, would be like amalgamating the Birchers with ADA, and this led to many a local explosion. The phalangist leader Hadilla had been three times in Capilla, in chapel prior to execution for insubordination and revolt, 
but he was pardoned again and again. On the Aragon front I met with a Carlist captain who loudly regretted that they fought only communists, socialists, and anarchists, but not the Nazis, and amigos de nuestro Señor Jesús Cristo. Liberal monarchists, Alfonsinos, and many moderate Republicans, Leru, etc., were on Franco's side. The vast majority of moderate Republicans and liberals, who had fled Spain altogether because they opposed both warring sides, either returned during the Civil War, during World War II, or soon thereafter. Naturally, the devout Catholic element had no choice, loyalist Spain persecuted the Church with far greater savagery than even the Russian communists did, so it had to side with Franco. The situation was different only in the Basque provinces. The loyalist or Republican side, without hesitation, could be called red because the communists and, to a lesser extent, the socialists were the only well-coordinated international bodies within Spain. As to worldwide connections, the precision of their ideology, their fanaticism, and energy, the forces of liberal democracy could not compare with the second, socialist, and third international. The communists fully cooperated with the socialists, after all it was the time of the popular front flirtation and Largo Caballero, the socialist leader, was called the Spanish Lenin by Stalin himself, but gunned after the FAI, and then the fourth international, the Trotskyites. Even Freemasonry, officially persecuted in nationalist Spain, was fairly divided because it was, after all, a bourgeois movement, and would have faced an even worse fate in red than in nationalist Spain. There was the example of the USSR, the non-socialist democratic element in red Spain merely served as an alibi, it was powerless. A man such as President Azana probably did not like the murders and the executions, but he did not have the power to stave them off. Over 6,000 priests, friars, and nuns were massacred under his eyes, but what could he have done? He was not master in his own house. And in this connection it is interesting to note that the Communist Party was not at all numerically strong in the last elections, something equally true of the Falange. This fact is usually adduced by naive minds to prove that a communist danger did not exist in Spain, and that the communist plans for a takeover were merely a phantom evoked by the right. Yet a small determined minority can always conquer a disorganized state and a deeply divided society, the Russian Revolution of November 1917 proved it. And the takeover of the Spanish Communist Party in the loyalist section of the country proved it again. The pro-loyalist hysteria, however, existed mainly in Britain and in the United States. It was, for me, an interesting sociological experience to talk to the prisoners from the Abraham Lincoln Brigade in their provisional encampment near Saragossa. As one could expect, a very large segment came from the west coast between San Diego and Vancouver, still, the majority of Americans sympathized with the Republic and merely Catholics had largely another orientation. A small sector of Catholics, however, changed sides under the influence of Jacques Maritain and tried to assume a neutralist position. It is not easy to see how they could do this, knowing all the facts, or most of the facts, but, of course, they could not grasp the happenings as they did not know the Spanish character, and the day-to-day -day reporting did not offer a coherent picture. They were horrified by the excesses of the nationalists in the first weeks and these cannot be denied. They were shocked by the Nazi and fascist aid. Yet if, to quote an example, a man discovers that his country, fighting a war for a just cause, has immoral allies and that his own army has committed atrocities, he certainly has the moral duty to protest loudly against this state of affairs. But should he therefore call it quits and consider himself a neutral, refusing to take sides? There is nothing more dangerous than perfectionism. Inevitably the words of Gonzague de Reynolds come to one's mind, often behind a false moderation quite simply a real cowardice is hiding. American Catholics did not know all the facts, neither did the non-Catholics. In a country as wealthy as the United States there is usually no dearth of information. Information costs money and it can be bought, correct information as well as wrong information. To get all the right information and to reject the false, the deceitful, the fabricated one, a special gift is necessary, the ability to weigh evidence. Living in the United States during World War II, I found it always possible to find the truth and to get excellent information, but I had to go out of my way and I had to read everything with a critical eye. Believe it or not, it could be done, partly because I knew Europe well and had been brought up in Central Europe where the printed word is looked upon with greatest suspicion. Er loop we drugged he lies like print, is a standard phrase. It might legitimately be questioned whether bibliolatry is not a specific gift of the Reformation, especially the editing done by newspapers, slants, distorts, and colors the news. While in Spain I met the correspondent of the New York Times on the nationalist side. He told me grimly that only a small fraction of his reports ever got printed whereas the cables of Mr. Herbert L. Matthews, stationed on the loyalist side, received a far better treatment. 
Finally the New York Times sent one more correspondent to the red side, Mr. Lawrence Fernsworth, featured as a liberal Catholic, a man who later wrote for the pro-communist publication The Protestant. From him we could hear the glad news that religious tolerance was on the increase in Republican Spain, why, only a few days before he had been able to attend Mass in a private home. Neither the Nazis nor the Italians were able to cash in on their investments in Spain. Franco saw Hitler only once and, as an old specialist on criminals from his days in the Tercio, he immediately sized up his partner. There never has been an Axis Madrid Berlin, the Rome Berlin Axis, on the other hand, had been largely the work of Western leftist ineptitude. Fascism and Nazism, as we have pointed out, were never sufficiently close to agree on a common foreign policy. Masters are often furious if their disciples go their own ways or achieve greater fame. The crucial point in Hitler's expansionist plans was Austria, not because it was his, despised, land of birth, but because the geopolitical edifice of Central Europe as constructed by the Paris treaties was such that the elimination of only one brick was enough to bring it down, with the Anschluss perfected, the most important part of Czechoslovakia, Bohemia, Moravia, Silesia, was totally encircled and could be strangled by merely closing the borders. When Czechoslovakia was incorporated into the Reich, Poland was similarly encircled, and so forth. It was in Italy's self-interest to preserve Austria's independence and in a crisis of the summer 1934, after the murder of Dolphus and the pitched battles fought in central and southern Austria between the Heimwehr and the illegal Nazi formations, Mussolini mobilized against Germany. Several divisions stood at the border of the North Tyrol and of Carinthia. The Italian army, for better or for worse, was then the guarantor of Austria's survival. In the eyes of the left, Austria was hardly worth saving because it was a fascist state. It had started as a democratic republic in 1918, but ideological differences tore the country asunder. Already in 1927 a demonstration in Vienna had degenerated into a revolt, the Palace of Justice was burned down by a mixed socialist-communist mob, and there were over a hundred casualties. The non-socialist element started to counter-organize and thus the Heimwehr, the Home Defense League, was born. But the socialists too put up a private army, the Republican Defense League, Republikanischer Schutzbund, and although either formation hardly ever appeared with arms in public, it was obvious that they possessed weapons illegally. The socialist bailiwick, naturally, was the city of Vienna which, for years, had engaged in big housing programs, enormous fortress-like buildings were erected in a belt around Vienna, and created the impression that, in a civil war, the Red City was ready to defend itself against the rest of the country whose predominantly non-socialist convictions were only too well known. In the meantime the Nazi peril arose. The Nazis also organized along military lines, also established paramilitary formations and prepared for the day X. All through 1933 and in early 1934 the Nazis engaged in a terror campaign, similar to that of the Viet Cong. They threw bombs, committed arson, destroyed bridges, etc. The government in the meantime consisted only of members of the Christian Social Party and the Heimwehr. The parliament had ceased to function due to a technicality, i.e., the absolute equality of mandates of government and opposition. The constitution stated that the largest party was to provide the speaker, but since the government had 81 mandates, the opposition 80, socialists, communists, and pro-Nazi pan-Germans, and the speaker was not permitted to participate in the voting, a complete stalemate had ensued. With the aid of a wartime emergency law the cabinet continued to be in power without consulting the parliament. No elections were decreed since a number of Nazis would have been voted into parliament, creating a situation not quite as bad but similar to that of Germany in 1932. There was no possibility for democratic government, and the government, relatively unmolested by the socialists, desperately fought the terroristic Nazis. The situation unexpectedly came to a head when the police received information about a large deposit of arms in Linz, which probably belonged to the Republican Defense League. Policemen who came to search the premises were fired at and then counterattacked. The trade unions replied with a general strike which was tantamount to stabbing the government in the back, a government engaged in a life-and-death struggle with the Nazis. In other words, the trade unions and the socialist, social-democratic, party had virtually become allies of the Nazis. The communal apartment houses in Vienna were now transformed into fortresses and the army, combined with the police and the Heimwehr, attacked this fortified belt successfully. The socialist rebellion also spread to other parts of Austria but was suppressed in a few days. Significantly enough, the railroadmen and the postal employees, knowing more about the outside world and the general state of affairs, refused to sabotage the means of communication. At times the fighting was bitter, many of the Marxist leaders fled to Czechoslovakia, among them Otto Bauer, and some of them transferred to Russia. One local socialist leader, 
Coleman Wallish, and eight more organizers, unfortunately, were executed. Jail sentences were imposed upon others. The moderate socialists had been opposed to the rising against the government, some members of the Christian Social Party were against the quelling of the rebellion and would have preferred negotiations. The result was an increased isolation of the government. Among leftist circles between San Francisco and Moscow the indignation against Austro-fascism and clerico-fascism was boundless. The crackdown on the Social Democrats, often represented as kind Democrats with social leanings, was construed as an action of the Dolphus regime in obedience to Mussolini's orders, which was by no means the case. Mussolini was interested only in having a buffer between Italy and Germany. A right-of-center government suited him well. Yet the fact remained that in this outbreak the socialists had in fact acted as Nazi collaborators, as certain Buddhists in South Vietnam acted in fact as Viet Cong collaborators, and that the Nazis had received orders from Berlin to stay put. The socialists were ideologically nearer to the Nazis than the Heimwehr, the monarchists, the Catholic Church, or all true right-wingers. True, there was an entente between Dolphus and Mussolini, the only effective protector of Austrian independence, but the Nazis loathed Austria's cooperation with the Latin Catholic world. Therefore they planned to murder Dolphus before his forthcoming meeting with Mussolini, which was scheduled for the last days of July 1934. The larger part of the British and American press was anti-Nazi, but also anti-Dolphus. Mr. Stephen Spender wrote his ringing poetry about the Vienna Troubles, and Mr. W. H. Auden, then firmly in the leftist camp, put his pen at the service of the same cause. United Press published the news about 10,000 dead in the streets of Austria's capital, there were less than 300 in Austria all told, more than 100 of them on the government side, and this piece of information came from their correspondent, Mr. Robert Best. His case is psychologically interesting. He hailed from Georgia, had the usual scanty education of American foreign correspondents who start their careers reporting about fires and suicides in love nests, but one nice day are jerked out of their cozy surroundings and land in faraway countries, such as Austria. Usually not familiar with the language spoken there, these, in their majority, political middle-of-the-roaders almost regularly associate with the left. They do not come from radical families but, up to the gills and the myths of their local folklore, they are neither overly friendly toward the Catholic hierarchy, nor toward titled aristocrats, and they lack the proficiency to talk with peasant leaders, nor would they ever really understand their minds. The only ideological language they possibly can understand is that of the Marxist and non-Marxist left which uses the vocabulary of the French Revolution mixed with expressions one remembers from the economics courses in college. Mr. Best, obviously, could not understand the talk about the Reichsid, the Standestat, Organischerstat, Danzet's philosophy, Volksdumswerden, Heimatverbundenheit, or Ordnungsbild concepts that cannot be translated with precision into English. He could understand the socialists, though, so he sided with the international socialists and when they disappeared from the political surface and went underground, he quite naturally transferred his enthusiasm to the national socialists. This transition must have come to him quite easily, racial prejudices, after all, were something he had always been familiar with, as a matter of fact, he had them in himself. So he stayed on even after the Angelus, made no move to quit Vienna after Germany's declaration of war, became a radio speaker for the Nazis, and agitated against his land of birth. Why be surprised? The Nazis were progressive, built superhighways, provided the people with cheap cars and cheap radio sets, and were riding the wave of the future. They were in his mind the fulfillment of the American dream. His kind of evolution was frequent, has numerous analogies, and is perfectly natural. The murder of Dolphus was organized in Germany and Milami Turnick's successor, Kurt von Schuschnigg, could not possibly stave off the final disaster. The amity between Vienna and Rome was heavily mortgaged by the South Tyrol which the fascists brutally tried to Italianize by all conceivable means. Nazi propaganda in Austria, which in sentiment was strongly anti-Italian, portrayed the Austrian government as a handful of traitors because they kept silent about Mussolini's policies in the South Tyrol. Not even the Austrian Nazis could foresee that Hitler in 1939 would agree with Mussolini to resettle the South Tyrolians in Greater Germany, yet Italy remained the only power to protect Austrian independence. This also was fully understood in London and Paris and led to the Stressa Conference which resulted in a London-Paris-Rome axis for the preservation of Austrian freedom. A public declaration of a guarantee by these three powers followed. Schuschnigg himself tried to strengthen anti-Nazism in Austria, and to achieve a greater understanding between the successor states of the old monarchy. He knew that the Standestat, corporate state designed to overcome class antagonisms and party strife, was not enough. Man does not live by bread alone. He therefore wanted to restore the monarchy in Austria in the long run and this idea had many supporters, 
practically all members of the Christian Social Party, of the Heimwehr, and even a few moderate socialists. Only the Nazis, the radical socialists and the communists opposed such a solution with violence and fury. The greatest difficulty, however, was made by Prague and Belgrade. These two governments collaborated closely with Hitler in the Austrian question. Benesch declared in conversations that he would rather see the Nazis in Prague than the Habsburgs in Vienna. Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia were deadly afraid that their countries would melt away the moment the Habsburgs appeared on the horizon. They melted away a few years later, and Benesch, in his exile, acknowledged freely that the countries of Central Europe had not had the opportunity to solidify and to acquire an inner cohesion. In fact, as faithful minions of Hitler, they declared restoration to be a casus belli, which in itself shows the brittleness of the house of cards built by leftist endeavor at the Paris Peace Conference. The hatred of the united left for the Habsburgs lasts to this very day and is typified by the Austrian socialists who in so many ways continue the Nazi traditions, especially in the field of legislation. Ideological reasons in the West, however, were responsible for Mussolini's withdrawal of his support for Austrian independence and with the ensuing inevitable fall of Austria, with the Anschluss, the stage was set for World War II, the Third War of Austrian Succession. And with the outcome of World War II the chance for new, bigger, and more terrible calamities was given. The ideological reasons for this entire development, from 1917 over 1935 and 1938 to our days, are of a distinctly leftist character. At the Stressa conference Mussolini informed Sir Samuel Hoare, the British foreign minister, and Monsieur Laval, that he intended to attack Abyssinia, a country with whom the Italians, as now the Somalis, had border difficulties. He made it clear that he would use the opportunity to take revenge for the defeat of Adoa in 1896 and would conquer all of Abyssinia. In the beginning his declaration made little impression and since he met with no protest he proceeded to prepare this war, no doubt a war of aggression against the spirit and the letter of the League of Nations Charter. To make matters worse, it was Italy who had introduced Abyssinia into the League of Nations, an entry opposed by Britain because Abyssinia was suspected of tolerating slavery and practicing barbaric punishments, mutilations, etc. With the build-up of Mussolini's overseas forces British public opinion became increasingly restive and leftist circles, which also had a hold on a certain sector of the Conservative Party, demanded that Britain adhere strictly to the League of Nations Charter and that military economic sanctions should be imposed on Italy for breaking the rules. Of the great powers only the Soviet Union, Germany, the United States, and Japan did not belong to the League. From a higher moral point of view the situation was singularly complex. There can be no doubt about Italy's infringing upon the stipulations of the Charter. It was also certain that Italy could and would introduce a more civilized, a more humane life in a colonized Abyssinia and that from the point of view of the common good of the Abyssinians, Italy's rule would have been preferable to that of the local autocracy. People with such diverging political views as Mr. Evelyn Waugh and Herbert L. Matthews have been with the Italian army in this struggle and have seen the Italian administration afterwards. They both, for rather different and yet so similar reasons, favor the Italian side. There was, moreover, the case of the tribes and nationalities subjected by the real Abyssinians, the Amharas, after their victory in 1896. The arms they collected from the defeated Italians enabled them to subject vast tracts of land, especially to the east, southeast, and south of the provinces of Amhara, Tigra, and Shoa, i.e., the regions inhabited by the Dankalais, Galas, and Somalis. Conquered by the Italians, they were merely to pass from one alien rule to another, and probably from a harsher to a more lenient one. British public opinion was worked up to a high degree while Sir Samuel Hoare and Pierre Laval racked their brains about what to do in order to save the stress of front, Austria, to let the League of Nations keep its face, and to reach a compromise preserving order in Europe. The war had already started, Italian troops advanced in the north, when Hoare and Laval secretly drew up their famous plan to avert the worst. The idea was that the harassed Abyssinians cede their conquests to Italy which thus would have obtained a direct connection between Eritrea and Somalia, the Italian colonial empire in Africa would have been consolidated in this way. Mussolini showed himself not too difficult but the Hoare-Laval plan was actually torpedoed by the indiscretion of two leftist journalists and, above all, by the well-organized peace ballot. Who does not want peace? Due to this wave of moral indignation Britain adopted a rigid policy in the best tradition of League of Nations orthodoxy and Sir Samuel Hoare was made to resign, to be replaced by Mr. Anthony Eden, until then minister without portfolio for League of Nations affairs. The sanctions were ineffective, Soviet oil reached Italy, and Abyssinia was defeated in 1936. Haile Selassie, the hapless emperor, took up residence in London, 
but the Committee for the Defense of Abyssinian Democracy refused to terminate its propaganda actions. Whether Abyssinia was then or is now, or even has the capacity to be, a democracy is quite another question. The tragic results of the sanctions soon made themselves felt. The Nazis in Austria greeted each other with a knowing smile saying Heile Selassie. Instead of Heil Hitler. They knew that the West's stand in the Abyssinian case was the beginning of the end of Austria's independence. And so it was. England could not possibly assume moral leadership in a general action to prevent Italy from acquiring colonies, being the arch-colonialist herself she could not really turn to Italy saying, colonial conquests were possible until 1919, but now that we have the League, now that we all believe in peace, democracy, equality, progress, universal brotherhood and other niceties, you have to stay where you are. In Italian, and not only in fascist, eyes England behaved like a millionaire organizing other rich men to prevent a shiftless proletarian from becoming a skilled worker. Of course, Italy would not have greatly benefited from Abyssinia, but that's not the point. Colonies meant prestige, and only in exceptional cases eventual riches. Mr. Anthony Eaton, today the Earl of Avon, thus is the creator of the Axis. He embodied the policy that drove Italy into the arms of Germany. Mussolini, being not a gentleman but a common man personally hurt by all and any criticism, burst into obscene rantings against England. American public opinion under leftist leadership sided with Britain and the League. Germany, however, derived a great profit, material and political, from this development. Isolated Italy was her prey. Without effective Italian protection Austria's enslavement was only a question of time. Britain had lost all interest in Austria, and no longer Hitler but Mussolini now appeared to be the main villain to British public opinion. It can be said without danger of refutation that London wanted to avert Hitler from the West and therefore gave him practically a free hand in the East. In 1940 the advancing Germans found in La Charité a deposit of documents from the Quai d'Orsay among them a note of Lord Halifax to the French Foreign Office exhorting the latter not to make the slightest gesture which Kurt von Schuschnigg, the Austrian Chancellor, might interpret as an encouragement to resistance. An enormous amount of ink has been spilled about Schuschnigg's tactics and his missed opportunities, but the fact remains that as soon as Italy was Germany's partner, not even the greatest political genius could have saved Austria. It had been written off by the West, by the pro-Nazis as well as by the anti-Nazis, even if for very different reasons. And, indeed, not too much could be expected from the resistance of the Austrian people because it had lost the center around which its loyalty could rally, the Habsburgs. Besides, the Austrians in their majority felt German though not necessarily Nazi. As a matter of fact, a great deal of Austrian resistance against the Anschluss had the character of the struggle between the other Germany, Christian Germany, and Brown Greater Prussia. It is too easily, and often too conveniently, forgotten that the first Austrian constitution, promulgated under social democratic leadership in 1918, declared Deutsch Österreich, German Austria, to be part of the Reich. The driving motor against the Anschluss were the monarchists and after the calamity happened, they really got it in the neck. This went so far that the members of the Austrian nobility, being a race of traitors against Germandom, were forbidden by Hitler to use their titles. Americans and Britishers knew very little about these subtleties of a tragic struggle. Only in Jewish circles in the English-speaking world could a greater restlessness be observed. Ambassador Dyakov, who spoke to the American Secretary of State Cordell Hull on March 12, 1938, the day after the Anschluss, informed the Reich's foreign office that Mr. Hull had no words of disapproval of Austria's annexation and even two days later he was still courteous. Only Mr. Sumner Wells seemed bitter, knowing Mr. Hull's mental horizon one can hardly be surprised. The disturbing lack of quality in the foreign service under the Roosevelt administration made the American government as uninformed as the American public was through leftist reporters and news commentators. The American ambassador in Germany prior to the Anschluss was Professor William E. Dodd whose diary was published by his son William E., Jr. and his daughter Martha. According to an unconfirmed rumor President Roosevelt wanted to appoint another Professor Dodd to head the American embassy in Berlin, probably Walter F. Dodd, but thanks to a clerical error, or to some leftist intrigue. It was the Chicago history professor who got the plum. The reading of Ambassador Dodd's diary is almost as rewarding as the study of the far more voluminous Heron papers, because in sheer backwood, parochial leftism these two men vied with each other. There are, of course, passages of historical value such as Dyakov's admission that he would have liked to see Hitler overthrown, or the Polish ambassador's belief, as early as 1934, that Hitler was secretly negotiating with Russia. 
Bullets avowal that Lord Lothian and Lloyd George wanted to give a free hand to the Germans is as interesting as the Czech ministers claim that neither Czechoslovakia nor Yugoslavia would permit a return of the Habsburgs to Vienna the old collaboration of Benesch and Belgrade with the Nazis. The funnier part of this diary concerns Ambassador Dodd's aristophobia and democratism. He is scandalized that his German butler packs his suitcase, is shocked by Summer Wells who has 15 servants, is critical of American diplomats with a Harvard accent, and his description of a requiem for Pilsudski, which poor Dodd had to attend, is priceless. Candles were burning and priests were chanting in Latin which no one understood, and occasionally falling upon their knees and scattering incense, which I think Jesus never used. It was the medieval ceremony from the beginning to end. To me it was all half absurd, a hillbilly from the Shenandoah Valley lost in the neon jungle of Broadway could not have felt more bewildered. However, the most terrifying aspect of his diary was Dodd's total ignorance of history, a proof of the tragic specialization to which learning in America so frequently is subjected. He had published, in German, books on Thomas Jefferson and Woodrow Wilson, but the not inconsiderable rest of history remained to him a book with seven seals. We want to present our readers with only a few specimens of the ambassador's reactions to impressions and events. It is interesting to note that everything he thought odd or obsolete was immediately styled medieval, a habit he shared with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It also was perhaps a hangover from reading Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee at King Arthur's Court. Goring, naturally, had a medieval hunter's uniform. Savagery and barbarism, Dodd thought, were a curious quality of the Nazi mass mind which passed away in England with the Stuart Kings in 1688. Himmler, in Professor Dodd's eyes, was probably another James II. University professors who confessed to him their despair drew the following comment, they do not know the real cause of Germany's reign of terror, the failure of the 1848 movement to resolve itself into a democratic parliamentary system. As if a democratic parliamentary system had not been installed by the victorious allies in 1918, but with what results? The following reflection, jotted down on March 11, 1935, is delightful, the Pope is in a tight place. He must help Lutherans and Lutheran universities to save Catholicism in Germany. At the same time he must support Nazi philosophy in the hope of defeating communism in Russia and checking the advance of socialism in France and Spain. One wonders where these Lutheran universities are and what effect Nazi philosophy might have had on the Front Populaire in France or on the CGT in Spain. Professor Dodd informed Franz von Papen that Father Colin is always breaking loose and then found out to his surprise that von Papen is a Catholic, but he showed no sympathy with Colin. Should every Catholic be enchanted by every priest? One is totally perplexed by sentences like these, it is an unprecedented move to abolish such historic states as Bavaria or Saxony dating back to the time of the Caesars. Hitler, as much as he hates France, is imitating Napoleon I who abolished all French states. Was Dodd raving mad? And such a man not only represented the United States in the worst trouble spot of the world, but taught history, history. At the University of Chicago. After such pronouncements one should not be surprised to hear that it was Germany's thousand-year aim to annex or at least subordinate all the Balkan countries. Of course it is difficult to know whether such ignorance is of a historic or rather geographic nature. Sir Robert Van Sittert, GCB, GCMG, MVO, Chief Diplomatic Advisor of the Foreign Office, published a book in 1940 replete with such historic nonsense that he would have flunked out of every secondary school on the continent, but he played a significant role before and during World War II. The New York Times, priding itself on its high standards, not only put Hungary on the Balkan Peninsula, but even Czechoslovakia. Mr. Raymond Moley, another professor and former brain truster to President Roosevelt, wrote in his column in Newsweek in 1943 a piece of pro-Soviet propaganda about the Baltic states which contained a record number of historic, geographic, and political errors. Facts are sacred? After a storm of protest had broken loose, Dr. Moley sent a stenciled reply to my critics which ended in the sentence, my critics are entitled to their opinions and I to mine. If there are no absolutes, there are no facts, there are only opinions. All this is partly the psychological practical result of our age which demands that everybody should have an opinion on almost anything and that everybody should be able to think on his feet. But it can't be done. The end of Austria created very little commotion in the West. Kurt von Schuschnigg was the only head of government who did not flee abroad but stayed on and faced the music, making the rounds of jails and concentration camps. This did not much impress the American left, because he was a fascist and when he came to the United States in 1947 demonstrations were organized against him by native leftists and by what the French called La Resistance de la Sanquième Avenue. But now that Austria had been crushed, Hitler turned against his willing collaborators, the men and the governments that had been kept by the French, 
had taken their money but, as Jacques Bainville had clearly foreseen, failed their employer. Paris now started to see the light, recognize the folly of having destroyed Austria-Hungary, as they had seen in the 18th century the folly of having built up Prussia, but now it is too late. Benesch, to prevent a restoration of the Habsburgs in Vienna, had secretly negotiated with the Nazis and had encouraged Mussolini in his anti-Habsburg stand. He had even been opposed to any type, any kind of Danubian federation to stem the Nazi tide, though he openly admitted that his antagonism rested on sentimental and psychological, rather than on political or economic reasons. He intimated that the little Entente would always be opposed with intransigence and under all circumstances even to a union between Austria and Hungary, after all, two sovereign states. He also served notice on France that all these or similar solutions of the Central European problem were unacceptable to Paris because, above all, they were condemned by the Little Entente. Naturally, it was difficult for this little man with the narrowest of political horizons to forget the ideological stand of his party, the National Socialist Party, or his wartime activities, his ceaseless endeavors to prevent an early peace that would have ended the senseless slaughter. Any compromise with Vienna in the summer of 1917 would have been unmitigated disaster for us, he shamelessly confessed later on. Why did this spiteful, drab, and puritanical man, who had helped to build an impossibly synthetic country and had waged such a suicidal policy based on resentment that led to Sovietization of Czechoslovakia, gain such prestige in certain Western circles? For this there are a variety of reasons, one was his anti-Catholic attitude, and anti-Catholicism, as Peter Vierick has pointed out, is the anti-Semitism of the moderate left. Another reason for his posing as liberator of Czechoslovakia from the yoke of the Habsburgs, the Viennese bureaucracy, an alien aristocracy, big landowners, and pan-Germanism, all arguments one can beautifully present to those prejudiced in ignorance. Sometimes one wonders to what extent he was ready to modify them. Discussing the possibility that the Western Allies might not energetically support Czechoslovakia against German pressure, he told Count Sforza, if we should remain without support against the German menace, we will surprise the world with a limitless subservience to Berlin. At the bottom of his heart this man always despised the West and longed for Russian cooperation. His contempt was greater for Britain than for France. In England he saw a future colony of the United States and there is no greater impertinence than the American one. A perusal of the articles he wrote for the anti-religious periodical Volna Mislenka, Free Thought, and Beseda before World War I is most revealing in this respect. The most fatal aspect of his role, however, lay in his absolute determination to prevent a Habsburg restoration even if the alternative was the Anschluss and with the Anschluss the encirclement and the end of Czechoslovakia. Better the Nazi flag over the Radkany in Prague than Otto in Vienna's Hofburg. Yet is it conceivable that the man was so stupid that he thought Hitler might reward him for his anti-Habsburg stand? An American journalist of renown who saw Benesch immediately after the Anschluss found that he poo-poos the idea that Hitler might succeed in any way in interfering with the affairs of the Czechoslovakian Republic. It is obvious, on the other hand, that Benesch never regretted the course he took except perhaps in 1948 when it was too late. He always had a sneaking and at times a very open admiration not only for perennial Russia, but also for the Soviet Union. In 1938 he must have expected aid from Moscow, and this all the more so as the 3rd Soviet Army Air Corps was unofficially stationed in Czechoslovakia. He was sure that communism in its philosophy and morality has certain similarities with democracy. It is also humanitarian, universalist, intellectualist, and rationalist. It is also pacifist, internationalist, and for the League of Nations policy. This, after all, was typical for the way moderate leftists in the United States like to look at communism. Benesch was dead certain that the Soviet Union would evolve to a freer form, but, as soon as he returned to Czechoslovakia under Russian auspices, this leader of the Czech National Socialist Party proved to be one of the most docile pupils Hitler and Stalin ever had. Personal freedom no longer seemed to interest him. True, while still in exile he had claimed that Hitler should serve as an example in many ways. In January 1942 Foreign Affairs, New York, published an article by Benesch in which he said openly that Hitler was to be imitated as a forerunner of minority settlements. He repeated this thesis again in March 1944 when he spoke about the grim necessity of the transfer of populations, which meant in practical terms the total expropriation and deportation of fully one-third of the population of the historic countries belonging to the crown of St. Wenceslas, Bohemia, Moravia, Silesia. Dr. Benesch, being a good Democrat, believed in majority rule. But since all the German inhabitants of this area would vote, he could hardly expect a solid majority for radically leftist experiments. The logical conclusion was quite simple, the German-speaking population had to be expelled. 
the Soviets agreed with him because they knew that in the old elections the Zudaten Germans produced only a tiny communist vote. Benesch might have argued that these German-speaking Bohemians and Moravians would not only vote the wrong ticket but also had been disloyal. Yet since Mr. Wilson, Mr. Lloyd George, and M. Clemenceau had handed over these areas inhabited by a people of German extraction against their wishes to the artificial state of Czechoslovakia, why should they have been loyal to the nationalist government of the Czechs? The Slovaks, the Hungarians, the Poles, the Ruthenians who had to join this curious state without being asked, had not been loyal either. In 1918-1919 the Zudaten Germans proclaimed their loyalty to Austria, but a self-determination was denied to them by the great Western democracies. Their efforts to unite with Austria were put down by force of arms. By the fall of 1938 Austria no longer existed and the Germans of the Third Reich figured as the only conationals of the Zudaten Germans. Now, if these Germans of Bohemia Moravia, appealing to the principle of determination to deny them the fulfillment of this then it was highly undemocratic to deny them the fulfillment of this wish. Or, if after 1945 they wanted to remain under the rule of Prague, then why deport them? Of course, Dr. Edvard Benesch was a Democrat and not a liberal. This comes out clearly in his tirade against the freedom of the press in July 1945. Unbridled freedom to publish newspapers must not be re-established, he declared. We all say that liberalism has been discarded. This is a fact, and we must realize that one of the factors in public life that is, above all, subject to today's socializing trends, is journalism. How to harmonize this fact with freedom of speech is another matter. But here, too, the principle that the freedom of the individual has to be subordinated to the freedom of the whole, holds good. Liberalism goes out, socialism comes in. Why not? Dr. Benesch headed a national socialist, not a national liberal party. And when Jan Masaryk was thrown out of the window this was probably one of the finest acts of subordination of the individual to the whole, i.e., the interests of the Czech Communist Party. So much about Dr. Benesch, one of the gravediggers of Europe, a man so highly esteemed by the leftist press, a man who was destined to die in ignominy, isolation, and despair. When Hitler shrewdly whipped up the passions of the Zudaten Germans, who had very genuine grievances against the Czechs and asked more energetically than ever for self-determination, the Western powers were put into a far more awkward position than the average leftist journalist surmised. Could Great Britain just to quote one instance, fight in good conscience against the realization of the principle of self-determination? Czechoslovakia had not only the three and a half million Zudaten Germans, as many people as there were Americans in 1776, but also a million Hungarians and Poles who wanted to break away, not to mention the Slovaks who, at the very least, demanded autonomy. The whole edifice of contradictions, built in 1918 to 1919, was coming down with a crash. And what should a Democrat say if people, invoking the democratic principle, demanded for themselves an undemocratic order? As a matter of fact, Hitler, without even threatening invasion and war, could have coldly strangled Czechoslovakia. Even without treason or terror, simply by being compelled to arm excessively, the Czech Republic, already suffering badly from a grave economic crisis, could have been driven into total bankruptcy. Actually, the foolish experiment of the Treaty of St. Germain and Ley was drawing to a close. And when Czechoslovakia rose again in 1945, it had changed from a German protectorate to a Soviet satellite. This to all practical purposes entailed one not inconsiderable difference, the Czechs had never been forced to accept the Nazi philosophy or to deny their religion. Now they were required to embrace Marxist-Leninism, i.e., the ideology of a Prussian Jew and of a half-German Kalmyk. The abuse heaped upon the head of Mr. Neville Chamberlain for his surrender in Munich was almost entirely unjustified. First of all it must be realized that Mr. Chamberlain inherited a totally unarmed country from his predecessor, Mr. Stanley Baldwin, one of the most insular political leaders England ever produced. Baldwin not only knew little about the outside world, he actually hated it. The pacifist Labour government preceding Mr. Baldwin's premiership had been working very hard to disarm Britain, and when the Nazi danger loomed around the corner, the Labourites engaged in the highly amusing pastime of calling for disarmament while insulting the Tories for not standing up to the Nazi menace. The Liberals did even worse, Lloyd George admired Hitler and declared after his visit to the Obersalzberg, I have never seen a happier people than the Germans. Hitler is one of the greatest of the many great men I have ever met. Democracy means rule by public opinion numerically arrived at. British public opinion was as little prepared to fight over Czechoslovakia as over Austria, and though certain leftist circles were highly enthusiastic about Czechoslovakia, they were not sufficiently organized to sway the masses. Czechoslovakia was indeed a country about which the British, in the words of Mr. Neville Chamberlain, 
knew so little, and whoever wanted to look it up in the 1911 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica could not find it, nor its people. To declare war against Germany in September 1938 would have been a suicidal gesture for Britain. Even if it is untrue that there were less than a dozen modern anti-aircraft guns in Britain at that time, the armament was exceedingly poor and there was no conscription. The French left was torn between pacifism and interventionism. The Soviet Union had a military pact with Czechoslovakia dating back to 1935, but no common border. The argument that a war at that moment would have given the edge to the Allies is so silly that it hardly needs refutation. The army of Czechoslovakia would not have resisted for 48 hours. The Czech officers would have been killed by their own soldiers and the Czech population after defeat would have been treated like the Poles. As it happened, the Czechs were not called to military service, there was full employment all through the war, the people received the same rations as the Germans, the birth rate rose, and in spite of isolated cases of atrocities, Ladites, civil casualties were very small, the losses through aerial warfare almost zero. In other words, Chamberlain, abused and ridiculed as the umbrella man, which Englishman does not sport an umbrella? Had almost no choice, in fact, none at all, unless he accepted the word of the conspirators and the German general staff. The conspirators of the Heiderbeck combine were powerless against Hitler who was well supported by the masses. There, after all, was the man who had licked unemployment, the man who had wiped out peacefully the results of a truly iniquitous treaty, the man who showed himself able to enlarge the Reich without firing a single shot. Intellectual liberty was down to almost nothing, but the masses have few ideas they want to express, bread and games are more important to them than the freedom of the press or academic freedom. The generals, however, not only despised Hitler as an upstart, Hindenburg called him the Bohemian private first class, they fully understood the lowness of his character which had become evident in the Fritsch case and, above all, they were afraid that he might bring about the ruin of Germany in a fatal two-front war. Generals, on the average, are far less bellicose than journalists or patriotic housewives, they know the horrors of a war and they dislike any break in the routine. The conspirators were determined to arrest Hitler in case a war broke out. Only then a very large sector of all males would be mobilized and under military orders, thus no longer able to follow party directives. The masses would also be impressed by the fact that Hitler, who promised their country territorial aggrandizement without spilling a drop of blood, had brought them the agonies of a war after all, in other words, that he had broken his pact with the German nation. The conspirators even stationed a division in Thuringia between Munich and Berlin in order to paralyze Nazi party formations in case of an emergency, especially Hitler's bodyguard, Leifstandarte, stationed in Munich. Hitler's arrest was planned to take place in Berlin. Theodor Kort, a German diplomat in London and brother of one of the conspirators, went to 10 Downing Street where he informed the foreign minister, Lord Halifax on the evening of September 5, 1938, about the conspiracy, insisting that Britain should not deal with Hitler, that the Prime Minister should not negotiate with him but should allow war to break out, the conspirators' only chance to strike against the idol of the common man. By that time, however, Chamberlain had already consented to meet Hitler, but the conspirators were not told this. The German officers risked their lives, but they were not considered worthy of confidence. The beck Heider group was desperate when Chamberlain went to Gothenburg, though they became more hopeful when the crisis approached a new climax. The date for Hitler's arrest was set for September 29, but then, prompted by Chamberlain, Mussolini intervened and the conspirators gave up. Hitler had gained another moral victory. Why did Neville Chamberlain not collaborate with the conspirators? No ideological reasons were involved, only the curious inability of the Britishers and Americans to project themselves into the minds and temperaments of other nations. I can almost visualize the faces of the men in Downing Street after Theodore Court's departure. They must have looked at each other with a mixture of embarrassment, suspicion, surprise, disdain, uneasiness, and discomfort, until one of them exclaimed, Damn it, this is a preposterous E. Phillips Oppenheim story. Can any one of you chaps imagine a bloody general arresting His Majesty's Prime Minister? Indeed, no one could visualize a British general handcuffing Mr. Churchill or Mr. Attlee. Here, however, we are up against an old Anglo-Saxon limitation and an insoluble dilemma. The dilemma arises in the minds of the British or the Americans when their belief in radical human differences, if not in racial superiority, suddenly and mysteriously collapses giving way to the very opposite conviction, i.e., that human beings everywhere are basically the same, that they are more alike than unlike. Here is a source of endless miscalculations, misinterpretations, and catastrophic errors. Thus only God knows whether one can make Mr. Chamberlain's Englishness a major point of accusation. This limitation certainly is not of a moral but only of a psychological order. 
No doubt the man was an English gentleman in the best sense of the word, honorable, without guile, perhaps somewhat simple-minded, but future historians will surely judge him with infinitely greater fairness than the hysterical newspapers of his days. Was the United States perhaps ready to fight for Czechoslovakia or merely egging on England to go out on a limb? True, the United States had no military alliance with that brand new country, but it was its brainchild, the joint creation of Woodrow Wilson, Thomas Masaryk, and American citizens of Czech and in some cases of Slovak origin. Still, President Roosevelt himself admitted that he was not a bit upset about the results of the Munich Agreement. The vilification of Neville Chamberlain is usually accompanied by the statement that Winston Churchill always had seen the light, that he had always known exactly what a scoundrel Hitler really was and that Chamberlain's naive exclamation upon his arrival from Munich about peace in our time would never have been made by the old bulldog. Certain conservatives would fully subscribe to this myth, firmly believing that Churchill, a typical conservative of the old school is, in this respect at least, beyond reproach. Churchill, however, never was a genuine conservative, but rather an old-fashioned 18th-century liberal and deist. His father, Lord Randolph Churchill, belonged to the leftmost wing of the Tories and, after a short flirtation with the Conservative Party, young Winston became an ardent British liberal of the leftish, of the Lloyd George dispensation. He was considered a radical, supported Lloyd George after the war when the Welsh politician disliked the strong stand Churchill adopted towards Bolshevism. Lloyd George's pro-Russian and anti-Polish attitude was partly due to his loathing for Poles, which Churchill inherited partly to his desire not to lose the indirect support of the trade unions who wanted to cripple Poland's resistance in her life and death struggle against the Red Army. After the break with Lloyd George Mr. Churchill worked his way back into the Conservative Party where the old diehards, who always valued character more than brains, never quite forgave him his switches. But when, upon his return from Yalta, he told the House of Commons, February 27, 1945, that he did not know any government that kept its obligations, even to its disadvantage, as faithfully as the Soviets did and that he was thoroughly opposed to debating Russia's loyalty to Pax and treaties, what did he really think? If he believed his own words he was a great deal more naive than Chamberlain with his peace in our time. And his famous perspicacity about Hitler? In November 1935, well over a year after the June 1934 massacre Churchill called the Fuhrer a highly competent, cool, well-informed functionary with an agreeable manner and added that the world lives on hopes that the worst is over and that we may yet live to see Hitler a gentler figure in a happier age. As late as 1937 our great Epimetheus wrote about Hitler, if our country were defeated I hope we should find a champion as indomitable to restore our courage and lead us back to our place among the nations. Churchill's conversion did not take place until sometime in 1938. Chapter 17 Another Leftist War Whereas the fall of Czechoslovakia, consummated in March 1939, was a bitter blow to the left the developments later in 1939, disturbing to all people of goodwill, did not bother them too much. Mr. Churchill, always uninformed about the geography and history of countries away from seashores, berated in his memoirs Hungary and Poland as beasts of prey devouring parts of prostrate Czechoslovakia. The leftist press viewed Poland with even greater hostility, to them it was a country of fascist aristocratic landowners inhabited by miserable serfs, a country where Jews had to live in ghettos and heel clicking army officers administrated the country together with fat Roman Catholic bishops. Polish realities, however, were almost as complex as those of Imperial Russia, and at the outbreak of World War II this was especially true of the social conditions and structures. British enthusiasm for Poland was never excessive, but Mr. Chamberlain was certain that another of Hitler's peaceful grabs could not be permitted. In France pacifist feelings were strong, nu ni vulans pa morir por Danzisch, but British public opinion was outraged by Hitler's march on Prague and regarded this, quite rightly, as a breach of promise. Negotiations were started between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union to build up a solid front against Hitler. There is very little doubt that peace would have been preserved if Germany had been faced by the specter of a two-front war. The German-Russian military pact, concluded between Ribbentrop and Molotov, gave to Hitler the necessary guarantee for a free hand in the West. Even after the joint Nazi-Communist conquest of Poland-Soviet economic aid to Nazi Germany was increasing, in the fall of 1940 Nazi planes engaged in the Battle of Britain were using Soviet gasoline. The prospect of a two-front war, on the other hand, would have resulted in a reorganization of the conspiratorial forces within the German army. Surprised by the political developments and the successful negotiations in Moscow, the German generals started only in November 1939 to close their ranks again. In September 1939 there were no valid reasons or excuses whatsoever for Hitler's attack against Poland. Contrary to a certain German propaganda, the eastern boundary of Germany, 
as set down in the Versailles Treaty, was not particularly unjust. As a matter of fact, certain areas which Prussia acquired in the first and second partitions of Poland had not been returned to Poland. The so-called Polish corridor was not an iniquity, these districts were ancient Polish lands mainly inhabited by Poles. The separation of East Prussia from the rest of Germany involved a few minor hardships, but anybody traveling from the continental United States to Alaska on the Alcan Highway also has to cross Canada. Hitler, however, had his eyes set on another triumph, another bloodless conquest, and there is good reason to believe that he did not expect Britain to live up to her new treaty with Poland. This speculation was unfortunately not baseless, there had been much vituperation of Poland by a considerable part of the English and the French press, and a British radio commentator, Commander Stephen King Hall, had announced that he would shout Sieg Heil. If Hitler were to invade Poland. Hitler told Chano that he was convinced that Britain and France would never start a general conflagration by supporting Poland. Thus the surprise among the Nazi leadership when Britain's declaration of war came on September 3 was almost boundless. Hitler suffered from the typical continental Anglomania and not even Britain's entry into the war cured him from his complex which resulted in his passivity at the time of the evacuation at Dunkirk. Ribbentrop too, was dead certain that Britain would not move. All this came as a terrible surprise to the American left, the most naive people under God's son. Only on August 23, one week before the outbreak of the war, the Committee on Cultural Freedom under the signature of a huge crowd of leading intellectuals had published a full-page advertisement in America's most important papers. Signatories were among others J. Allen, Henry Pratt Fairchild, Waldo Frank, Leo Huberman, George Kaufman, Paul de Cruyff, Max Lerner, Clifford Odets, Frederick L. Schumann, George Seldes, James Thurber, Richard Wright, Bashiel Hammett, Vincent Sheehan, Maxwell Stewart. Here are a few excerpts. The fascists. Are intent on destroying such unity, i.e., of all progressive forces, at all costs. Realizing that here in America they cannot get far with a definitely pro-fascist appeal, they strive to pervert American anti-fascist sentiment to their own ends. They have encouraged the fantastic falsehood that the USSR and the totalitarian states are basically alike. The Soviet Union considers political dictatorship a transitional form and has shown a steadily expanding democracy in every sphere. Its epoch-making new constitution guarantees Soviet citizens universal suffrage, civil liberties, the right to employment, to leisure, to free medical care, to material security and sickness and in old age, to equality of the sexes in all fields of activity and to equality of all races and nationalities. Convinced evolutionists should remember that these brilliant facts, figures, and forecasts were stated nearly one-third of a century ago and had ample time to become reality. World War II started with an unparalleled depression and despair among all peoples involved. Germany and Austria were countries in tears, the spontaneous demonstrations of 1914 were not repeated. Far from being terminated, the resistance of many German generals and rightist leaders was to increase as time went on until it reached its culmination in July 1944. Nor is it true that they turned against Hitler only when his star was sinking. A perusal of the diaries of Ulrich von Hassel shows the despair created by the successive victories in the earlier period of the war. Indeed rare is the country whose leading men are driven to think, to pray, and to act for the defeat of their fatherland. Do Germans merely love to obey orders blindly, unconditionally, and loyally? But where else could one find the chief and not just a treacherous employee of the counterintelligence, a magnificent man such as Admiral Canaris, working full blast for the downfall of the Third Reich? There were men galore in Germany eager to put an end to their country's criminal leadership and the self-destruction of Europe, but they had to fight alone and to go down in this fight because the combined, well-scheming forces of the left wanted it just that way, and the feeble and confused forces of the right among the Allies were not prepared to make a stand. At first the Stalin-Hitler Pact, which made the war possible, and the subsequent outbreak of the fighting stunned the leftist camp all over the world. The leftists, needless to say, forgot that the Nazis were arch-leftists and that the alliance with the Soviet Union, concluded to destroy Poland, was by no means an act of political perversion. Hitler had always preferred communism to the free way of life and Goebbels, especially as a younger man, had a genuine admiration for a socialist Russia, the natural ally of Germany. Though used to acting like sheep, many leftists in the Western world discovered that they were still human beings, others stuck blindly to their red loyalties and found that the Nazis weren't so bad after all. Needless to say, the brown press in Germany had made a complete volt face and all anti-communist propaganda ceased overnight. Ribbentrop shocked not only Chano but also certain old Nazis when he recounted how happy he had felt in Moscow among Stalin's buddies, men with strong faces. In the Soviet Union the papers had to feature the German war news before the Allied. 
Soviet economy worked full blast for Nazi Germany and after the annihilation of Poland Mr. Vyacheslav Molotov declared grandiloquently, one blow from Germany, one from the Soviet Union, and this ugly duckling of the Versailles Treaty was no more. He then accused the ruling classes of Britain and France of diverting attention from their colonial problems, adding that there was absolutely no justification for a war of this kind. One may accept or reject the ideology of Hitlerism as well as any other, that is a matter of political views. But everybody would understand that an ideology cannot be eliminated by war. It is therefore not only senseless but criminal to wage such a war for the destruction of Hitlerism camouflaged as a fight for democracy. The Soviet Union, having just gobbled up eastern Poland and occupied strategic places in the three Baltic republics, all with Nazi connivance, was suspected of having further designs on the latter. Mr. Molotov indignantly declared, We stand for a scrupulous and punctilious observance of pacts on a basis of complete reciprocity and we declare that all nonsense about Sovietizing the Baltic countries is only to the interest of our common enemies and of all anti-Soviet provocateurs. Not much later the Soviet Union, without Nazi protest, attacked Finland and decent people all over the world were outraged. Of course the mere existence of Finland only 16 miles from Leningrad was in itself an anti-Soviet provocation. Though Leningraders could not possibly visit the seaside resorts between Terijoki and Viapuri, Vyberg, the news had leaked through to the Soviet Union's second largest city that in Finland, a country which apart from timber had hardly any natural resources, living standards were infinitely higher than in the workers' paradise. Thus the borders had to be pushed back to where they had been temporarily in the 18th century which also had the effect that the USSR, as once Imperial Russia, could launch a swift attack on the heart of Finland at any time. The Finnish Communist Party, percentage-wise one of the largest in Europe, was expected to rise, but nothing of the sort happened, and the Finnish People's Democratic Republic under Otto Kusinen, established in Terijoki soon after the first attack, remained without visible support. Clearly the Finnish communists wanted to have their own brand of communism and no defections occurred. After the surrender of Western Karelia in 1940 only one family remained in that area. The leftist forces in the West slowly recovered from the blow. The switch in the German-Soviet alignment happened just as described by Orwell in his novel 1984 where in the permanent world war the change of alliances occurs during a public demonstration, the orator is given a slip of paper informing him of the startling fact and he quickly revises his message. Of course weasel words had to be used by the left, the Nazis were somehow lost from sight, the fact that Germans stranded in America now regained their Vaterland via Vladivostok was overlooked. Only a few days before the announcement of the Nazi-Soviet pact a flaming manifesto of protest against the very insinuation that such a thing were possible, signed by the whole shining phalanx of the leftist American intelligentsia appeared as a full-page advertisement in leading newspapers. Now the left quickly concentrated on the forces of reaction at home and denounced those who wanted to wage a capitalist war for bigger and better profits. Nazism? A bugbear. The American Youth Congress, as we mentioned above, hooted at President Roosevelt when he mentioned Valiant Finland. In England People's Congresses sprung up overnight, drew up resolutions, demanded reforms and peace, and protested against armaments. The communists in the United States were entirely on the side of isolationism, so were, naturally, the members of the German-American Bund. And Georgi Dimitrov could write in 1940, the brave fight of American communists against the United States being drawn into the war finds an ever-increasing sympathy among the labor unions and even from the ranks of the AFL run by reactionaries. A song was composed and distributed, the Yanks are not coming. Yet they were coming after all to repeat the old tragic performance, to win a war and to lose a peace. I do not share the frequently found opinion that a full Nazi victory in World War II would have been preferable to the present state of affairs. A victory of the German armies would have enhanced Hitler's prestige to a point where any revolt by the army would have become unthinkable, and no other revolt there was possible. A revolt of officers, moreover, is feasible only if the soldiers obey their orders, even if they are most unusual. With a progressive defecation of Hitler in the eyes of the success-centered common man this would no longer have been the case. The rank and file of the soldiers would not have followed their officers in a rebellion against the Fuhrer and Supreme War Lord. With Britain on her knees and the Russian war materials under the control of Berlin, the Nazis would have become well-nigh invincible. Naturally our argument falls flat with the completion of the A-bomb in August 1945. But would it have existed without America's entry into the war? The German scientists certainly had boycotted its manufacture in the Third Reich. And, we will admit, in the long run, it would have been most difficult to dominate the old world with the help of a racist ideology. This particular weakness of Nazism made itself felt even during the war. Still, 
whereas we can insist that America's entry in 1917 was a truly fateful decision which paved the way to World War II, a Nazi victory in Europe, for one or two generations, would have been an almost unmitigated disaster. Nearly as disastrous, however, was the political-psychological warfare waged by the Allies as well as the order which actually emerged from World War II. Taking into consideration the ignorance, the prejudices, and the ideological trends prevailing in the West and in the Soviet Union, not much else could be expected. This was also the reasoning of a few intelligent American isolationists. Mr. Churchill, as we have pointed out, was not a genuine conservative, but a pragmatist and deist of a certain aristocratic caste, of a terrifying cynicism and an astounding ignorance concerning most countries. Nevertheless, he was very gifted by nature in many ways but had a comparatively poor schooling, he never was a student of anything. His biographer, Mr. Robert Sencourt, said that to him Christ was a socialist and men who had principles were goody-goodies. With one grandfather a duke and the other an American impresario, he had grandeur in his zest for adventures and huge gambles. This enabled him to seize one of the greatest occasions in history and gradually to turn it into a calamity for Europe and a triumph for America. The triumph, however, was only momentary. His colleague, Mr. Franklin D. Roosevelt, was less gifted and even less informed, was totally ignorant of the big wide world, perhaps had less oratorical proficiency than Mr. Churchill, but played on a far larger instrument. Let us here remember Kierkegaard's remark that the preparation of a minister nowadays does not teach him how to be one, but how to become one. The manifold efforts, talks, intrigues, chats, and rubbing of shoulders in order to finally jockey oneself into a leading position in a democracy consumes so much time and energy that the factual knowledge absolutely necessary for statesmanship, as opposed to the qualifications of a mere politician, is almost never acquired. Though more cautious in his public utterances, Mr. Roosevelt knew even less than Professor Wilson. There is little doubt that he could have read Mein Kampf if ever. Only in 1941. The Nazis to him, of course, were medieval, his wife stood very far to the left, a study of her writings is most rewarding and we shall return to her later in this chapter. His Secretary of State, Mr. Cordell Hull, had received the intellectual preparation for his exalted role in the most amazing way. He owed his later career largely to his specialization in trade and tariff agreements which in the good old days used to be the crux of American foreign policy. His contribution to the profound, almost fatal crisis in which our world actually finds itself is a not inconsiderable one. His successor, Mr. Statinius, an industrialist, was not much more qualified, and we owe thanks to Pan Jan Kikanowski, the former Polish ambassador to Washington, for a candid glimpse of Mr. Statinius catapulted into the important position of an Undersecretary of State two years prior to his taking over the entire State Department. I congratulated him on his appointment, Kikanowski wrote, and asked him how he felt in his new surroundings. He replied that he felt very bewildered. Barely a few days after taking over his duties he had become acting Secretary of State in the absence of Mr. Hull. With boyish frankness he admitted that he not only felt ignorant of the affairs he had to deal with but, what made it even more difficult, he did not know most of the officials of the department who had suddenly become his subordinates and collaborators. Sheer amateurism characterized not only the Americans but also the British war effort, whereas the Russians and Germans were held and thralled them by ideologies untrue to life, a different handicap. Yet a very bad plan is sometimes superior to none at all. A human being will plan ahead and might err in his calculations. A beast does not really plan, unerring instincts will induce it to build a nest or to collect food for the winter. But apart from such isolated activities conditioned by inherited instincts, the animal merely acts and reacts pragmatically, as the momentary circumstances demand. There exists in Anglo-Saxonry, as Kaiserling stated, a strong anti-intellectual current which, by the way, harmonizes well with the democratic tradition. Our conservatives have a tendency to compare the president with the prime minister, and the prime minister comes out far better. To the historian and moralist this is by no means evident. Apart from the fact that Churchill was not a conservative, and, for this particular reason, there should be no party pre. We must remember the mythomanic tendency of the president, the promises he broke without the slightest reason or provocation, the statements he made without any backing of facts, the directions he gave on the spur of the moment and which had no realistic substance, all of these add up to the fact that he could not be held morally responsible for many of his utterances and actions. Thus he sent the Polish premier Mikolajczyk on a wild goose chase to Moscow and exhorted him to stand up to Stalin, to make no territorial concessions, insisting that the president and the people of the United States stood solidly behind him. Molotov told the surprised premier in the presence of Eden and Harriman that a Tehran Roosevelt had solemnly promised eastern Poland to the Soviet Union. Mikolajczyk was thunderstruck, 
the president's sense of responsibility was startling, his frivolity was of an extraordinary character. Mr. Henry Morgenthau Jr. relates in his diaries how every morning the price of gold was set by the president at breakfast. One day Mr. Roosevelt proposed a rise of 21 cents because it is a lucky number, three times seven. Finally, Montague Norman, governor of the Bank of England, protested. This outcry of indignation amused Henry, the morgue, I began to chuckle and the president roared with laughter. Roosevelt had only hazy ideas on a future order for our planet, but they clearly bordered on the abnormal and were characterized by a strong leftist bias. There was to be a plebiscite in Norway to see what sort of constitution the people really wanted to have, also in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in Italy and in Greece, but, of course, none in Czechoslovakia, a model democracy, and Russia, according to FDR had the noble calling to dominate Europe, yet apart from vague notions, there was no coherent vision. All a man like Roosevelt could do was to wage war, declare unconditional surrender a policy, thereby prolong the war beyond his own lifespan and play politics by ear. The Russians had a plan. The Americans had none. Nor, indeed, had Mr. Churchill and the British. It is pure myth that Mr. Churchill insisted on his brilliant idea to invade Europe through the Balkans and to occupy Budapest, Vienna and Prague before the Russians did. He yielded quickly and without much resistance to the American plan to attack Italy instead, and called Italy no less than the Balkans the soft underbelly of Europe. How many Allied soldiers, especially Poles bound to lose their homeland, found their graves in this allegedly so soft highly mountainous underbelly? And it is a mere saga that Churchill opposed the unconditional surrender formula. His reaction to this piece of psychological strategy was that that poor Goebbels is going to hell. General Albert C. Wedemeyer wrote quite adroitly about the war aims and the two key men in the western camp of the Allies, without a clearly defined political objective, war is but aimless or senseless slaughter. This fact is understood by every military man with any pretensions to professional knowledge. Winston Churchill, correctly described by his own chief of staff as no strategist, but is acting on intuition and, and impulse without regard to the implications and consequences of the courses he favored, waged war more like an Indian chieftain from the Arizona Territory intent upon obtaining the largest possible number of enemy scalps. In order to kill a maximum number of Germans, Winston Churchill dismissed politics or policy as a secondary consideration, and on this and many other occasions said that there were no lengths of violence to which we would not go in order to achieve his objective. The Russian alliance was of great psychological importance for the entire left in Britain and in the United States. It cannot be denied that the German attack on the Soviet Union was a break for Britain engaged in bitter aerial warfare with the Reich. Contrary to a widespread opinion, though air warfare was not begun by the Nazis, in 1935 they had offered an air pact to the National Laborite government, which would have limited the role of the Air Force to the support of operating ground forces. This was turned down by Air Secretary Thompson as a clever, but immoral ruse to humanize warfare, frightfulness should terminate war, this blot on humanity. Yet Hitler originally acted as if it had been accepted and signed, and the first big German raids on England had the character of mere reprisals. The attack on Rotterdam, with 945 people killed, had been erroneously unleashed after the armistice when the German troops were within nine miles of the city. There exists a very large and conclusive documentation on this whole issue. Mr. Churchill speculated, quite rightly, that Britain eventually would win the air war because she could build up an air force in safely distant lands while Germany would always remain under her nose. This much we can gather partly from his notes written on July 8 and 11, 1940. The documentary proof that the RAF started a methodical bombing of Germany before the Germans opened their so-called blitz on Britain can be gleaned from such authoritative books and articles as J.M. Spate, Assistant Secretary, Air Ministry, The Battle of Britain and Bombing Vindicated, and Basil Little Hart, War Limited, in Harper's Magazine General J.C.F. Fuller in the Second World War, 1939-1945 says frankly, that it was Mr. Churchill who lit the fuse which detonated a war of devastation and terrorization unrivaled since the invasion of the Seljuks. Yet the suffering inflicted from the air took not only a huge toll among the Germans, without too seriously incapacitating their industry, but also among foreign laborers, concentration camp inmates, and allied nationals. Even before Pearl Harbor American public opinion had to be prepared for an alliance in which not only Britain but also the Soviet Union had a leading part. The German attack on the USSR played a role similar to the abdication of Nicholas II in 1917. Now American public opinion could more easily be made to change its stand. In this connection Canon Bernard Iddings Bell recorded a rather significant wartime experience, at a dinner in New York at that time, I sat next to a high-up officer of one of the great news-collecting agencies. I suppose, I ventured, now that the Muscovites are on our side, 
the American people will have to be indoctrinated so as to stop thinking of them as devils and begin to regard them as noble fellows. Of course, he replied, we know what our job is in respect to that. We of the press will bring about a complete and most unanimous bolt face in the belief of the common man about the Russians. We shall do it in three weeks. The major trouble about deceit and untruth is not that misinformation is imparted to certain persons but that the originators of the lies tend to consider them to be truths. Finally they are unable to distinguish between fact and fiction and act in accordance with their fabrications. In Britain the news of the first Soviet victories came as such a relief that even people of considerable integrity lost their balance. A feminine hysteria broke loose in the British Isles, visions of sturdy Cossacks, Nagaikas, vodka, the sweat of galloping horses, bearded mudiks, progressive commissars, and heroic girls in boots and coy fur caps fired the imaginations. Many Britishers were ready to throw themselves into the arms of unholy Mother Russia, absolutely forgetting that it was Stalin who, with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, had willfully started World War II, later discarding all British warnings about an impending attack from the Germans as idle capitalist talk. A policeman who finds that the two gangs he is fighting have fallen out among themselves does not proclaim that the weaker of the two consists of cherubs and seraphs, he merely takes practical advantage of the break. And when the USSR demanded a much larger chunk of Poland than Hitler ever had, 52% of Polish territory, to be precise, the British by and large failed to remember that it actually had been the Polish issue that had made them declare war on Hitler. What did Lord Halifax say in December 1939? We have tried to improve relations with Russia, but in doing so we had always maintained the position that rights of third parties must remain intact and unaffected by our negotiations. I have little doubt that the people of this country would prefer to face difficulties and embarrassments rather than feel that we had compromised the honor of this country and commonwealth. Yet the most curious part of the bill to be paid for that almost limitless libido serviendi as regards the Soviet Union was presented only in late spring 1945. Then the majority of the British people, expecting the left millennium, sided with labor and voted the conservatives out of power who, after all, had brought them military victory. If the communist USSR was so marvelous the British people was drawn to the next best thing, socialism. In the United States the great enthusiasm for the Soviet Union came only after Pearl Harbor, the cleverly organized backdoor to get the United States into the war. We have no reliable demographic statistics, but it is my impression that the pro-Soviet fervor was less strong in the United States than in Britain if for no other reason, and there were others, than that America had too many citizens of East European and East Central European descent who could not so easily be hoodwinked. But they were rarely to be found in the higher and highest social layers, with the result that the red hysteria was much stronger in Boston or Philadelphia than in Pittsburgh or Johnstown, not to mention Sauk Center. I still remember a cocktail party in Manhattan in 1943 where a lady in mink, balancing her highball, screamed that it was America's most urgent task to show herself worthy of her gallant Soviet allies. To think, she sobbed later, after some more libations, that I called them Bolsheviks. I had to reassure the good woman that there was nothing pejorative in this appellation. Joseph E. Davis' mission to Moscow contained propaganda sufficiently deceitful to make it a bestseller, which was even filmed, it helped a great deal to give to the American public a revised picture of the new Russia. Miss Dorothy Thompson, during the war years perhaps America's most outstanding columnist, wrote that one thing was certain about the Soviet Union, they never broke their word or reneged a treaty. Yet she was by no means the worst of the whole lot. When one looked at the material which was published, read, and favorably commented, one had to despair about the sanity of a large sector of the American public. Take for instance the book of Mr. Quentin Reynolds, Only the Stars Are Neutral, published in 1942. The best anecdote in the whole book can be found at the end when the author, on his way home from the USSR, describes himself talking to Sir Miles Lampson, British ambassador in Egypt, in Cairo. Sir Miles plies him with questions about the USSR but repeatedly Mr. Reynolds has to reply that he does not know. Sure, I said, after I had been in Russia three weeks I knew everything about the place. I could have written a book about it. But I made the mistake of staying there three months. After three months I realized I didn't know a damn thing about the country. The reader is probably moved by so much modesty. But what does he hold in his hands if not? Well, for instance, Mr. Reynolds makes a few admissions about the 800 women, political prisoners, working hard near Kaibyshev, the wash basin costing $15, the great risk which Soviet citizens run by associating with foreigners, and even the lack of freedom of speech in spite of so much smartness, but he expects that the youngsters will learn soon from the older democracies. Notice the little ledger domain, from the older democracies. In other words, the Soviet Union is a younger democracy, as of course it would be if it had the support of the majority of the people. 
the subtle lie is placed quite unobtrusively. Other lies are far less subtle and presuppose an immensely unintelligent, i.e., average reader. Here we want to go into a few details because the technique is typical for the propaganda poured out by the left during the war in America. Mr. Reynolds, who had the best preparation imaginable for his task because he had started as a sports reporter, wrote, In the Tsarist days the priests had a wonderful racket in Russia. They were paid by the state and collections taken up in churches went to the state. All Stalin did was to separate the church from the state. In short he did the same thing we did in our country back in 1776. Their priests are no longer government officials who have almost the power of life and death over them. Had any of us ever troubled to read the Soviet constitution, as vigorously upheld as our own, we might have got the true picture of religion in the Soviet Union. I looked it up the day after the Kremlin dinner. I talked with Father Braun. I mentally apologized as a Catholic for the things I've thought about Russia's attitude toward religion. Now let us look into this interesting revelation. The priests, indeed, were paid by the state, as were all priests and ministers everywhere on the continent, except in France, after 1905. Yet if the collections went back to the state, why then call it a racket? Of course they did not go back, Stalin did not separate the church from the state, Lenin did it. Now Mr. Reynolds is entitled to his opinion that the church should be separated from the state, but this just is not the European tradition, least of all in Switzerland, a freedom-loving, highly democratic state. Most free European countries cooperate with several churches. Nor did the separation in the United States take place in 1776, and the First Amendment, enacted in the year 1789-1791, merely prohibited an established church on a federal basis. Cooperation of state and church is not necessarily establishment. And establishment on a state basis in the United States continued well into the 19th century. It is of course totally untrue that Russian priests had almost the power over life and death, they had neither the power nor the prestige that either Catholic priests or evangelical ministers traditionally enjoy in the West. In Russian folklore the priest, and his wife, always played the role of the fool. The high praise given to the Soviet constitution seems to be a real hoax. We have only estimates about the number of persons in concentration camps at the time of Stalin, but these estimates all run between 8 and 20 million. Furthermore, separation between church and state is one thing, persecution is something else. When Mr. Reynolds visited the Soviet Union, the second big wave of religious persecution, 1934-1941, had just come to a close. A third wave was to follow after 1958, it still lasts, from 1917 until the outbreak of World War II more than 110 bishops of the Eastern Church alone were executed and more than a dozen had disappeared. Yet these data give only a weak idea of the real extent of the persecution and the savageries it involved. When Mr. Reynolds mentally apologizes as a Catholic one is even more puzzled. And before his mental apology he had talked with Father Braun, an American assumptionist, who was then chaplain to the Foreign Diplomatic Service. He does not say what the priest told him, whether he confirmed or denied his views and experiences, but just mentions the fact. One has to assume that his mental apology was not only the result of his perusal of the Soviet constitution but also of his talk with Father Braun. There is another choice bit, a captain of the Red Army talks to our author referring to a British officer. My friend Colonel Hill was here in Russia in Tsarist days. He will tell you that only 10% of our citizens owned shoes then. He will tell you that only 1% of our people was literate. Now education, classical, scientific or industrial, is open to all. Remember our world has only lasted 24 years. Yours in America has lasted since 1776. And then comes the climax, we haven't had to chuck religion overboard, I suggested. We have not chucked religion overboard, he smiled. We've chucked overboard the religious abuses we suffered from. This is really worth going into. Reynolds does not tell us anything. He makes no statements. He is merely a reporter. He was told all that by a Red Army captain who refers him to a British colonel who in turn is not consulted and reaffirms nothing. Fine. But according to this conversation, only 10% of the people had shoes and only 1% was literate. As we know about 44% were literate in 1917, and if only 1% had been literate at the outbreak of the revolution, how many were there let us say in 1882, the year Dostoevsky died, 1 in 200? 1 in 500 or in a thousand? Just think, out of 110 million people perhaps only half a million people could read and write, and at the end of the 19th century such a country produced Europe's then leading literature. Of course, this is utter nonsense, but the dear reader will gobble it up. He will also swallow the 10% shoes. 
Amusing to visualize Imperial Russia in the winter of 1910 with 90% of the people staying home between early October and late April, and then going barefoot. Yet the greater the nonsense, the greater also the idiotic public's delight. The dear reader also will believe that American life before and after 1776 ran along different lines, that a big social and economic revolution with a capital R had taken place. But in Russia nothing radical had happened as far as religion was concerned, only abuses were corrected. A civil servant who is fired because he is seen regularly in church on Sunday has shown that he is a reactionary, a university professor getting married in church proves that he cannot be a real scientist, a wedding in the registry office is scientific and everything connected with religion is unscientific, and to teach children or adolescents religion is intolerable because it alienates them from Marxism-Leninism. The abuse of religion in old times consisted in the anarchic freedom that everybody could stay home or go to church without danger of reprisal, just as he wanted. Or does anyone believe that two gendarmes fetch Dr. Antony Chikov every Sunday to drag him to holy liturgy? In Russia, anyone who criticizes the government is an enemy of the state, Quentin Reynolds admits. Harsh as Stalin's methods are, he has a complete answer, a complete justification for the ruthless quelling of opposition. Today there is not one fifth columnist, not one quizzling at liberty in Soviet Russia. Stalin knew what he was doing back in 1938. Russia's magnificent unity today and her completely unbroken spirit after the tragedy of the German advance, is proof of the fact that Russia accepted the purge and approved of Stalin's policy. This magnificent unity while almost half a million Russian Blasovsi fought under the German flag, needs no comment. But then, what do we make of Mr. Reynolds' message to the reader on the wrapper? He says that this is a war to decide whether or not men can sit around the cracker box in the general store and lift their voices in praise or criticism. It is a war to decide whether or not we can worship Christ or Muhammad or Buddha or a clay pigeon, or anything else which we, as individuals, decide to worship. Yet, if some of us worship navel-gazing Buddhas and the others clay pigeons, while sitting around a cracker box, where do we get that so necessary magnificent unity for which Stalin has a complete justification? Here we are certainly faced with complete schizophrenia. In my novel Black Banners I have described this orgy of lies which took place in World War II and which engulfed the entire globe. The hero listened to the various shortwave broadcasts. And all he heard were lies, small lies so small that they needed a magnifying glass, and lies so monumental that they literally darken the mental horizon, slippery lies hiding in a mountain of truth designed to be swallowed with the most innocent-looking commonplaces, lies so cleverly camouflaged that it needed endless efforts to reach their poison after removing one protective layer after the other, and lies so gross, so stupid, so blunt that they could make a pasture of horses laugh and neigh themselves to death. There were bitter lies and sweet lies, lies which tried to gain the battle of persuasion by a straight assault, by surprise, and a direct hit, and lies so circuitous and oblique that they needed gentle allusions to other lies, to other distortions, other misrepresentations. There were lies so new that they looked like silver coins just fresh from the mint, and lies so old that they had acquired friendly, familiar faces, they gloried in the patina of respectability and nobody even suspected that behind age-worn surface there lay enshrined untruth petrified and undisturbed already for centuries. And there were lies brazenly shouted over the ether and others muttered humbly, lies floating lonely and almost boredly carried by electric waves and others coming in packs like hungry wolves ready to attack, to bite, to kill, there were lies coming in erect and proud, pronounced in naive honesty, and lies whispered in all malevolence, bad conscience and malicious cunning, lies in drops, in whole oceans, in thin rivulets, lies in the form of powerful, foaming rivers, lies as a thin mist obscuring all views, lies, lies, lies. There were, of course, notable exceptions in the chorus of ignorance, fakers, and liars receiving the favors of the government for their aid in moral warfare under the circumstances quite a misnomer. In a people's war, however, the frenzy of the masses has to be whipped up to a high degree of indignation, hatred, and fanaticism. Under such circumstances liberal democracies distinguish themselves very little from leftist dictatorships. Men and women such as Thomas F. Woodlock of the Wall Street Journal, Henry J. Taylor, W. H. Chamberlain, Joseph Harsh, and O'Hare McCormick of the New York Times, the Packards and others refused to play the evil game. In quite a different role were commentators such as Gabriel Heater, Frederick L. Schumann, Raymond Graham Swing, Lisa Sergio. A hotbed of leftist, Pro-communist and communist propaganda was the Office of War Information, OWI, which had its fill of leftist refugees from all over continental Europe. Its German department was one of the worst. Since so many of these refugees in the United States had been Marxists they started to indoctrinate the American public with a Marxist version of global events, and the Americans, unfortunately, 
were able to digest this fare because it was offered to them in terms they understood. Man is emphatically not a homo o economicus pure and simple, but the explanation of political events in terms of material interest, cash, financial ambition, production, etc., is the simplest and even a dimwitted person can understand it. To make matters worse, the United States, just like Britain, has an emphatically commercial civilization and thus the Marxist argumentation could be followed. In terms of Marxist doctrine fascism could not be anything but a last-ditch stand of dying capitalism. Nazism, therefore, had to be explained as the desperate defense of German industry, monopoly capitalism, and high finance, and Hitler, naturally, was a mere stooge, a puppet of money-crazed monsters who had hired the bohemian private first class to club the trade unions into submission. Under the circumstances one could not expect a nobler ally in such a final battle for progress, liberty, and equality than the Soviet Union which knew how to deal with the evils of capitalism. Gustav Stolper, also in exile, had well seen this danger in America. This exegesis of Nazism, playing into the hands of a blind and irresponsible pro-Soviet attitude, could be linked with a piece of American folklore, with the notion that rotten backwardness was reigning supreme in Europe, that misery and poverty there were caused by big landowners who miraculously transformed themselves into monocled, saber-rattling, heel-clicking officers allied with slick bankers and fat bishops. The clichés of World War I, when the United States had been at war with the Hohenzollerns, were revived, and the demoniacal shadows of aristocratic arrogance magically projected onto the Nazis, of all people. During my wartime years in the United States I could never find a single morale-building story about Central Europe in which a Nazi nobleman was not involved. Unfortunately they did exist, just as there were Jews who paid conscience money to the Nazis, as there were Catholic priests with brown sympathies. Exceptions confirm the rule. Nazism, however, was a plebeian movement, and it is significant that at the big Nuremberg trial there was not a single nobleman among those condemned to death. In the above-mentioned type of literature, some of it transformed into movies, the carryover of World War I clichés is remarkable. As a result, slowly but surely, a fairly general feeling arose in the United States that this war, like its lamentable predecessor, was fought to aid the common man. He was the victim of noble and arrogant Nazi fascists, organized as well as spontaneous leftism in the United States was to turn the emancipation of the common man into some sort of war aim. A century of the common man had to be ushered in. This idealism worked in synchromesh with anti-colonialism and while America and Britain fought shoulder to shoulder, the President of the United States dreamed not only of a red overlordship over continental Western Europe, but also of a total destruction of the British Empire, the Commonwealth of Nations. This is a fact not sufficiently realized by many Americans and much of the resentment of certain European circles against America, de Gaulle, has to be explained by this still unforgotten phase of American foreign policy. The common man hysteria was amazing because actually the real source of evil in Europe was the precipitated and unwarranted rise of the common man into positions where he could not possibly use his own training, his knowledge, his experience but was asked to carry out tasks way beyond his capacity. Stalin's preparation consisted of a little theology, some highway robbery, and an artificial, very limited study of political science. Hitler had sold hand-colored postcards in Viennese cafes, Mussolini had been a mason in Switzerland. Daldier was the son of a baker. Still we do not want to insist on a purely sociological concept of the common man, the truly uncommon, the superior man obviously can be born in a log cabin. In Austrian history, for instance, we find men such as Joseph von Sonnenfels, son of a little rabbinical scholar, and Baron Thugget, son of a little army paymaster, pillars of Maria Theresa's reign, Dr. Karl Luger, son of a school janitor, founder of the Christian Social Party, and famous mayor of Vienna. Monsignor Ignaz Seipel, university professor and chancellor of Austria, son of a cabbie, and Dr. Engelbert Dolphus, illegitimate son of a peasant girl. Yet these uncommon men were men who had studied, were trained. The leftist-inspired and leftist-directed American wartime hysteria wanted to impress the broad public with the existence of a situation which was completely imaginary and the coming of a new age which was totally unreal. Dawnism is always the great psychological approach of the left which is eager to paint a possible paradisiacal future. The wartime utopia contained not only social and political promises, but also plastic cars, new gadgets of all sorts, nylon hose for all pretty girls, education through tape recorders under the pillow during sleep, $25 trips by air across the United States, and boundless liberty and equality amidst plenty all over the globe. This promising future had a few melancholy aspects because Mr. Sumner Wells in a memorable book advocated a total partition of Germany. Mr. Henry J. Morgenthau Jr. had the plan to transform Germany into a goat pasture, 
and Mr. Theodore N. Kaufman in his essay Germany Must Perish, showed even greater imagination. He proposed to sterilize all Germans and to distribute Germany and Austria among their neighbors. A map in his work showed the interesting changes, Holland and Poland had a common boundary, France, Czechoslovakia, and Holland met in Thuringia. Yet it ought to be mentioned for the sake of the record that the genuinely socialist camp did not participate in this orgy of Soviet adulation mixed with outbreaks of sadistic hatred for the partly guilty and partly innocent German people. A socialist weekly such as the new leader was absolutely honest and fair, some of its editors had been born in East Europe, most of them were Jewish, but they knew precisely who was who and what was what, which was not the case with the semi-literate and far more affluent mob which gladly danced the new Carmagnol. This euphoria was hardly troubled by the Soviet Union's announcement that demanded permanent possession of the three Baltic republics as well as of the largest part of Poland. This did not even come as a shock. Americans of nearly all political persuasions supported the shameless demands of the USSR which quickly also claimed further pieces of Finland, which they had only attacked for the second time in less than two years, Germany, and Czechoslovakia. The area requested by the Soviet Union was precisely 34 times that of Alsace-Lorraine, it comprised 482,000 square kilometers, more than Germany in 1937, and over 22 million inhabitants, as many as the United States had in 1850. The Soviets knew that they could get what they wanted because Mr. Churchill and Mr. Roosevelt were opportunists without a real sense of honor or obligation. As long as they won the war, who cared what the peace would be like? The New Republic, one of the mouthpieces of the uncommitted left, declared on February 20, 1943 in an editorial about the Russian demands that however forceful or dubious Russian legal claims, the crux of the problem must not be sought in legal genealogies but in the need of an enduring friendship between Russia and America. These words remind one of the famous discussions between Fitzroy MacLean and Winston Churchill recorded in Eastern Approaches, Brigadier MacLean, who had been staying with Tito's partisans, informed the Prime Minister that unlike Drazimich Lovic, the wily Croat was a true communist, Churchill asked him bluntly, do you intend to make Yugoslavia your home after the war? No, sir. Neither do I, Churchill replied, and that being so, the less you and I worry about the form of government they set up, the better. What interests us is, which of them is doing most harm to the Germans? Cynicism, however, is luckily not a main characteristic of the American people and thus reasons had to be found for supporting the Soviet demands. The Soviets' insistence on the Molotov-Ribbentrop line in Poland was suddenly bolstered with the silliest, flimsiest, and most infamous arguments. The left immediately stamped pre-war Poland as a den of iniquity and the men who valiantly fought the Germans as fascists. The Molotov-Ribbentrop line was identified with the Curzon line, but the public was not told that this line was never even by the congenitally anti-Polish British considered as a border but merely as a demarcation line of Poland's minimum demands. It extended from central Lithuania to the Galician border only and never to the Carpathians. In time for decision, a manual for peace planning, Mr. Sumner Wells, former Under Secretary of State, berated Catherine the Great of Russia for having been primarily responsible for one of the greatest international crimes in history, the first three partitions of Poland. Yet then Mr. Wells goes on defending Stalin's demands not only for the Russian share of all the first three partitions, but even for half of the Austrian share of the first partition. I am sure that Mr. Wells, or his ghostwriter, could not read maps. The Soviets founded their claim against Poland neither on an ideological nor on an historical but on a national, i.e., ethnological basis. Although the Soviet Union is basically a great Russian state truly and methodically Russianizing the rest of the USSR with the help of schools or planned migrations, it has given a minor ethnical autonomy to member states such as Belarusia, White Ruthenia, and the Ukraine. White Ruthenians and Ukrainians thus are minorities in the USSR. The same ethnic bodies are represented in eastern Poland. There the Poles mostly form the middle and upper class, as well as the largest ethnical group, followed by the Ukrainians, the White Ruthenians, the Jews, the Lithuanians, and the Germans. Only a nationalist, however, will insist on ethnic borders, and one of the main accusations against Hitler was always that he wanted all those who were ethnically German to live in the Third Reich, a tendency which goes rightly under the name of pan-Germanism. His demand for the Angelus, his peremptory request for the border districts of Bohemia Moravia Silesia, inhabited by the so-called Zudaten Germans, his insistence on the return of certain areas of Poland, which brought about World War II, his incorporation of Alsace-Lorraine in 1940, all this was based on a racialist nationalist attitude, condemned, decried, execrated, and vilified by the more international-minded left. Now Stalin did the same, and in the United States, or in England, hardly anybody asked whether the people living in eastern Poland really wanted to join the Soviet Union. 
Just imagine the indignation if Hitler had declared that all of German-speaking Switzerland had to join the Reich. I had an exchange of letters with a leading American journalist who defended the Soviet stand on ethnic grounds. The idea never came to his mind that a Ukrainian of Volhynia, in spite of his dislike for the Poles, might prefer to live as member of a minority in bourgeois Poland rather than as a member of another minority in the great Russian USSR. It probably never occurred to him because he could not imagine that free Poland and red Russia were worlds apart. In the United States one frequently heard that the wily Poles, with French aid, had defeated the Red Army in a moment of weakness and thus brutally wrested lands from a helpless Soviet Russia. This also is nonsense. In 1920 Lenin offered to the Poles peace and a boundary a great deal farther east than the one violated by Stalin in 1939. The Poles did not accept because Polsudski felt that he was morally bound to come to the aid of Petliura, the Ukrainian nationalist leader, then engaged in a life-and-death struggle with the Russian Reds. Yet Petliura was defeated, the Red Army advanced deep into Poland and arrived at the very gates of Warsaw, which filled Lloyd George with glee, enthused the British Labour Party, and made Thomas G. Masaryk very happy, but at the very gates of Warsaw Polsudski, without French aid, defeated the Red Army, the miracle of the Vistula. The Red Army retired and in the compromise peace of Riga the Poles achieved a boundary which returned to them the Russian share of the third partition and a few tiny fragments of the second partition, none from the first partition, and this in spite of the fact that the partitions of Poland had been solemnly abrogated as a piece of Russian imperialism at the beginning of the Soviet regime, August 29, 1919. In the previous offer of the Soviets, cities such as Polak, Minsk and Kamieniec Podolsky had been promised to the Poles. Now they received less and, as a result, the great Soviet encyclopedia considers that that war had been won by the USSR. And indeed in the following years a stream of refugees came at great danger from the Soviet Union over to Poland, Ukrainians, white Ruthenians, Jews, and naturally Poles. Little it mattered that on July 30, 1941, the Soviets had even solemnly abrogated all treaties they had made with the Nazis on the subject of Poland's territory. The pro-Soviet hysteria, coupled with the mounting defamation of Poland, swept the press. Czechoslovakia was strongly played up with the horror of Lidice, but the fact that the Poles had an endless number of Lidices hardly mattered. Their perhaps ungenerous treatment of the Ukrainians and Jews was constantly held against them, although there was no doubt which side these minorities would have taken if given the choice. A Ukrainian, or Jewish, lawyer, doctor, priest, monk or nun, peasant, teacher in the humanities, labor leader, artist, banker, or shopkeeper could not possibly prefer the Soviet regime which was sure to annihilate his way of life and deprive him of his property if he had any. Then came the news of the Katyn massacre, swiftly followed by two Soviet blows, Moscow's rupture with the Polish government in exile because it had dared to demand an impartial investigation of the Nazi charges, and the Soviet allegation that the crime had been committed by the Germans after their advance into West Russia in the fall of 1941, whereas the horror had been perpetrated in spring 1940, almost a year and a half earlier. The American and British governments assumed a neutral position, but this was an occasion for the vast majority of American newspapers to feel ill at ease. Today hardly anybody left of center would dare to maintain that this crime belongs to the Nazi Register of Sins, but the Soviets still tried to ascribe it to the Germans as late as 1946 at the Nuremberg trial. This, however, embarrassed their noble Western allies so much that they quietly dropped the accusation. They probably felt that before such a mixed body of judges the Russians could not repeat their delightful techniques used at the stage trials under Andrzej Vyshinsky in the late 1930s. Katyn should have been a signal, as should the establishment of the Communist Polish Committee in the Soviet Union, which was later transferred to Lublin, or the fatal halting of the Red Army before Warsaw while the heroic army of Kroyor, under the leadership of Count Komorowski, General Bohr, bled to death, or the murder of the two Jewish labor leaders Alter and Ehrlich, or the deportation of thousands upon thousands of Poles to the Arctic and to Siberia, or the distrust and contempt displayed toward Allied missions. Yet all these signs which, one would have thought, could not be overlooked, did not shake leftist admiration for the Soviets, neither their admiration nor their inferiority complex. Their earlier American messianism was now transferred to the USSR. Did Mr. Roosevelt wake up to the danger? According to legend, the last months of his life were darkened by the increasing realization that another totalitarian power was menacing the world's freedom, but we find no documentary evidence to prove that this was the case. It seems rather as if his conviction that he could charm the sinister Georgian never left him. How can a man charm another if he cannot even converse with him? Churchill never really liked Bolsheviks and his attitude towards Stalin will remain forever a riddle. On the other hand he disliked Poles and entertained no hope that he could ever understand anything about Russia. 
Before he came to Yalta he arranged for the ghastliest single massacre in modern history, the annihilation of Dresden, in order to impress Stalin with the might of the Western Allies. But the weather permitted the Holocaust to take place only on the day Churchill left Yalta, having committed the crime of the Crimea by arranging for the West's suicide before sealing its fate at Potsdam. So the ghastly mass murder was completely in vain, the number of victims in this unfortified and non-industrial city, crammed with refugees, is estimated to have been between 135,000 and 170,000, all non-combatants, mostly women, children, and old men, but including foreign slave laborers, a few thousand only. Hiroshima or Nagasaki were child's play compared with this, and at least two-thirds of the victims were burned alive. The inquisitors at least were after people they thought to be individually guilty. The number of those killed in the name of progress, democracy, freedom, enlightenment, and brotherhood, on one nice afternoon is a multiple of the inquisitors' victims during centuries. And how it boomeranged, every year three minutes of silence are observed on the day of infamy in communist-dominated Dresden for the victims of Western monopoly capitalism as if the shareholders of DuPont or Cordwold's had instigated the crime, when the American Mustangs appeared over the smoking ruins, all they could do was to machine gun fire scarred refugees running for their lives. This war, as senseless as its predecessor, could have been considerably shortened. In 1943 German army leaders desperately tried to obtain the collaboration of the Western Allies but failed completely. They made efforts to establish contacts through the German embassy in Ankara and through George H. Earl, former governor of Pennsylvania and U.S. naval attaché in Turkey during the war. Earl flew to Washington in May 1944 and vainly tried to make the president see the light, i.e., the Russian menace. Other truly unceasing efforts were made by the German opposition in Sweden, Switzerland, and Spain. The Western Allies, however, were adamant in not giving any hint as to the meaning or content of the unconditional surrender formula. Thus they paralyzed not only the activities of the opposition groups but also gave to Goebbels and to the Russians an undreamed of propaganda advantage. The Soviets wanted to fight to the bitter end, while getting assurances from the West that it would leave them half of defeated Germany, and so did the Nazis because it was the only way to prolong their lives, or, at least, their liberty. Never in history has there been a more suicidal collaboration between a power at war, its political opponents in the enemy nation, and its allies preparing to be its enemies of tomorrow. We should not fool ourselves into believing that the British, even ignoring the wishes of Washington, would have pursued a very different policy. Mr. Churchill in the House of Commons vilified and ridiculed the conspirators and Mr. Anthony Eden was as adamant in rejecting the advances of the conspirators, high officers, labor leaders, professors, administrators, writers, as were his American counterparts deeply influenced by real traitors who had a leftist victory far more at heart than peace or their country's welfare. Thousands of Americans were sacrificed to a mixture of vanity, treason and stupidity, to a build-up for World War III. These Americans were expendable, they were plowed under. When, finally, on July 20, 1944, assassination of Hitler was attempted by the desperate German resistance, American public opinion was fed more nonsense of the lowest moral order. What editorial do we find in the New York Times? On August 9, 1944, when much information was available, they wrote, the underworld mentality and methods which the Nazis brought from their gutters and enthroned on the highest levels of German life, have begun to pervade the officers' corps as well. The New York Herald Tribune on August 9th of the same year wrote, Americans as a whole will not feel sorry that the bomb spared Hitler for the liquidation of his generals. They hold no briefs for aristocrats as such, especially those given to the Gustep. Let the generals kill the corporal, or vice versa, preferably both. The ensuing massacre in which not only generals and goose-stepping aristocrats were killed, Moltke, Gordeler, Lieber, Bonhoeffer, Daup, Stauffenberg, deprived Germany of such an important segment of its moral and intellectual elite that it has not recovered from this loss to this very day. The possibility of an earlier peace was not realized by America's or Britain's man in the street because he was never given the necessary information. The information, we must admit, could not have been given to him. The men he had directly or indirectly elected to office failed, nay, refused to act on their information, out of stupidity, vanity, ideological prejudice, and their subservience to the USSR, which by the way had taken up secret contacts with the Nazis in Stockholm. In this connection one has to ask oneself whether the Western statesmen did not know about the extermination camp since they disposed, after all, of an elaborate system of espionage all over Nazi-occupied Europe. The Germans in their overwhelming majority, though fairly well acquainted with the horrors of the concentration camps, knew nothing about the swift mass murders. I conducted private investigations in 1947, interviewed church leaders, etc. Leon Blum, 
who was in Buchenwald for a long time, ignored the tortures and murders committed there until the bombing of the camp by the Allies and accidental contacts with men from other sectors made him realize the terrible truth. For many years we had nothing but the Gerstein report as the only coherent eyewitness testimony of the horrors of the extermination camps in the East. The Vatican, famous for its lack of reliable information, had no concrete information either, just hearsay. Yet what about the Allied sources of information? By early 1943, American jury had reports about the extermination camps. Did Washington and London not know anything about this? There are, as we said, indications that they did after all. The Western Allies had air superiority by late 1942, they could have menaced Hitler with specific retaliatory measures, they could have enlightened the German people, which listened to Allied broadcasts, but nothing of the sort was done. Stubbornly, doggedly they continued the war under the motto of unconditional surrender. Perhaps certain people wanted to put all trump cards into Soviet hands. The confusion in America was enormous and the circulating legends numerous. People desperately clung to the belief that in the Allied camp at least Churchill knew better, which was not the case. The responsibility for the switch from Drazimij Lubbock to Tito was also due to Churchill, not to Roosevelt, but few people realized that Mij Lubbock's Setnasai was purely Serb and that an anti-Nazi Croat, who opposed the Astasa, therefore had no other choice but to join the party's Ani, which he did without qualms last but not least because the BBC told him that Tito's outfit was really democratic. Mij Lubbock had murdered Croats on a large scale, and the Estasi had murdered Serbs en masse the dragon seat of 1918 to 1919 produced its evil harvest and the partisani murdered in every direction. To be quite frank, a government consisting of rank amateurs could hardly cope with an immensely complex situation that required at the helm of the state men with moral and intellectual qualities such as any form of government rarely, but democracies almost never supply. The man in the street, no doubt, has neither the time nor the preparation nor perhaps even any interest to grapple with monumental issues, the answer to the alternatives, Mij Lovic or Tito, was naturally that Mij Lovic represented by far the lesser evil. The real key to the whole problem is the fact that Yugoslavia should never have been created. It had been largely created by refugees in 1917-1919, and other refugees were active in the United States during World War II. As we have pointed out, the majority belonged to the leftist camp, they cooperated intimately with the American left and, more often than not, they were the men who had helped in the past to undermine the fabric of traditional Christian Europe, thus creating that frightful void which communism, socialism, and later on national socialism were to fill. Deserted altars are inhabited by demons. Ernst Jünger. Of course Jews and persons married to Jews often had no other choice but to emigrate. Had they stayed on, they would have faced certain death. The same was more or less true of those who had been in important positions and who were on the list of the brown headhunters. But it can be said without much danger of refutation that the Marxists and the representatives of the left center were the more mobile people, the rootless element which made its way to the American fleshpots and then wrote courageous anti-Nazi pamphlets or novels, safely sheltered beyond an ocean. The most courageous people stayed on and faced the music. Hermann Burchardt, a conservative Christian writer of Jewish extraction, beaten to pulp in a Nazi concentration camp, was invited for a lecture by a group of moderate leftists, Marxists, and progressives in New York. Eyeing his audience he started his speech with a remark, seeing you, gentlemen, sitting here, you the grave diggers of Germany, I regret that Hitler permitted you to escape. He did not hear the indignant outcries because the beatings in Iraniumbaum had almost completely deprived him of his acoustical faculties. Indeed, truth alone offends. America's leftists had been strongly reinforced by those newcomers, the emigrail, and the more extreme among them fostered the cause of the Soviet Union. Such an attitude, even more so for those born in the country, and those who had solemnly sworn allegiance, was criminal. It was downright treason, whatever the government's own attitude, and when it became apparent that treason actually had been committed and that the culprits had to be found out, great excitement broke loose among the leftists, native or foreign-born. These supporters of an alien totalitarian government suddenly invoked for their treatment all the sacred principles of classic liberal tolerance. The betrayal itself cannot be doubted, its documentary evidence is unimpeachable. I personally am viewing these activities with the eyes of a non-American, of a person dead set against the whole development of identitarian and egalitarian frenzy to which Jefferson was not alien and which has affected American popular concepts and American political folklore. Which does not mean that the evil seed is not also sprouting in other parts of the globe, and more powerfully so than in the United States, the question I want to raise is this, where are we going to draw the line? The line between objective treason and loyalty is very clear. A man who puts the interest of a foreign country above that of his own is not acting patriotically, provided no moral issues are involved. 
Obviously my country right or wrong is an immoral, an unchristian device. It is Churchillism pure and simple, a man who secretly, illegally hands over vital information to a country which is a potential or an actual enemy of his country is legally a traitor. Now, a man might commit treason from a legal point of view while he actually follows his conscience. Legally Admiral Canaris was a traitor because he collaborated with Franco in keeping Spain out of the war on Germany's side. For this and many other actions he was executed in Flossenburg concentration camp. Yet while legally a traitor, he fought courageously for all the values our Western world stands for. Count Klaus Schenk von Stauffenberg, a Catholic, tried to assassinate Hitler. Justum Messnicera Regis Impios is a concept in the best medieval Catholic tradition. In an ideological war mere nationality becomes a secondary consideration. Citizenship, from the point of view of the higher loyalties, is only a relatively valid concept. The Vlasovsi, i.e., the Russians and Cossacks who fought under General Vlasov against the Red Army, were patriots in a deeper sense. The American with communist convictions whose first loyalty is to the communist idea and thus to the men in the Kremlin, is in similar position. We said similar, not identical. Admiral Canaris did not want to make an American, or a British, crown colony out of Germany. An American communist to whom Sovietism is the highest ideal works quite naturally for the transformation of the United States into a member state of the USSR, such as the Ukraine, or into a satellite such as Romania or Bulgaria. On the other hand, the American communist, or fellow traveler, working in the interest of the USSR is acting like Canaris in as much as he puts his political faith, his convictions higher than a loyalty due to the accident of birth. In the conflict of loyalties, those to one's convictions always should take precedence. This, however, is the reason why a political community, a state, has to eliminate persons from positions of importance if they hold convictions which sooner or later will conflict with the real interests of the polity. And there can be cases when an individual, without adhering to a systematized ideology, simply finds himself unable to carry out an order given by the state. I do not think that a hangman can put to death a person of whose innocence he is absolutely convinced. Yet these are unforeseen cases. It is certainly not an act of unjust discrimination if a restaurant refuses to employ a convinced vegetarian as a meat cook or a devout Muslim as a wine taster or if a board of education does not appoint a declared misogynist as principal of a girl's school. The trouble about the so-called witch hunt in the United States was the question where to draw the line. To me it is evident that the revival of ancient democracy in the French Revolution spawned a whole interconnected and coherent series of leftist ideologies visibly affiliated, and that it is not easy to separate them neatly from each other. They are all identitarian, they are all statist, they are all egalitarian and more or less materialistic, they have affinities with atheism and, even more so, with agnosticism. Mr. Robert Green Ingersoll was not a communist, but he was an ardent and devoted propagandist of atheism. Lenin's views about God were roughly the same, Stalin, and later Khrushchev, shared Hitler's views about modern art, Jewish influence, the Catholic Church, and the practical solution for ethnic minorities. The Second, Third, Fourth and even the Fifth French Republic worship the memories of the French Revolution and celebrate an event as nauseating as the storming of the Bastille. Remember the young cook qui savait fair les viandes, pathological butchers such as Danton and Robespierre were again honored on French stamps 15 years ago, Mr. Harry S. Truman, who with Mr. Attlee and Stalin had voted the starvation program for the Spanish people, perhaps not really destined to starve the Spaniards but to achieve the victory of Bolshevism in Spain so that the Soviets could have the base in Rota, is still considered a respected elder statesman. In the United States it is not always easy to draw the line between a liberal and a conservative Republican, between a liberal Republican and a middle-of-the-road Democrat, between such a Democrat and a highly liberal Democrat of the Eta type. Let us imagine a typical pragmatist, product of Teachers College of Columbia University, formerly an avid reader of PM, devotee of the progressive, financial supporter of a committee for decolonization which supports the sacred cause of the liberation of the peoples of Angola. No doubt, one can subscribe to Soviet Russia today, clamor for the admission of Red China to the United Nations, regard the late Mrs. Roosevelt as the brightest woman that ever trod the earth, and still not be a communist. But under such circumstances one gets nearer and nearer to the communist position. Mrs. Roosevelt's contribution to the cause of world communism has been sufficiently substantial for the new Hungary to commemorate her with a stamp. Whether new Czechoslovakia or new Romania did the same, I do not know. I think that the case of Mrs. Roosevelt is typical. I am sure, however, that she was never singled out by Senator McCarthy as an object of his methodical investigation since, apart from her status as the wife and, later, widow of a president, she was probably never in the civil service of the United States. 
it is well known that she was connected with many organizations which, to put it mildly, were left of center. She had a considerable prestige among common people and her column My Day as well as her articles and her question and answer column in a ladies' monthly were read by millions. It is fairly common knowledge that she stood further to the left than her husband and her public remarks on the actions and institutions of the Soviet Union were always on the whole favorable or only mildly critical. In order not to rely on mere hearsay I once studied her column My Day in the years 1948 to 1949, a time when the vast majority of Americans were waking up from the stupor into which they had been cast by their own government's pro-communist propaganda. That the waking up process had taken such a long time is amazing, because there was every indication that Sovietism represented unmitigated horror, displaced persons fleeing communism were moving all over Europe, the promises given by the USSR were broken right and left, a regular war had been fought in Greece, but only now the euphoria came to an end. Of Mrs. Roosevelt's dicta I would like to take only a few samples which I consider characteristic. Let us look at my day in the Chicago Sun-Times of July 7, 1948. There she says. One wishes very much that the USSR could be brought to see the light and to give those countries on her borders which have genuine communist government sufficient latitude to let them feel they are acting as free and independent people. There is no question, but that the Yugoslavs have a great admiration for Soviet communism. They feel that, from the economic standpoint, the Russians have the only solution, both industrially and agriculturally. They are not opposed to Soviet political theories, and are even willing to follow along. They have an efficient, secret police and all, they ask is that the secret police be their own and that they be allowed to enjoy their own brand of nationalism. I happen to think that their desires could be achieved quite as well, under democracy as under communism, but they will have to find this out as time goes on. There is more in this column than immediately meets the eye. One has to read it two or three times and then draw one's own conclusions. Here is another piece. January 19, 1949. I am in receipt of two interesting communications relative to a column I wrote about the imprisonment of Cardinal Mincendi. What I was trying to say, of course, was not that the Cardinal was an altogether admirable character, but that it is stupid, of the communists to imprison people where it can be said that they have been imprisoned because of their religion. Our correspondent, a man who edits a publication which claims to be completely factual, writes that the arrest is not a matter of religious persecution, but of opposition to progress. He claims that the cardinal is a reactionary, if not a fascist and a notorious anti-Semite. He also says that every fair-minded correspondent in Hungary would bear him out in this assertion that the cardinal was the main opponent to the general welfare of the Hungarian people. Cardinal Mincenti controlled a million acres of land, says my correspondent, for the Roman Catholic Church was the largest landowner of Hungary, therefore the Cardinal opposed all agrarian reform and opposed the separation of state and church. So far, so good. Mrs. Roosevelt obviously said nothing. She merely related what one of her correspondents told her. She is perfectly innocent of all pro-communist propaganda. Naturally, in her column, she sided with Alger Hiss against Whitaker Chambers on whose word nobody could rely. She opposed Cardinal Praising's visit to the United States. She thought that Franco's secret police were just as bad as the Gestapo and that the only persons who should teach German youths are those who have proved their democracy, a phrase which undoubtedly would surprise a student of the English language. Was Mrs. Roosevelt deeply imbued with pro-communist ideas or merely naive? Probably both. Witness an article she published in McCall's, February 1952, about the president's unease with Stalin at the Tehran Conference. My husband was determined to bend every effort to breaking those suspicions down, and decided the way to do it was to live up to every promise made by both the United States and Great Britain, which both of us were able to do before the Yalta meeting. At Yalta my husband felt the atmosphere had somewhat cleared, and he did say he was able to get a smile from Stalin. Indeed, how many people would not sell millions into slavery to get a smile from that dear old man? Mrs. Roosevelt obviously was not alone in kowtowing before the Soviets. Mr. Wendell Wilkie, presidential candidate for the Republican Party in 1940, went on a goodwill tour around the globe during the war. His impressions were published in a book priced at $1 and entitled One World, a cliché which either he or his ghost writer invented and which became exceedingly popular in leftist circles. Here we can read that there is hardly a resident of Russia today whose lot is not as good or better than his parents' lot was prior to the revolution. Thus we come back to our original question, where would one draw the line? We have no reason to assume that Mr. Alger Hiss, or even Mr. Harry Dexter White, took money from the Soviets, not even the men involved in the Amerasia case, or the Rosenbergs, but their loyalty belonged to the communist utopia and not to the American reality. It is even possible that Mr. Alger Hiss was not a convinced Sovietist, 
but that he saw in the Muscovite faith the shape of things to come, while he considered the order prevailing in his own country as obsolete. He was not even condemned as a traitor, which in a legal sense he fully was, but as a perjurer, and no doubt he had committed perjury. However, the attitude an impartial committee of investigation should theoretically have taken was simply this, ever since the days of the founding of our nation we have gradually drifted away from the original spirit of the Constitution, and have let ourselves be influenced by trends and ideas which found in communism a perhaps not unavoidable but logical conclusion. Such a development we might deplore, we might even decide to alter or reverse it, but it has been a reality in the past. To make matters worse, we have found ourselves in a military alliance with the leading communist power and to cement it, our own government, by distorting facts and offering to our population a false picture of that state, has strongly contributed to communist propaganda. Let us review the damage done, let those who have been deluded make a clean breast of their deeds, let us measure the whole extent of that criminal folly which found its consummation in the last decade but which has been going on for some time. Such a stand, I readily admit, could not be expected because it implies a denial of too much of what had happened in the past. And yet, if in our peregrinations we have taken a wrong turn, we have to go back to the point where we took the wrong turn, or at least reconstruct, recalculate this point. If I have not made myself sufficiently clear, I would like to point out that, just to quote one instance, a typical burgher of the city of Pamplona in Navarra in the 17th century confronted with the Marxist-Leninist message would have shrugged it off as a piece of egregious nonsense. Accepting none of its premises, he would have listened to none of its conclusions. The average American with a degree from his progressive college is much nearer to the red message, the devoted uncommitted leftist even more so. There comes the moment when the non-Marxist leftist inadvertently steps into the magnetic field of the red doctrine and then his guardian angel or his last residues of rationality will prevent the worst. Just a few more symbolic reminders mentioned occasionally much earlier, Colombia on the old half-dollar with the Jacobin cap, the fascis on the dime piece which reappear on the French Republic in and in the fascist coat of arms, the first battleships of the Soviet Union named Danton and Murat, the studied utopianism in terms such as the American experiment, the replacement of the Calvinist outlook, which, after all, is still a Christian one, with Russellianism which lies at the bottom of all utopian leftist heresies. Herein lies the root of the entire internal moral and political crisis of the United States, in other words, American conservatism, any movement on the true right, which of course could not in any way be totalitarian, has to return to far distant historical sources, not to stay there but to get the right start. Back to the imaginary burger of Pamplona in the 17th century. Though he hails from another part of this world, and therefore is not a fitting reference, he certainly had a grasp of basic truths. It is the great Western, the great Christian tradition which has to be reconstituted, and this is a gigantic task requiring radical thinkers and far-going measures. Toward the end of the war the leftist follies increased. Mr. Hull, who went to Moscow to proclaim a resolution in favor of Austrian independence, was neatly tricked into signing also a declaration of Austrian war guilt. One is aghast at the stupidity of the formula which said that Austria was reminded, however, that she had a responsibility which she could not evade for participation in the war on the side of Hitlerite Germany, and that in the final settlement account would inevitably be taken of her own contribution to liberation. Anthony Eden apparently first sponsored the declaration, and there can be no doubt that Molotov added the above quoted paragraph, because with this injunction the Soviets had a legal title to stay in Austria, and confiscate property right and left. Yet neither the forger of the Axis nor the former student of the National Normal University of Lebanon, Ohio, seemed to have been aware of this clever snare which had an adverse effect on the Austrian resistance. No doubt there were many Nazis in Austria, but there also were not so few in Norway, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, and quite some eager collaborators in France. To say, however, that these occupied and incorporated countries helped the German war effort willingly and spontaneously is a gross and unjust exaggeration. The Soviets knew only too well what to do in this situation and the two fall guys from the West walked straight into the trap. So did an American delegate in Potsdam when the Soviets demanded the German assets in their occupation zone of Austria. This had been rejected by the American delegation, last but not least because the Soviets demanded German real estate, oil fields, barracks, training fields. The debate over the German assets in the satellite world lasted until the small hours of the morning when, finally, the agreement was put down in writing. Mr. Polly, head of the delegation, could hardly keep his eyes open. Then, in enumerating the countries to which this treaty would apply, the Russians quickly inserted Austria. When he signed, Mr. Polly was too exhausted to be aware of the change. This 38th parallel in Korea was similarly accepted as a demarcation line in a state of ignorance, torpor, and confusion. 
the Potsdam meeting was a worthy culmination of its predecessors, the Tehran and Yalta conferences. The only survivor of the previous encounters was the Georgian highwayman who had committed his crimes in the service of the Social Democratic Party of Russia. Mr. Roosevelt was dead and had been replaced by a man who got his education at no college and his political training from Tom Pendergast and his associates in Kansas City, Missouri. Mr. Churchill was present at the first sessions, but the grateful British had voted him out of power and in his stead a man attended who had greeted Spanish loyalists with the clenched fist, Mr., later Lord Attlee, the new Prime Minister. The outcome of the meeting was not at all surprising. Most of the great evils had already been settled in previous conferences, so for instance, the Odernisa Line. This demarcation line, which artificially attaches Poland to the Soviet Union, because the Poles must be permanently afraid of the inevitable German reivindications, continues to represent the worst and largest wound in the fabric of Europe. The brilliant idea to move the entire Polish nation westward had been originated by Churchill and he even boasts of it in his memoirs. Warsaw, under whatever government, was placed only 115 miles from the Soviet border, but that did not bother him. Non-Britishers did not matter to Mr. Churchill, who sacrificed human beings, their lives, their welfare, their liberty with the same elegant disdain as his colleague in the White House. Lvov? What did Lvov mean to him? A city whose name was difficult to pronounce, inhabited by unknown East Europeans whom he had never met, Poles, Jews, Ukrainians who hardly belonged to the Nordic race. Let's give it to Stalin, the great father of his country. Mr. Churchill in his own words was not prepared to make a great squawk about Lvov. And as the Polish premier Mikolajczyk refused to sign away half his country, Churchill menaced him with its total annihilation. The man who had said there are no lengths of violence to which we will not go had become a terror to his allies. The Anglo-Polish Treaty of Mutual Assistance, concluded on August 25, 1939, which made the Poles decide to fight and not to play dead like the clever Czechs, contained eight articles, six of these were openly broken by Britain. When the three men sat down in Potsdam and when, later, Mr. Truman played the piano with Lauren Bacall lolling on it, the fate of Poland was already completely sealed. Other fresh acts of folly were still to come. One of them consisted in soliciting Stalin's aid in the war against Japan. This gave Uncle Joe a splendid opportunity to capture the entire Japanese industry in Manchuria, to acquire territories, Sakhalin, Kuril Islands, to occupy North Korea and, later, indirectly, help to communize China. This invitation to our own disaster will always be a great puzzle to historians. Just prior to the meeting the first atomic bomb had been brought to a successful explosion at White Sands, New Mexico, and while Stalin was implored to aid the Western Allies, the American general staff already knew that this hellish invention worked. Of course, men like General Henry Arnold of the Off saw no difference between Stalin's and Roosevelt's ideologies, a delightful reflection on the New Deal, and thought that it was a mistake to think that Stalin was a communist. Yet in spite of this enormous advantage, this certainty of a speedy and easy victory, the grisly tyrant was asked to come in on the deal, with tragic results for America. Just close your eyes and think how many Americans have paid with their lives for this folly. Excuses are frequently offered for this piece of maddening stupidity, one of them being that one did not realize whether the atomic bomb could actually be delivered dropped and exploded upon contact. This excuse is patently nonsensical and even if the argument had substance, it does not really hold water because the Japanese had already made two peace efforts, one via Moscow and the other one through the Vatican. However, we have to ask ourselves whether leftist circles in Washington had not worked feverishly for the continuation of the murderous and costly war. Men such as Mr. Owen Lattimore protested in 1941 against any modus vivendi with Japan. Apparently they wanted Japan's total defeat and we probably owe it primarily to Mr. Joseph C. Gru, former American ambassador to Tokyo, that Japan was not transformed into a democratic republic, like Bulgaria or Hungary. The dropping of the bomb on a populated center was another totally superfluous crime. Even if one is callous enough to make an argument for the annihilation of Hiroshima, one fails to understand the necessity for the slaughter in Nagasaki, cradle of Japanese Christianity. Within a split second the bomb wiped out one-eighth of Japan's Catholic Christians. Here again we hear the argument that Mr. Truman wanted to impress the Russians, just as Mr. Churchill had wanted to impress them with the Dresden Massacre. Yet what butcher could really impress the arch-butcher from the Caucasus? Not even the late Adolf Hitler could. And here we come to another point. I am dead certain that at the turn of the century, historians will try to find out the answer to two crucial historic questions. 1. What caused the United States to withdraw its armies immediately after the armistice from all parts of the world? Was the clamor let's send the boys home somewhat organized? 2. What prevented the United States, 
as sole atomic power between the years 1945 and 1948, from using its deadly monopoly to ease the Soviets out of their ill-gotten gains? A war never would have been necessary. The mere threat would have been sufficient. Panic on an unprecedented scale would have been the immediate result. Of course the answer is tragically simple, a democracy rests on the fermentation of the people. It merely hits back if attacked and is more perplexed by victory than by the task of defending itself, which belongs to the military hierarchy and not to amateurish politicians. The armistice was not only conditioned by the preliminary arrangements and agreements concluded at Tehran and Yalta but also by military moves determined by these talks. It is perhaps true that Vienna could not have been occupied by the Western Allies in the last stages of the war, but why, then, had it been savagely bombed on the anniversary of the Anschluss an act of revenge facilitating the Russian conquest? Neither Prague nor Berlin, two European key cities, need have been left to the Red Army. They were given to the Soviets, staunch Nazi collaborators between 1939 and 1941, on a platter. The Americans and the British stopped at the Elba and later even surrendered all of Thuringia to the Soviets while Berlin could easily have fallen into American hands. The same is true of Prague, the Americans under General Patton had advanced as far as Pilsen when they were ordered back. Clearly, all important places in Eastern and Central Europe according to leftist ideas were to be handed over to the Soviets leaving to the Western world a mere toehold on the continent. The craziest arrangements were those concerning Berlin and Vienna. In these two cities the Western powers were to control mere sectors and no stipulations were made as to the accesses leading to them. Mr. Roosevelt is said to have been opposed to discussing these details because he thought that only a complete show of confidence and trust would soften the Soviet regime and would create an atmosphere of fellowship and goodwill. Soon the Americans were undeceived and the airlift had to be organized at great cost in money and even in human lives. The worst result of the Potsdam meeting were the stipulations concerning the mass transfer of the German population from east of the Odernisa line, from Czechoslovakia, Romania, Hungary, and Yugoslavia. No less than 13 to 14 million people had to be removed under enormous hardships and this created tensions, hatreds, demands, and counter-demands from which even a de-Sovietized Europe could hardly recover. These brutal transfers, accompanied by atrocities and spoliations continued all through the winter of 1945 to 1946 and ended only in 1947. Poles from eastern Poland were dumped into East Germany, a process by which people from underpopulated areas were massaged into overpopulated ones, the height of perversity. Yet no legal title over eastern Germany was given to the Poles. Vast tracts of land remained uncultivated, as in Bohemia Moravia, and on the trek from east to west millions of people perished. What were the Western Allies to do with the part of Germany they were given for occupation? It is interesting to note that the Western Army leaders went into a huddle to discuss what they should do if there should be any resistance or sabotage. They decided that they would take hostages and shoot them, perhaps the only thing they could reasonably do, but the Germans had been vilified for having acted the same way in the same predicament. As to the political order and cultural institution, the American left, thanks to its preoccupation with foreign affairs, had a field day in West Germany. Professor Wilhelm Rupka, an outstanding German neoliberal, exiled in Constantinople and later in Geneva, had written a memorandum about the necessity of a monarchical restoration which, by the way, we find in the program of practically all the heroes of the 20th of July. Nobody in his right mind and with any sense of history planned to revise parliamentary democracy, already obsolete by 1919 and tragically terminated by 1933. Yet the American left naturally thought about a constitutional development which would give the forces of the left a frame for a free development. Had not Engels demanded the democratic republic as the ideal form of government, conducive to the victory of Marxism? Above all, the Soviet Union had a true vested interest in the establishment of democracy in preference to forms of government in which parties could not develop freely, gain victories, and take over the government. What the leftist establishment did in Germany is most notable. In many parts of the country, in Bavaria, for instance, it put into power social democrat, i.e., socialist, governments which had by no means the backing of the majority of the population. The prevailing idea in the civilian sector of the occupation authorities was that clericals were reactionary, backward, and fascist, but that Marxians were progressive. Dorothy Thompson had already told us that what Germany needed was not less, but more socialism, though not exactly national socialism. Now the Germans got it at the expense of the American capitalist system duly milked to provide for socialism and socialization all over Europe from Land's End to the Iron Curtain. There was a special bias against the German nobility, many of whose members had courageously opposed Hitler, but here folklore and leftism again combined against genuine American interests. The famous Fragevagen, the questionnaire prescribed by the American authorities, 
that had to be filled out by all those Germans who wanted to do anything more than just work in a factory or in the fields, contained questions which in their content or their wording revealed the whole leftist bias and betrayed the sure little hand of Marx. One of the questions aped the Nuremberg racial purity laws, did any of your or your wife's four grandparents have a title of nobility? For a time the American leftists in the military administration could work hand in glove with the British occupation, directed by the Labour government in London which was also determined to create a leftist Germany, a national socialist Germany under the rather demagogical social democrat Schumacher, but minus racism. One of the early victims of this combine was Dr. Konrad Adenauer, who immediately after liberation had become Lord Mayor, Oberbürgermeister, of Cologne. One nice day he was ejected by the British from his office under the, written, pretext that he lacked the qualifications to run a city as large as Cologne. This egregious piece of nonsense Der Alta kept as his most cherished souvenir. Re-education also ran into a few snares. Luckily the leftist plans never came to fruition but what they would have been like one can guess from the Zook report, published in parts by the New York Times, October 16, 1946. Dr. George F. Zook, head of a mission of nine men and women, among them a Catholic priest, sent to Germany by the state and war departments, declared that the goal of democracy is democratic man. This commission found the main ills of Germany to be discipline in the family and the high school college, which begins at the age of 10. The survival of democracy would warrant an invasion of the German home, the report suggested. It referred to the stern German parental authority that produced Freudian ambivalence, or a clash of tenderness and hostility in children, undermining individual self-reliance, if not also self-respect, while women were confined to cooking, children, and church-going, thus converting worthy enough functions into anti-democratic sterilities. The report went on to say that to shun the majority rule principle was to play into the hands of a Hitlerian superman. 90% of the Germans went to vocational schools and this separation of children at an early age was an important factor in developing the superiority complex of the privileged class and the subservience of the trade class which had led Germany to totalitarianism and war. A most amusing light is thrown on this report by the fact that the Nazi movement had been basically a youth movement against the older generation, that the Nazis wanted to radically revamp the educational system to eliminate the classically educated elites, that they had tried with all means at their disposal to undermine parental authority. In other words, most of the propositions of the Zuck report were entirely in keeping with Nazi ideas, and Nazism was represented in retrospect as a conservative and patriarchal movement. Hitler appeared to the signatories as some sort of patriarcha and not at all as Big Brother whom he actually represented. The Zuck report and the various efforts to democratize German education in an intellectual sense were partly of a temporary nature. As soon as West Germany recovered some sovereignty, most of the various leftist experiments were given up. As we all know, a reinfection took place in the mid-1960s when the new left, the student revolt and hippieism invaded Germany via the Free University of West Berlin and the University of Frankfurt where the various aspects of this particular disease were abetted by part of the German press and a number of intellectuals with distinctly American background. No wonder, because there was a field in which the American occupation authorities were able to achieve a permanent victory for leftism, in the Fifth Estate. After 1945 the license for the publication of a newspaper and books had to be obtained from the occupying powers and here was an opening wedge for the leftist returnees and for their friends. Later it became extremely costly to start a new paper. The conservative forces, viewed with great suspicion by the leftist establishment, thus were the Johnnies come lately and to this day from a journalistic point of view, they have not overcome this handicap. It is important, however, to remember that the left in Europe was soon to turn anti-American and that the anti-American propaganda profited from the support it had been given earlier by the very country it was later to attack. It is difficult to enumerate the calamities enacted in the years immediately following the armistice. There were serious diplomatic mistakes such as the pressure exercised upon Switzerland to surrender the German assets to the Allies, whereas the Swiss had not even been approached by the Nazis to surrender emigrant savings and investments, there were the Nuremberg trials which definitely ought to have been handled by the Germans themselves and which was totally mismanaged. The notion of legal precedent is Anglo-Saxon, even American generals were horrified by the trial, thinking of their possible difficulties in World War III, and the very idea that the assassins of Katyn sat in judgment over the assassins of Auschwitz is tragicomic. Points of accusation like the wanton attack on Norway, an accusation per se justified, make no sense if one remembers that Mr. Churchill admittedly prepared an attack on Norway himself. The thing to do would have been to have the Nazis tried by German courts simply for common crimes according to the Code of Penal Law. The principal nullum crim and sign lege was as much ignored as that of the impartiality of the judges, for instance, when the Russians condemned the German attack against Poland in which they themselves had participated. 
even worse were the following minor Nuremberg trials, almost completely based on Marxist principles, an effort was made to implicate German industry and high finance. No less infamous was the Krupp trial in which Alfred Krupp von Bolin and Halbach was placed on the bench of the accused instead of his gravely ill father. Here again Marxism, financed by American taxpayers' money, was celebrating orgies. In the writ of accusation against Alfred Krupp von Bolin and his ten co-defendants of the same firm we find the words, the origin, the development, and the background of the crimes committed by the defendants, and the criminal plans, in which they participated, can be traced back to 100 years of German militarism and 133 years, four generations, of the manufacturing of arms. Apart from the fact that the Krupp works normally produced arms on the average of only one-fifth of their total output, one recognizes in this sentence and, even more clearly in other passages of the accusation, the Marxian verbiage. The accusation was presented by General Taylor, USA, formerly of the Federal Communications Commission, then 40 years old. His aides were Mr. Joseph Kaufman from New York and later Mr. Ragoland from Texas. The director of the chief trial team was Mr. H. Russell Thayer, who had been assistant secretary of the North American Committee to Aid Spanish Democracy during the Spanish Civil War. The basic notion of the trial was to prove in the best Leninist fashion that big business, especially in the form of monopoly capitalism, creates and fosters wars. All of the accused were condemned and later released and the confiscations annulled. In retrospect the trial appears too preposterous. On the other side of the ocean we have the Yamashita trial, a travesty of justice. When Yamashita's lawyer, Frank A. Real published a book about his tragically innocent defendant, the rather conservative director of the publishing company, the Chicago University Press, lost his position. Leftist forces mismanaged the world situation practically everywhere. Working through the occupation authorities, where the much saner military were unable to interfere with the civilians, they set up a witch hunt against monarchists in Austria, thus continuing Nazi policies, and they also prevented the return of the South Tyrol to Austria, for this the British labor government was mainly responsible. Self-determination was obviously only desirable if it benefited leftist issues, but the South Tyrolians, being mostly conservative agrarians would, once returned to Austria, have prevented a full socialist victory. The damage done by the dynamite tardy, the tortures committed by the carabinieri, the wall of hatred between Austrians and Italians, this only bleeding border left in free Europe we owe first to Mr. Wilson then to Mr. Bevan and to the Soviets who supported Mr. Bevan, and thus incidentally ratified the Hitler-Mussolini Agreement of 1939 pertaining to the iniquitous Brenner border. It seems that Nazi decisions, Nazi thought, Nazi mentality, and Nazi institutions in many ways are here to stay. True, other people, other groups, fared much worse than the Austrians. The 150,000 cases of rape perpetrated by the Red Army in Eastern Austria was perhaps only a practical demonstration of sexual democracy. Let us remember Mr. Henry Wallace's charming formula, we have political democracy, they have economic democracy, many Austrians were deported, some returned, others disappeared forever. Still, it was on Austrian soil, in the East Tyrol, that large numbers of Russians and Cossacks who had fought against communism were clubbed half-dead, packed into box cars and sent back as unpatriotic traitors. A British major, Davis, had given his word of honor that England did not think to surrender the Cossacks and Russians to the Soviets. When the truth leaked through, the disarmed anti-communists resisted His Majesty's soldiers in the services of Bolshevism, many Russians were killed on the spot, 15 more were killed during the transport while trying to escape, 6 committed suicide, 17 succeeded in disappearing during the transport to the Russian occupation zone. There were 12 generals in the group handed over to the USSR by that great conservative, Mr. Winston Churchill to placate, to mollify, to befriend his communist comrade in arms. But even this act of prostitution did not buy their friendship and less than a year later this Epimetheus of European politics uttered the great warning in his famous Fulton speech. An Austrian eyewitness has described the scenes in Lienz, worthy of Bruegel's brush. He estimates at about 300 the number of Cossacks who hanged themselves in the Lienz woods after being surrounded by the 8th Brigade, with bayonets and clubs these men and many women were subdued. A Russian who had escaped to tell the tale, S. G. Korokov, now living in the United States, has painted the memorable scene of the hell of Lienz. And while Mr. Churchill perpetrated such wonderful deeds, the Americans, apparently, could not stay behind. The New York Times reported the ghastly scenes that took place in Dachau when the Russians who had fought against communism were made ready to be shipped eastward. The long somber report ended with the description of the evacuation of the second Russian barrack. The inmates barricaded themselves inside and set the building afire. Then all tore off their clothing, apparently in a vain effort to frustrate the guards and, linking arms, 
resisted the pushing and shoving of the Americans and Poles trying to empty the place. The soldiers then tossed in tear bombs and rushed the building. Some prisoners, they discovered, were already dead, having cut their own throats, while others had used pieces of cloth to hang themselves. One can easily imagine what confidence in the United States and Britain these actions engendered inside the USSR, but hatred and suspicion against the West were precisely the feelings which not only the Soviets but also their faithful collaborators in the American leftist establishment wanted to create. And it ought to be remembered that the American heirs of the Nazis in Dachau, of all places, perpetrated these horrors three quarters of a year after the end of the war, and this in accordance with the agreements made at Yalta, at least half of which Soviets had already broken. Remembering the American tradition in regard to political refugees through the ages, one cannot but be aghast at the betrayal of such trust, such a noble tradition. The so frequently followed British example, too, was at times exceptionally evil. The Austrians have seen not only the hell of Lienz but also the bestial surrender of the Domo Branzi, the Catholic Slovene Home Guard, which had protected Slovenes against the depredations of Tito's partisani. Thousands of them were rounded up, shipped over the Karavankan Mountains, to be mowed down in masses and their corpses used as natural fertilizer for the fields. One should never forget, sadism is the outstanding characteristic of the entire left. Errors were ubiquitous. Italy in 1946 was helped back to the republican form of government it had under Mussolini as Repubblica Sociale Italiana. A plebiscite in which the vast majority of the non-communist vote was cast for the monarchy, gave Italy the ideal form of government to be captured some day by communism the legal way, a danger still with us. Obviously the communist vote was totally in favor of the republic, remindful of Engels' aforementioned formulation, confirmed by Dallin, that the democratic republic is the ideal frame for a red conquest of the state. In Greece, luckily, a referendum, itself an impossible procedure, produced a sound majority for the monarchy. The principle of monarchy cannot be subordinated to the principle of majority decisions. Its very essence is independence from the vagaries of the voting process. Yugoslavia another miscreation of World War I, was restored and even territorially enlarged. Yugoslavia and Bulgaria were the only countries, apart from the Soviet Union, emerging from the war with a bigger territory. Yugoslavia, however, can only exist and survive as a harsh dictatorship, if not as a tyranny. Since its constituent nations do not want to form a whole, they can be held together by coercive measures, either the sway of one nationality over the rest, or the rule of an oppressive ideology through a party overall. It would be an error, however, to believe that the horrors of leftist oppression and revenge were merely confined to Eastern, Central, and Southern Europe. In France a large sector of the collaborators were recruited from the left, embracing ideologies which were national leftist in character. Neither Laval nor Darnand, Déa or Doriot belonged to the right. The Germans suspended Le Figaro, the conservative daily, and supported the leftist paper Louvre. The French communists fully collaborated with the Nazis between 1939 and 1941. De Gaulle, who went into opposition, had belonged to the Action Francaise. Other French rightists and conservatives fled France, Henri de Carolus was one of them, but there were also men of the French right who stayed without collaborating and others again who, rightly or mistakenly, considered it their duty to protect whatever remained of France as well as they could. Among them was Marshal Pétain whose patriotism should no more be questioned than General Vagans. Pétain had negotiated with Churchill an agreement which, in order not to irritate de Gaulle, Downing Street tried to deny but we have documentary evidence of its existence. After the German attack on the Soviet Union, the French communists, whose real patrie had always been the USSR, went into opposition and, having more practice in clandestine political and military activities than the other parties, they soon assumed some sort of leadership in the resistance. After the collapse of the German occupation in 1944 the communists started to wage a terror warfare of their own against all the people they disliked politically, socially, or just personally. An American observer who arrived in southern France with the army of General Patch estimated the number of people assassinated by the resistance in that region was around 50,000. French estimates speak of about 120,000 all told. To this number must be added all those who were legally condemned, more often than not by courts staffed with communist jurors. Now, it is quite true that many of the bona fide collaborators literally sacrificed French citizens in order to get a breathing spell for France. It can't well be argued that the ends do not justify the means. But then what about the resistance men who, with false information, were played by Allied authorities into the hands of the Nazis who finished them off? Were they expendable? And were the Allied air massacres, butchering not only Germans, but Frenchmen, Dutch, Belgian, Serbs, and foreign laborers, morally justified? 
Much of de Gaulle's resentment has to be explained by the gratuitous massacre of Frenchmen and women who, it seems, were at times even wantonly killed by Allied ground forces. Leftist control of foreign relations was equally apparent in all imaginable domains. UNRWA, an American organization designed to aid displaced persons in distress, repeatedly assumed a pro-communist character. The mayor of New York, Fiorello La Guardia, who directed its activities and who had once been U.S. consul in Fiume, had a strongly leftist bent. In a Yugoslav camp in Egypt he insulted the inmates, berating them for not returning to their homeland. The problem of the displaced persons, read, desperate refugees, was one of the most baffling to all moderate leftists, the fascists had been defeated. Now whom did they flee? Why did they not return to the places they had left? The left, from the more moderate groups to the communists, now turned their eyes toward Spain. There still was a fascist dictatorship to be liquidated, it created a welcome problem which diverted public interest from the annexationist activities of the Soviets. At the time of the landing of the Allied troops in North Africa in November 1942, President Roosevelt had written a letter to Franco addressing him as my dear friend. A distinguished Roman Catholic layman, Professor Carlton J. H. Hayes acted as American ambassador in Madrid and tried, successfully, to keep Spain out of the war. This was not too difficult because Franco had met Hitler and, as we said before, immediately a cordial antipathy sprang up between the two. Spain, we have to bear in mind, made extraordinary efforts to protect the Jews, although predominantly those of Sephardic origin. More than 200 years after the Jews had been collectively expelled from Britain in 1290 the Spaniards placed before their Jews and Muslims the alternative either to embrace Christianity or to leave the country. Most of them left, 1492, a certain number became sincerely Christians, others again only seemingly changed their faith. The Jewish refugees went partly to Morocco and Algiers, partly to Turkey, a few of them to Italy and to South America. This harsh measure was a great loss to Spain, it had a purely religious and not a racist character. In the 19th century a trickle of Jews returned. King Alfonso XIII was known for his friendly feelings toward the Jews. When the Republic was established in 1931 the Jews in Spain already numbered more than 2,000. In 1924, under the rule of King Alfonso and the military dictatorship of General Miguel Primo de Rivera, father of José Antonio, the founder of the Falange, a law had been issued which invited the descendants of the expelled Sephardic, i.e., Spanish, Jews to return to Spain and offered them immediate citizenship. A few followed the call. When the Civil War broke out the Spanish Jews, above all those living in northern Morocco, a Spanish protectorate, sided with the right. And when in World War II many Jews fled to the West, passing through Spain, not one of them was surrendered to the Germans. As a matter of fact, the Spanish consulates and embassies all over Europe started to issue passports for Jews of Spanish descent on the basis of the Law of 1924. An estimated 30,000 to 40,000 passports were granted, which makes Franco Spain the greatest protector of Jews at the time of the last war. The Spanish government, through economic pressure, succeeded in having the French Jews of Sephardic origin exempted from wearing the Star of David. The Spanish consular agents sealed the apartments and houses of Sephardic French Jews. And more, the Spanish government forced the Nazis to disgorge Jewish inmates from concentration camps who actually came by whole trainloads to Spain. Mr. Maurice L. Perlsweig, in a resolution adopted at the Jewish Congress in Atlantic City, November 1944, thanked the Spanish ambassador in Washington for his government's efforts to aid and protect Jews. The Jews are a race of long memory, they will not easily forget the chance given to thousands of their brothers to save their lives. Similar messages were sent to the Swiss government, the King of Sweden and Pope Pius XII, all not exactly representatives of leftism. Now that the Allies were safely entrenched all over Western Europe and still had not waked up to the danger from the East, Franco no longer was my dear friend. Stalin, who butchered more Jews than Franco could ever have saved, suggested to the Right Honorable Clement Attlee of clenched fist memory and to Mr. Truman to blockade Spain, so that the Spaniards might rise and overthrow their fascist government. The result was not a reduced breakfast table for Generalissimo Franco, but years of misery and starvation for the Spaniards who, whatever their opinion about Franco, now really rallied to him in a feeling of national indignation and collective pride. The Potsdam plan luckily miscarried and here one can say with a sigh of relief that God at least sometimes takes care of children, drunkards, fools, and the foreign policy of the United States of America. Today Spain, undergoing a gradual process of liberalization, is a military pillar of the free world. Luckily Japan preserved the office of emperor, Yet one wonders what would happen to its parliament at a time of grave economic adversity and its demilitarization is a tremendous burden on the shoulders of the victorious United States. 
Japan and Germany, for better or worse, played important parts in keeping the equilibrium of Eurasia. America now has to fill this military void. Moderate leftist foresight was even less successful on the Asian mainland. The agrarian reformers of China transformed themselves into a roaring tiger, anti-colonialist American hostility toward France and Indochina resulted in another American liability and responsibility, the joint British-American intervention in favor of Sukarno, a collaborator of the Japanese, and against the Dutch, their wartime ally, was another case in point. What characterizes the leftist mind, however, is a would-be pragmatism combining two things which normally tend to be opposites, an impractical utopian idealism coupled with a lack of a sense of honor. Usually idealism goes together with a sense of honor and loyalty. Don Quixote is not practical but he is a man of honor, Sancho Panza ignores honor, but he is a realist. The typical leftist is a dreamer without honor and that is a pretty bad combination. Inevitably one remembers the letters of Franklin Delano Roosevelt to Pius XII in which the president tried to convince the Pope that he ought to come down to earth and realize that his picture of the Soviet Union was obsolete and no longer conforming to truth, an interesting change after Woodrow Wilson's reply to Benedict XV's peace effort, reminding the Pope that the war was a moral issue which practical considerations could never eliminate. Granted that the Vatican is neither a powerhouse nor even a prime center of information, but there is perennial value to sound Christian reasoning and to a profound knowledge of man and all his glory and misery, which leftist emotionalism and ratiocination cannot replace. More blunders were made in the years after 1945, the failure of nerves in the Hungarian Revolution, the failure at Suez, the failure in the Bay of Pigs, the horrible blunder in Vietnam in 1963, when a deceitful leftist propaganda portrayed the rule of NGO Dinh Diem as a Roman Catholic dictatorship oppressing kind Buddhist monks, with the resulting speculation on a possible all-Buddhist crusade against communism with American support, some sort of Buddhification of the war in Vietnam. One could as well imagine an American army led by Quakers, devout Mennonites, and conscientious objectors. Needless to say that the blunders of American leftists have their analogies in other parts of the world. French, Spanish, Italian, German, Austrian, and British moderate leftists are no less silly and supercilious. However, their influence, their weight, their historic importance is now a great deal less than that of their American confrere, who have an establishment with which the others cannot vie, because it is in a key nation deciding the fate of the world. One can listen to certain Spanish, or Peruvian, students, who are filled to the gills with most incredible 19th century nonsense, be informed by sophisticated Frenchmen how the Texan oil millionaires murdered President Kennedy, or be instructed by Italian Republicani about Italy's economic exploitation by the Vatican. The stupidities uttered by Greek intellectuals, soft-headed German literati or sixth-rate English university professors are just as bad, except that they matter less. From the masses no intelligent man expects a superior knowledge anyhow, they can only throw back what has been fed to them by the information manufacturers or by the opinion makers. Common sense is valuable, no doubt, but not without knowledge, just as knowledge is worthless without common sense. The masses cannot really be blamed. Naturally the picture of what happened since 1945 is not completely black. There has been resistance in the case of Korea, though a resistance which was never fully developed. Nationalist China has not been thrown to the dogs, as so many leftists want it. In Formosa as intelligent agrarian reform has taken place and that island is a real showcase in Asia, now economically on its own feet. The Marshall Plan in Free Europe was a success, and the more private initiative was given a scope, the greater the success. Support for the sadists in Angola and Mozambique has abated. The negative, the blinding effects of leftism even in its moderate form, derive mostly from envy and jealousy, the main dynamic forces of the left. It is this driving element which links up the whole sequence of revolutions from 1789 to 1917 and 1933. Envy and jealousy are capable of dominating not only internal politics but, even more so, foreign policy where they support the sadistic drives which so strongly color international relations in our progressive, democratic century. No wonder, since today the ultimate means of foreign policy is not only total war but also the fomenting of revolutions and rebellions in foreign countries, which was taboo in an earlier age. When Sir Roger Casement, in World War I, tried to get the aid of the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ossinamt, his plea for active support against British rule in Ireland was rejected for the reason that this meant meddling in inner British affairs. It was the German army which cooperated first with Casement and later with the communist exiles in Switzerland who were shipped to Russia, it was a non-junker, Erich Ludendorff, who utilized revolutionary disloyalty, imitating the allies who partly won the war through these tactics, as young Captain de Gaulle insisted. 
the Soviets needed the democratic restoration of 1945 very much indeed. We know about a leading American general who, after World War II, met a Soviet leader. We quote, Circumstances had brought the two together on a number of occasions and the American had noticed an attitude of considerable friendliness on the part of the Russian. One day he commented on his attitude. The Soviet leader made no reply for the moment, then he drew his chair closer to the table and from a matchbox he took four matches which he placed methodically on the table, each match about an inch from the next and parallel to it. Then he said, now this first match is what you call capitalism, the second is what you call democracy, the third is what you call socialism, and the fourth is what you call communism. He paused a moment, and then, looking up at the American, said, now, I like your country because it is moving straight down the line from capitalism through the others to communism. The distinguished American, according to our information, was nobody else but General MacArthur. Today, world conflicts move on several levels. The time of the old-fashioned cabinet wars is over, war has become total, partly because technology gave a staggering means of destruction, partly because, due to the withering away of religion, totalitarian ideologies capable of mobilizing the masses and fanaticizing pragmatists, have filled this void. Hot wars destroy bodies, cold wars are waged for immortal souls. Still, what strikes one today, more than ever, are the words of Riverol, one of the most brilliant spirits of old France, politics is like the Sphinx, it devours all those who cannot solve its riddles.